Chapter One of the Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter One Diversions of a Ruined Gentleman. Upon a certain dreary April afternoon, in the year of grace 1906, the apprehensions of Philip Kirkwood, Esquire, artiste Pientre, were enlivened by the discovery that he was occupying that singularly distressing social position, which may be summed up succinctly in a phrase through long usage grown proverbial, alone in London. These three words have come to connote in our understanding so much of human misery that, to Mr. Kirkwood, they seemed to epitomize absolutely, if not happily, the various circumstances attendant upon the predicament wherein he found himself. Inevitably, an extremist, because of his youth, he had just turned twenty-five, he took no count of mitigating matters, and would hotly have resented the suggestion that his case was anything but altogether deplorable and forlorn. That he was not actually at the end of his resources went for nothing. He held the distinction a quibble, mockingly immaterial, like the store of guineas in his pocket, too insignificant for mention when contrasted with his needs. And his base of supplies, the American city of his nativity, whence, and not without a glow of pride in his secret heart, he was wont to register at foreign hostelries, had been arbitrarily cut off from him by one of those accidents sardonically classified by insurance, and expressed corporations as acts of God. Now, to one who has lived all his days serenely in accord with the dictates of his own sweet will, taking no thought for the morrow, such a situation naturally seems both appalling and intolerable, at the first blush. It must be confessed that, to begin with, Kirkwood drew a long and disconsolate face over his fix, and, in that black hour, primitive of its kind in his brief span, he became conscious of a sinister apparition taking shape at his elbow, a shade of darkness which, clouding him on the back with a skeleton hand, croaked hollow salutations in his ear. "'Come, Mr. Kirkwood, come,' its mirthless accents rallied him. "'Have you no welcome for me? You, who have been permitted to live the quarter of a century without making my acquaintance?' "'Surely now it's high time we were learning something of one another, you and I.' "'But I don't understand,' returned Kirkwood blankly. "'I don't know you.' "'True, but you shall. I am the shade of care.' "'Dull care,' murmured Kirkwood, bewildered and dismayed, for the visitation had come upon him with little presage and no invitation whatever. "'Dull care,' the shade assured him, dull care am i and care that's anything but dull into the bargain care that's like a keen pain in your body care that lives a horror in your mind care that darkens your days and flavors with bitter poison all your nights care that but kirkwood would not listen further courageously submissive to his destiny knowing in his heart that the shade had come to stay he had found spirit to shake himself with a dogged air to lift his chin set the strong muscles of his jaw and smile that homely wholesome smile which was his peculiarly very well he accepted the irremediable with grim humor what must be must i don't pretend to be glad to see you but you're free to stay as long as you find the climate agreeable i warn you i shan't whine lots of men Hundreds and hundreds of them have slept tight o' nights with you for bedfellow. If they could grin and bear you, I believe I can. Now Care mocked him with a sardonic laugh, and sought to tighten upon his shoulders its bony grasp, but Kirkwood resolutely shrugged it off, and went in search of man's most faithful dumb friend, to wit, his pipe, the which, when found and filled, he lighted with a spill twisted from the envelope of a cable message, which had been vicariously responsible for his introduction to the shade of care. "'It's about time,' he announced, watching the paper blacken and burn in the great fire. 
that I was doing something to prove my title to a living. And this was all his valedictory to a vanished competence. Anyway, he added hastily, as a fearful lest care, overhearing, might have read into his tone a trace of vain repining, anyway, I'm a slight better off than those poor devils over there. I really have a great deal to be thankful for, now that my attention's drawn to it. For the ensuing few minutes he thought it all over, soberly but with a stout heart, standing at a window of his bedroom in the Hotel Pless, hands deep in trouser pockets, pipe fuming voluminously, his gaze wandering out over a blurred infinitude of wet shining roofs and sooty chimney-pots, all of London that a lowering drizzle would let him see, and withal by no means a cheering prospect, nor yet one calculated to offset the disheartening influence of the indomitable shade of care. But the truth is that Kirkwood's brain comprehended little that his eyes perceived. His thoughts were with his heart, and that was half a world away, and sick with pity for another and a fairer city, stricken in the flower of her loveliness, writhing in Promethean agony upon her storied hills. There came a rapping at the door. Kirkwood removed the pipe from between his teeth long enough to say, Come in, pleasantly. The knob was turned, the door opened. Kirkwood, swinging on one heel, beheld hesitant upon the threshold a diminutive figure in the livery of the Pless pages. Mr. Kirkwood? Kirkwood nodded. Gentlemen to see you, sir. Kirkwood nodded again, smiling. Show him up, please, he said. But before the words were fairly out of his mouth, a footfall sounded in the corridor. A hand was placed upon the shoulder of the page, gently but with decision swinging him out of the way, and a man stepped into the room. "'Mr. Brentwick!' Kirkwood almost shouted, jumping forward to seize his visitor's hand. "'My dear boy,' replied the latter, "'I'm delighted to see you. Got your note not an hour ago, and came at once, you see. It was mighty good of you. Sit down, please. Here are cigars.' Why, a moment ago, I was the most miserable and lonely mortal on the footstool. I can fancy, the elder man looked up, smiling at Kirkwood from the depths of his armchair, as the latter stood above him, resting an elbow on the mantel. The management knows me, he offered explanation of his unceremonious appearance. So I took the liberty of following on the heels of the bellhop. Dear boy, and how are you? Why are you in London? "'Enjoying our abominable spring weather? "'And why the anxious undertone I detected in your note?' "'He continued to stare curiously into Kirkwood's face. "'At a glance, this Mr. Brentwick was a man of tallish figure and rather slender, "'with a countenance thin and flushed a sensitive pink, "'out of which his eyes shone, keen, alert, humorous, "'and a trace wistful behind his glasses.' His years were indeterminate, with the aspect of fifty. The spirit and the verve of thirty assorted oddly. But his hands were old, delicate, fine, and fragile, and the lips beneath the drooping white moustache at times trembled, almost imperceptibly, with the generous sentiments that come with mellow age. He held his back straight and his head with an air, an air that was not a swagger, but the sign-token of seasoned experience in the world. The most carping could have found no flaw in the quiet taste of his attire. To sum up, Kirkwood's very good friend, and his only one then in London, Mr. Brentwick looked and was an English gentleman. Why? he persisted, as the younger man hesitated. I am here to find out. Tonight I leave for the continent. In the meantime— and at midnight I sail for the States, added Kirkwood. That is mainly why I wish to see you, to say good-bye for the time. You're going home, a shadow clouded Brentwick's clear eyes, to fight it out, shoulder to shoulder with my brethren in adversity. The cloud lifted. That is the spirit, declared the elder man. For the moment I did you the injustice to believe that you were running away, but now I understand. Forgive me. Pardon, too, the stupidity which I must lay at the door of my advancing years. 
To me, the thought of you as a Parisian fixture has become such a commonplace, Philip, that the news of the disaster hardly stirred me. Now I remember that you are a Californian. I was born in San Francisco, affirmed Kirkwood a bit sadly. My father and mother were buried there. And your fortune? I inherited my father's interest in the firm of Kirkwood and Vanderlip when I came over to study painting. I left everything in Vanderlip's hands. The business afforded me a handsome living. You have heard from Mr. Vanderlip? Fifteen minutes ago. Kirkwood took a cable form, still damp, from his pocket and handed it to his guest. Unfolding it, the latter read, Kirkwood plus London. Stay where you are. No good coming back. Everything gone. No insurance. Letter follows. Vanderlip. When I got the news in Paris, Kirkwood volunteered, I tried the banks. They refused to honor my drafts. I had a little money in hand, enough to see me home, so closed the studio and came across. I'm booked on the Minneapolis, sailing from Tilbury at daybreak. The boat train leaves at 11.30. I had hoped you might be able to dine with me and see me off. In silence, Brentwick returned the cable message. Then, with a thoughtful look, You are sure this is wise? he queried. It's the only thing I can see. But your partner says, Naturally he thinks that by this time I should have learned to paint well enough to support myself for a few months, until he can get things running again. Perhaps I might. Brentwick supported the presumption with a decided gesture. But have I a right to leave Vanderlip to fight it out alone? For Vanderlip has a wife and kiddies to support. I, your genius, my ability, such as it is, and that only, it can wait. No, this means simply that I must come down from the clouds, plant my feet on solid earth, and get to work. The sentiment is sound, admitted Brentwick the practice of it, folly. Have you stopped to think what part a rising young portrait painter can contribute toward the rebuilding of a devastated city? The painting can wait, reiterated Kirkwood. I can work like other men. You can do yourself and your genius grave injustice, and I fear me you will, dear boy. It's in keeping with your heritage of American obstinacy. Now, if it were a question of money, Mr. Brentwick, Kirkwood protested vehemently. I've ample for my present needs, he added. Of course, conceded Brentwick with a sigh. I didn't really hope you would avail yourself of our friendship. Now there's my home in Aspen Villas. You have seen it? In your absence this afternoon, your estimable butler, with commendable discretion, kept me without the doors, laughed the young man. It's a comfortable home. You would not consent to share it with me until— You are more than good, but honestly, I must sail tonight. I wanted only this chance to see you before I left. You'll dine with me, won't you? If you would stay in London, Philip, we would dine together not once but many times. As it is, I myself am booked for Munich to be gone a week on business. I have many affairs needing attention between now and the 9.10 train from Victoria. If you will be my guest at Aspen Villas, please, begged Kirkwood, with a little laugh of pleasure because of the other's insistence. I only wish I could. Another day. Oh, you will make your million in a year, and return scandalously independent. It's in your American blood. Frail white fingers tapped an arm of the chair as their owner stared gravely into the fire. I confess I envy you, he observed. The opportunity to make a million in a year, chuckled Kirkwood. No, I envy you your romance. The romance of a poor young man went out of fashion years ago. No, my dear friend, my romance died a natural death half an hour since. There spoke youth, blind enviable youth. On the contrary, you are but turning the leaves of the first chapter of your romance, Philip. Romance is dead, contended the young man stubbornly. Long live the king, Brentwick laughed quietly, still attentive to the fire. Myself, when young, he said softly, did seek romance, but never knew it till its day was done. 
I'm quite sure that is a poor paraphrase of something I have read. In age, one's sight is sharpened. To see romance in another's life, at least, I say I envy you. You have youth, unconquerable youth, and the world before you. I must go. He rose stiffly, as though suddenly made conscious of his age. The old eyes peered more than a trifle wistfully, now into Kirkwood's. "'You will not fail to call on me by cable, dear boy, if you need anything. I ask it as a favor. I am glad you wish to see me before going out of my life. One learns to value the friendship of youth, Philip. Good-bye, and good luck attend you.' Alone once more, Kirkwood returned to his window. The disappointment he felt at being robbed of his anticipated pleasure in Brentwick's company at dinner colored his mood unpleasantly. His musings merged into vacuity, into a dull gray mist of hopelessness comparable only to the dismal skies then lowering over London town. Brentwick was good, but Brentwick was mistaken. There was really nothing for Kirkwood to do but to go ahead. But one steamer trunk remained to be packed. The boat train would leave before midnight, the steamer with the morning tide. By the morrow's noon he would be upon the high seas, within ten days in New York, and among friends, and then... The problem of that afterwards perplexed Kirkwood more than he cared to own. Brentwick had opened his eyes to the fact that he would be practically useless in San Francisco. He could not harbor the thought of going back, only to become a charge upon Vanderlip. No, he was resolved that, thenceforward, he must rely upon himself, carve out his own destiny. But would the art that he had cultivated with such assiduity yield him a livelihood, if sincerely practiced with that end in view? Would the mental and physical equipment of a painter, heretofore dilettante, enable him to become self-supporting? Nodding his brows in concentration of effort to divine the future, he doubted himself, darkly questioning alike his abilities and his temper under trial. Neither heir now had ever been put to the test. His eyes became somberly wistful, his heart sore with regret of yesterday, his yesterday of carefree youth and courage, gilded with the ineffable, evanescent glamour of romance. Of such romance, thrice refined of dross, as only he knows who has wooed his art with passion passing the love of woman. Far away, above the acres of huddled roofs and chimney-pots, the storm-mists thinned, lifting transiently. Through them, grey, fairy-like, the towers of Westminster and the Houses of Parliament bulked monstrous and unreal, fading when again the fugitive dun-vapours closed down upon the city. Never at hand, the shade of care nudged Kirkwood's elbow, whispering subtly. Romance was indeed dead. The world was cold and cruel. The gloom deepened. In the cant of modern metaphysics, the moment was psychological. There came a rapping at the door. Kirkwood removed the pipe from between his teeth long enough to say, Come in, pleasantly. The knob was turned. The door opened. Kirkwood turning on one heel, beheld hesitant upon the threshold a diminutive figure in the livery of the Pless pages. "'Mr. Kirkwood?' Kirkwood nodded. "'Gentlemen to see you, sir.' Kirkwood nodded again, smiling if somewhat perplexed. Encouraged, the child advanced, proffering a silver card tray at the end of an unnaturally rigid forearm. Kirkwood took the card dubiously between thumb and forefinger, and inspected it without prejudice. "'George B. Callender,' he read. "'George B. Callender. But I know no such person. Sure there's no mistake, young man?' The close-cropped, bullet-shaped British head was agitated in vigorous negation, and card for Mr. Kirkwood was mumbled in dispassionate accents appropriate to a recitation by rote. "'Very well. But before you show him up, ask this Mr. Callender if he is quite sure he wants to see Philip Kirkwood.' "'Yes, sir.' The child marched out, punctiliously closing the door. Kirkwood tamped down the tobacco in his pipe and puffed energetically, dismissing the interruption to his reverie as a matter of no consequence. 
an obvious mistake to be rectified by two words with this Mr. Callender, whom he did not know. At the knock, he had almost hoped it might be Brentwick, returning with a changed mind about the bid to dinner. He regretted Brentwick sincerely. Theirs was a curious sort of friendship extraordinarily close in view of the meagerness of either's information about the other, to say nothing of the disparity between their ages. Concerning the elder man, Kirkwood knew little more than they had met on shipboard, coming over, that Brentwick had spent some years in America, that he was an Englishman by birth, a cosmopolitan by habit, by profession a gentleman, employing that term in its most uncompromisingly British significance and by inclination a collector of articles of virtue and bigotry, in pursuit of which he made frequent excursions to the continent from his residence in a quaint, quiet street of old Brompton. It had been during his not infrequent, but ordinarily abbreviated, sojourns in Paris that their steamer acquaintance had ripened into an affection almost filial on the one hand, almost paternal on the other. There came a rapping at the door. Kirkwood removed the pipe from between his teeth long enough to say, Come in, pleasantly. The knob was turned, the door opened. Kirkwood, swinging on one heel, beheld hesitant upon the threshold a rather rotund figure of medium height, clad in an expressionless gray lounge suit, with a brown bowler hat held tentatively in one hand, an umbrella weeping in the other. A voice, which was unctuous and insinuative, emanated from the figure. Mr. Kirkwood? Kirkwood nodded, with some effort recalling the name, so detached had been his thoughts since the disappearance of the page. Yes, Mr. Callender? Are you, uh, busy, Mr. Kirkwood? Are you, Mr. Callender? Kirkwood's smile robbed the retort of any flavor of incivility. Encouraged, the man entered, premising that he would detain his host but a moment and readily surrendering hat and umbrella. Kirkwood, putting the latter aside, invited his collar to the easy chair which Brentwick had occupied by the fireplace. It takes the edge off the dampness, Kirkwood explained in deference to the other's look of pleased surprise at the cheerful bed of coals. I'm afraid I could never get acclimated to life in a cold, damp room, or a damp, cold room, such as you Britishers prefer. It is grateful, Mr. Callender agreed, spreading plump and well-cared-for hands to the warmth. But you are mistaken. I am as much an American as yourself. Yes? Kirkwood looked the man over with more interest, less matter-of-course courtesy. He proved not unprepossessing, this unclassifiable Mr. Callender. He was dressed with some care, his complexion was good, and the fullness of his girth, emphasized as it was by a notable lack of inches, bespoke a nature genial, easy-going, and sybaritic. His dark eyes, heavy-lidded, were active, curiously at times with a subdued glitter. In a face large, round, pink, of which the other most remarkable features were a moustache, close-trimmed and showing streaks of grey, a chubby nose, and duplicate chins. Mr. Callender was furthermore possessed of a polished bald spot, girdled with a tonsure of silvered hair, circumstances which lent some factitious distinction to a personality otherwise commonplace. His manner might be best described as uneasy with assurance, as though he frequently found it necessary to make up for his unimpressive stature by assuming an unnatural habit of authority and there you have him. Beyond these points, Kirkwood was conscious of no impressions. The man was apparently neutral-tinted of mind as well as of body. "'So you knew I was an American, Mr. Callender,' suggested Kirkwood. "'Saw your name on the register. We both hail from the same neck of the woods, you know.' "'I didn't know it. And?' "'Yes, I'm from Frisco, too. And I'm sorry.' Mr. Callender passed five fat fingers nervously over his moustache, glanced alertly up at Kirkwood, as if momentarily inclined to question his tone, then again stared glumly into the fire, for Kirkwood had maintained an attitude purposefully colorless. Not to put too fine a point upon it, he believed that his caller was lying. The man's appearance, 
his mannerisms, his voice and enunciation, while they might have been American, seemed all un-Californian. To one born and bred in that state, as Kirkwood had been, her sons are unmistakably hallmarked. Now, no man lies without motive. This one chose to reaffirm, with a show of deep feeling. Yes, I'm from Frisco, too. We're companions in misfortune. I hope not altogether, said Kirkwood politely. Mr. Callender drew his own inferences from the response, and mustered up a show of cheerfulness. Then you're not completely wiped out. To the contrary, I was hoping you were less unhappy. Oh, then you are... Kirkwood lifted the cable message from the mantel. I have just heard from my partner at home, he said with a faint smile, and quoted, Everything gone, no insurance. Mr. Callender pursed his plump lips, whistling inaudibly. Too bad. Too bad, he murmured sympathetically. We're all hard hit, more or less. He lapsed into dejected apathy, from which Kirkwood, growing at length impatient, found it necessary to rouse him. "'You wish to see me about something else, I'm sure?' Mr. Callender started from his reverie. "'Eh? I was dreaming. I beg pardon. It seems hard to realize, Mr. Kirkwood, that this awful catastrophe has overtaken our beloved metropolis.' The canting phrases wearied Kirkwood. Abruptly he cut in. "'Would a sovereign help you out, Mr. Callender? I don't mind telling you that's about the limit of my present resources.' "'Pardon me,' Mr. Callender's moonlight countenance darkened. He assumed a transparent dignity. "'You misconstrue my motive, sir.' "'Then I'm sorry. I am not here to borrow. On the other hand, quite by accident, I discovered your name upon the register downstairs. A good old Frisco name, if you will permit me to say so. I thought to myself that here was a chance to help a fellow countryman.' Callender paused, interrogative. Kirkwood remained interested, but silent. "'If a passage across would help you, I—I I think it might be arranged,' stammered Callender, ill at ease. "'It might,' admitted Kirkwood, speculative. "'I could fix it so that you could go over, first class, of course, and pay your way, so to speak, by rendering us, me and my partner, a trifling service.' "'Ah?' In fact, continued Callender, warming up to his theme, there might be something more in it for you than the passage, if, if you're the right man, the man I'm looking for. That, of course, is the question. Eh? Callender pulled up suddenly in a full-winged flight of enthusiasm. Kirkwood eyed him steadily. I said that is a question, Mr. Callender, whether or not I am the man you're looking for. Between you and me, and the fire-dogs, I don't believe I am. Now, if you wish to name your quid pro quo, this trifling service I'm to render in recognition of your benevolence, you may. Yes, slowly, but the speaker delayed his reply, until he had surveyed his host from head to foot, with a glance both critical and appreciative. He saw a man in height rather less than the stock size six feet, so much in demand by the manufacturers of modern heroes of fiction. A man a bit round-shouldered, too, but otherwise sturdily built, self-contained, well-groomed. Kirkwood wears a boy's honest face. No one has ever called him handsome. A few prejudiced persons have decided that he has an interesting countenance. The propounders of this verdict have been, for the most part, feminine. Kirkwood himself has been heard to declare that his features do not fit, in its essence the statement is true, but there is a very real, if undefinable, engaging quality in their very irregularity. His eyes are brown, pleasant, said wide apart, straightforward of expression. Now it appeared that, whatever his motive, Mr. Callender had acted upon impulse in sending his card up to Kirkwood. Possibly he had anticipated a very different sort of reception from a very different sort of man. Even in the light of subsequent events, it remains difficult to fathom the mystery of his choice. Perhaps fate directed it. Stranger things have happened at the dictates of a man's destiny. At all events, this calendar proved not lacking in penetration. 
men of his stamp are commonly endowed with that quality to an eminent degree. Not slow to reckon the caliber of the man before him, the leaven of intuition began to work in his adipose intelligence. He owned himself baffled. Thanks, he concluded pensively. I reckon you're right. You won't do, after all. I've wasted your time. Mine, too. Don't mention it. Calendar got heavily out of his chair, reaching for his hat and umbrella. Permit me to apologize for an unwarrantable intrusion, Mr. Kirkwood. He faltered. A worried and calculating look shadowed his small eyes. I was looking for someone to serve me in a certain capacity. Certain or questionable, propounded Kirkwood blandly, opening the door. Pointedly, Mr. Callender ignored the imputation. "'Sorry I disturbed you. Good afternoon, Mr. Kirkwood. Good-bye, Mr. Callender. A smile twitched the corners of Kirkwood's too wide mouth. Callender stepped hastily out into the hall. As he strode, or rather rolled, away, Kirkwood maliciously feathered a Parthian arrow. "'By the way, Mr. Callender. The sound of retreating footsteps was stilled, and, yes, came from the gloom of the corridor. Were you ever in San Francisco, really and truly, honest injun, Mr. Callender? For a space the quiet was disturbed by harsh breathing, then, in a strained voice, Good day, Mr. Kirkwood, and again the sound of departing footfalls. Kirkwood closed the door and the incident simultaneously with a smart bang of finality. Laughing quietly, he went back to the window with its dreary outlook, now the drearier for lengthening evening shadows. I wonder what his game is anyway. An adventurer, of course. The woods are full of him. A queer fish, even of his kind. And with a trick up his sleeve as queer and fishy as himself. No doubt. End of chapter 1 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 2 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Doughty The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 2 And some there be who have adventures thrust upon them. The assumption seems not unwarrantable that Mr. Callender figuratively washed his hands of Mr. Kirkwood. Unquestionably, Mr. Kirkwood considered himself well rid of Mr. Callender. When the latter had gone his way, Kirkwood, mindful of the fact that his boat train would leave St. Pancras at half after eleven, set about his packing and dismissed from his thoughts the incident, created by the fat chevalier d'industrie, and at six o'clock or thereabouts let himself out of his room, dressed for the evening, a light raincoat over one arm, in the other a cane, the drizzle having ceased. A stolid British lift lifted him down to the ground floor of the establishment in something short of five minutes. Pausing in the office long enough to settle his bill and leave instructions to have his luggage conveyed to the boat train, he received with entire equanimity the affable benediction of the clerk, in whose eyes he still figured as that radiant creature, an American millionaire, and passed on to the lobby, where he surrendered hat, coat and stick to the cloakroom attendant, ere entering the dining-room. The hour was a trifle early for a London dinner, the handsome room but moderately filled with patrons. Kirkwood absorbed the fact unconsciously and without displeasure. The earlier, the better. He was determined to consume his last civilised meal, as he chose to consider it, at his serene leisure, to live fully his ebbing moments in the world to which he was born, to drink to its cloying dregs one ultimate draught of luxury. A benignant waiter bowed him into a chair by a corner table in juxtaposition with an open window, through which, swaying imperceptibly the closed hangings, were wafted gentle gusts of the London evening's sweet, damp breath. Kirkwood settled himself with an inaudible sigh of pleasure. He was dining, for the last time in heaven knew how long, in a first-class restaurant. 
With a deferential flourish, the waiter brought him the menu card. He had served in his time many an American millionaire. He had also served this Mr. Kirkwood, and respected him as one exalted above the run of his kind, in that he comprehended the art of dining. Fifteen minutes later, the waiter departed rejoicing, his order complete. To distract a conscience whispering of extravagance, Kirkwood lighted a cigarette. The room was gradually filling with later arrivals. It was the most favoured restaurant in London, and, despite the radiant costumes of the women, its atmosphere remained sedate and restful. A cab clattered down the side street on which the window opened. At a nearby table a woman laughed, quietly happy. Incuriously Kirkwood glanced her way. She was bending forward, smiling, flattering her escort with the adoration of her eyes. They were lovers, alone in the wilderness of a crowded restaurant. They seemed very happy. Kirkwood was conscious of a strange pang of emotion. It took him some time to comprehend that it was envy. He was alone and lonely. For the first time he realised that no woman had ever looked upon him as the woman at the adjoining table looked upon her lover. He had found time to worship but one mistress, his art, and he was renouncing her. He was painfully conscious of what he had missed, had lost, or had not yet found, the love of a woman. The sensation was curious, new, unique in his experience. His cigarette burned down to his fingers as he sat pondering. Abstractedly he ground its fire out in an ashtray. The waiter set before him a silver tureen, covered. He sat up and began to consume his soup, scarce doing it justice. His dream troubled him, his dream of the love of a woman. From a little distance his waiter regarded him with an air of disappointment. In the course of an hour and a half he awoke to discover the attendant in the act of pouring very hot and black coffee from a bright silver pot into a demitasse of fragile porcelain. Kirkwood slipped a single lump of sugar into the cup, gave over his cigar case to be filled, then leaned back deliberately lighting a long and slender panatella as a preliminary to the last lingering appreciation of the scene of which he was a part. He reviewed it through narrowed eyelids, lazily, yet with some slight surprise, seeming to see it with new vision, with eyes from which the scales of ignorance had dropped. This long and brilliant dining hall, with its quiet perfection of proportion and appointment, had always gratified his love of the beautiful. Tonight it pleased him to an unusual degree. Yet it was the same as ever, its walls tinted a deep rose with their hangings of dull cloth of gold, its lights discriminatingly clustered and discreetly shaded, redoubled in half a hundred mirrors, its subdued shimmer of plate and glass, its soberly festive assemblage of circumspect men and women splendidly gowned, its decorously muted murmur of voices penetrated and interwoven by the strains of a hidden string orchestra, caressed his senses as always, yet with a difference. Tonight he saw it a room populous with lovers, lovers insensibly paired, man unto woman attentive, woman of man regardful. He had never understood this before, this much he had missed in life. It seemed hard to realise that one must forgo it all for ever. Presently he found himself acutely self-conscious. The sensation puzzled him, and without appearing to do so he traced it from effect to cause, and found the cause in a woman, a girl rather, seated at a table the third removed from him, near the farther wall of the room. Too considerate, and too embarrassed, to return her scrutiny openly, look for look, he yet felt sure that, however temporarily, he was become the object of her intent interest. Idly employed with his cigar, he sipped his coffee. In time aware that she had turned her attention elsewhere, he looked up. At first he was conscious of an effect of disappointment. She was nobody that he knew, even by reputation. She was simply a young girl, barely out of her teens, if 
as old as that phrase would signify. He wondered what she had found in him, to make her think him worth so long a study, and looked again, more keenly curious. With this second glance, appreciation stirred the artistic side of his nature, that was already grown impatient of his fretted mood. The slender and girlish figure, posed with such absolute lack of intrusion against a screen of rose and gilt, moved him to critical admiration. The tinted glow of shaded candles caught glistening on the spun gold of her fair hair, and enhanced the fine pallor of her young shoulders. He saw promise, and something more than promise in her face, its oval something dimmed by warm shadows that unavailingly sought to blend youth and beauty alike into the dull, rich background. In the sheer youth of her, he realised, more than aught else, lay her chiefest charm. She could be little more than a child, indeed, if he were to judge her by the purity of her shadowed eyes, and the absence of emotion in the calm and direct look which presently she turned upon him, who sat wondering at the level, pencilled darkness of her brows. At length aware that she had surprised his interest, Kirkwood glanced aside, coolly deliberate, lest she should detect in his attitude anything more than impersonal approval. A slow colour burned his cheeks. In his temples there rose a curious pulsing. After a while she drew his gaze again, imperiously, herself all unaware of the havoc she was wreaking on his temperament. He could have fancied her distraught, cloaking an unhappy heart with placid brow and gracious demeanour, but such a conception matched strangely her glowing youth and spirit. What had she to do with care? What concern had black care, whose gaunt shape in sable shrouds had lurked at his shoulder all the evening, despite his rigid preoccupation, with a being as charmingly flushed with budding womanhood as this girl? Eighteen, he hazarded. Eighteen, or possibly nineteen, dining at the Pless in a ravishing dinner gown, and unhappy? Oh, hardly. Not she. Yet the impression haunted him, and ere long he was fain to seek confirmation or denial of it in the manner of her escort. The latter sat with back to Kirkwood, cutting a figure as negative as his snug evening clothes. One could surmise little from a fleshy neck, a round glazed bald spot, a fringe of grizzled hair, and two bright red ears. Calendar? Somehow the fellow did suggest Kirkwood's caller of the afternoon. The young man could not have said precisely how, for he was unfamiliar with the aspect of that gentleman's back. Nonetheless, the suggestion persisted. By now, a few of the guests, theatre-bound for the most part, were leaving. Here and there a table stood vacant that had been filled, cloth tarnished, chairs disarranged, in another moment to be transformed into its pristine brilliance under the deft attentions of the servitors. Down an aisle, past the table at which the girl was sitting, came two, making toward the lobby. The man, a slight and meagre young personality, in the lead. Their party had attracted Kirkwood's notice as they entered. Why, he did not remember, but it was in his mind that then they had been three. Instinctively he looked at the table they had left. It appeared that the third member had chosen to dally a few moments over his tobacco and a liqueur brandy. Kirkwood could see him plainly, lounging in his chair and fumbling the stem of a glass, a heavy man of sombre habit, his black and sullen brows lowering and thoughtful above a face boldly handsome. The woman of the trio was worthy of closer attention. Some paces in the wake of her lack-lustre esquire, she was making a leisurely progress, trailing the skirts of a gown magnificent beyond dispute, half concealed though it was by the opera cloak whose soft folds draped her shoulders. Slowly, carrying her head high, she approached, insolent eyes reviewing the room from beneath their heavy lids, a metallic and mature type of dark beauty supremely self-confident and self-possessed. Men turned involuntarily to look after her, not altogether in undiluted admiration. In the act of passing behind the putative calendar she paused momentarily, 
bending as if to gather up her train. Presumably the action disturbed her balance, she swayed a little, and in the effort to recover, rested the tips of her gloved fingers upon the edge of the table. Simultaneously, Kirkwood could have sworn, a single word left her lips, a word evidently pitched for the ear of the hypothetical calendar alone. Then she swept on, imperturbable, assured. To the perplexed observer, it was indubitably evident that some communication had passed from the woman to the man. Kirkwood saw the fat shoulders of the girl's companion stiffen suddenly as the woman's hand rested at his elbow. As she moved away, a little rippling shiver was plainly visible in the muscles of his back, and beneath his coat, mute token of relaxing tension. An instant later one plump and mottled hand was carelessly placed where the woman's had been, and was at once removed with fingers closed. To the girl, watching her face covertly, Kirkwood turned for clue to the incident. He made no doubt that she had observed the passage, proof of that one found in her sudden startling pallor of indignation, and in her eyes, briefly alight with some inscrutable emotion, though quickly veiled by lowered lashes. Slowly enough she regained colour and composure, while her vis-à-vis -vis sat motionless, head inclined as if in thought. Abruptly the man turned in his chair to summon a waiter, and exposed his profile. Kirkwood was in no wise amazed to recognise Calendar, a badly frightened Calendar now, however, and hardly to be identified with the sleek, glib fellow who had interviewed Kirkwood in the afternoon. His flabby cheeks were ashen and trembling, and upon the back of his chair the fat white fingers were drumming incessantly, an inaudible tattoo of shattered nerves. "'Scared silly,' commented Kirkwood. "'Why?' Having spoken to his waiter, Calendar for some seconds raked the room with quick glances, as if seeking an acquaintance. Presumably disappointed, he swung back to face the girl, bending forward to reach her ears with accents low-pitched and confidential. She, on her part, fell at once attentive, grave, and responsive. Perhaps a dozen sentences passed between them. At the outset her brows contracted, and she shook her head in gentle dissent, whereupon Callender's manner became more imperative. Gradually, unwillingly, she seemed to yield consent. Once she caught her breath sharply, and infected by her companion's agitation sat back, colour fading again in the round, young cheeks. Kirkwood's waiter put in an inopportune appearance with the bill. The young man paid it. When he looked up again, Callender had swung squarely about in his chair. His eye encountered Kirkwood's. He nodded pleasantly. Temporarily confused, Kirkwood returned the nod. In a twinkling, he had repented. Callender had left his chair and was wending his way through the tables towards Kirkwood's. Reaching it, he paused, offering the hand of genial fellowship. Kirkwood accepted it half-heartedly. What else was he to do? Remarking at the same time that Callender had recovered much of his composure, there was now a normal colouring in the heavily jowled countenance, with less glint of fear in the quick dark eyes, and Callender's hand, even if moist and cold, no longer trembled. Furthermore, it was immediately demonstrated that his impudence had not deserted him. "'Why, Kirkwood, my dear fellow!' he crowed, not so loudly as to attract attention, but in a tone assumed to divert suspicion, should he be overheard. "'This is great luck!' you know, to find you here. Is it? returned Kirkwood coolly. He disengaged his fingers. The pink, plump face was contorted in a furtive grimace of depreciation. Without waiting for permission, Callender dropped into the vacant chair. My dear sir, proceeded unabashed, I throw myself upon your mercy. The devil you do. I must. I'm in the deuce of a hole, and there's no one I know here besides yourself. I— Kirkwood saw fit to lead him on, partly because out of the corner of his eye he was aware of the girl's unconcealed surprise. "'Go on, please, Mr. Callender. You throw yourself on a total stranger's mercy, because you're in the deuce of a hole, and—' "'It's this way. I'm called away on urgent business, imperative business. I must go at once. My daughter is with me, my daughter, 
think of my embarrassment. I cannot leave her here alone, nor can I permit her to go home unprotected. Callender paused in anxiety. That's easily remedied, then, suggested Kirkwood. How? Put her in a cab at the door. I... no. The devil! I couldn't think of it. You won't understand. I do not understand, amended the younger man, politely. Callender compressed his lips nervously. It was plain that the man was quivering with impatience and half mad with excitement. He held quiet only long enough to regain his self-control and take counsel with his prudence. "'It is impossible, Mr. Kirkwood. I must ask you to be generous and believe me.' "'Very well. For the sake of argument, I do believe you, Mr. Callender.' "'Hell!' exploded the elder man in an undertone. Then, swiftly stammering in his haste, "'I can't let Dorothy accompany me to the door,' he declared. "'She—' I throw myself upon your mercy. What? Again? The truth. The truth is, if you will have it, that I am in danger of arrest the moment I leave here. If my daughter is with me, she will have to endure the shame and humiliation. Then why place her in such a position? Kirkwood demanded sharply. Callender's eyes burned, incandescent with resentment. Offended, he offered to rise and go, but changed his mind and sat tight in hope. I beg of you, sir. One moment, Mr. Callender. Abruptly, Kirkwood's weathercock humour shifted, amusement yielding to intrigued interest. After all, why not oblige the fellow? What did anything matter now? What harm could visit him if he yielded to this corpulent adventurer's insistence? Both from experience and observation he knew this for a world plentifully peopled by soldiers of fortune contrivers of snares and pitfalls for the feet of the unwary. On the other hand, it is axiomatic that a penniless man is perfectly safe anywhere. Besides, there was the girl to be considered. Kirkwood considered her forthwith. In the process thereof, his eyes sought her, perturbed. Their glances clashed. She looked away hastily, crimson to the temples. Instantly the conflict between curiosity and caution Inclination and distrust was at an end. With sudden compliance, the young man rose. "'I shall be most happy to be of service to your daughter, Mr. Callender,' he said, placing the emphasis with becoming gravity. And then, the fat adventurer leading the way, Kirkwood strode across the room, wondering somewhat at himself if the whole truth is to be disclosed. End of chapter 2 Recording by Adam Doughty Kerry Kerry, New Zealand. Chapter 3 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Doughty. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 3 Calendar's Daughter. All but purring with satisfaction and relief, Callender halted. "'Dorothy, my dear, permit me to introduce an old friend, Mr. Kirkwood. Kirkwood, this is my daughter.' "'Miss Callender,' acknowledged Kirkwood. The girl bowed, her eyes steady upon his own. "'Mr. Kirkwood is very kind,' she said gravely. "'That's right,' Callender exclaimed blandly. "'He's promised to see you home. Now, both of you will pardon my running away, I know. Yes, assented Kirkwood agreeably. The elder man turned and hurried toward the main entrance. Kirkwood took the chair he had vacated. To his disgust he found himself temporarily dumb. No flicker of thought illuminated the darkness of his confusion. How was he to open a diverting conversation with a young woman whom he had met under auspices so extraordinary? Any attempt to gloze the situation, he felt, would be futile. And somehow he did not care to render himself ridiculous in her eyes, little as he knew her. Inanely dumb, he sat watching her, smiling fatuously until it was borne in on him that he was staring like a boar and grinning like an idiot. Convinced, he blushed for himself, something which served to make him more tongue-tied than ever. As for his involuntary protégé, 
she exhibited such sweet composure that he caught himself wondering if she really appreciated the seriousness of her parents' predicament, if, for that matter, its true nature were known to her at all. Calendar, he believed, was capable of prevarication, polite and impolite. Had he lied to his daughter, or to Kirkwood? To both, possibly. To the former alone, not improbably. That the adventurer had told him the desperate truth, Kirkwood was quite convinced. But he now began to believe that the girl had been put off with some fictitious explanation. Her tranquillity and self-control were remarkable. Otherwise, she seemed very young to possess those qualities in such eminent degree. She was looking wearily past him, her gaze probing some unguessed abyss of thought. Kirkwood felt himself privileged to stare in wonder. Her naive aloofness of poise gripped his imagination powerfully, the more so, perhaps, since it seemed eloquent of her intention to remain enigmatic, but by no means more powerfully than the unaided appeal of her loveliness. Presently the girl herself relieved the tension of the situation, fairly startling the young man by going straight to the heart of things. Without preface or warning, lifting her gaze to his, "'My name is really Dorothy Callender,' she observed, and then, noting his astonishment, "'You would be privileged to doubt, under the circumstances,' she added. "'Please let us be frank.' "'Well,' he stammered, "'if I didn't doubt, let's say I was unprejudiced.' His awkward, well-meant pleasantry, perhaps not conceived in the best of taste, sounded in his own ears wretchedly flat and vapid. He regretted it spontaneously. The girl ignored it. "'You are very kind,' she iterated the first words he had heard from her lips. "'I wish you to understand that I, for one, appreciate it.' "'Not kind. I have done nothing. I am glad. One is apt to become interested when romance is injected into a prosaic existence.' Kirkwood allowed himself a keen but cheerful glance. She nodded with a showy smile. He continued, purposefully, to distract her, holding her with his honest, friendly eyes. Since it is to be confidences, this she questioned with an all but imperceptible lifting of the eyebrows, I don't mind telling you my own name is really Philip Kirkwood. And you are an old friend of my father's? He opened his lips, but only to close them without speaking. The girl moved her shoulders with a shiver of disdain. I knew it wasn't so. "'You know it would be hard for a young man like myself to be a very old friend,' he countered lamely. "'How long, then, have you known each other?' "'Must I answer?' "'Please.' "'Between three and four hours. I thought as much.' She stared past him, troubled. Abruptly she said, "'Please smoke.' "'Shall I?' "'If you wish it, of course,' she repeated. "'Please, we were to wait ten minutes or so,' she continued. He produced his cigarette-case. "'If you care to smoke, it will seem an excuse.' He lighted his cigarette. "'And then you may talk to me,' she concluded calmly. "'I would gladly, if I could guess what would interest you.' "'Yourself.' "'Tell me about yourself,' she commanded. "'It would bore you.' He responded, tritely, confused. No, you interest me very much. She made the statement quietly, contemptuous of coquetry. Very well, then. I am Philip Kirkwood, an American. Nothing more? Little worth retailing. I'm sorry. Why? He demanded, piqued. Because you have merely indicated that you are a wealthy American. Why wealthy? If not... You would have some aim in life, a calling or profession. And you think I have none. Unless you consider it your vocation to be a wealthy American. I don't. Besides, I'm not wealthy. In point of fact, I... He pulled up short, on the verge of declaring himself a pauper. I'm a painter. Her eyes lightened with interest. An artist? I hope so. I don't paint signs or houses, he remarked. Amused, she laughed softly. I suspected it, she declared. Not really. It was your way of looking at things that made me guess it, the painter's way. I have often noticed it, 
as if mentally blending colours all the time. Yes, that and seeing flaws. I have discovered none, he told her, brazenly. But again her secret cares were claiming her thoughts, and the gay, inconsequential banter died upon her scarlet lips, as a second time her glance ranged away, sounding mysterious depths of anxiety. Provoked, he would have continued the chatter. I have confessed, he persisted. You know everything of material interest about me. And yourself? I am merely Dorothy Callender, she answered. Nothing more, he laughed. That is all, if you please, for the present. And I am to content myself with the promise of the future? The future, she told him seriously, is tomorrow. And tomorrow, she moved restlessly in her chair, eyes and lips pathetic in their distress. Please, we will go now, if you are ready. I am quite ready, Miss Callender. He rose. A waiter brought the girl's cloak and put it in Kirkwood's hands. He held it until, smoothing the wrists of her long white gloves, she stood up, then placed the garment upon her young white shoulders, troubled by the indefinable sense of intimacy imparted by the privilege. She permitted him this personal service. She felt that she trusted him, that out of her gratitude had grown a simple and almost childish faith in his generosity and considerateness. As she turned to go, her eyes thanked him with an unfathomable glance. He was again conscious of that esoteric disturbance in his temples. Puzzled, hazily analysing the sensation, he followed her to the lobby. A page brought him his topcoat, hat and stick. Tipping the child from sheer force of habit, he desired a gigantic porter, impressively ornate in hotel livery, to call a hansom. Together they passed out into the night, he and the girl. Beneath a permanent awning of steel and glass she waited patiently, slender, erect, heedless of the attention she attracted from wayfarers. The night was young, the air mild. Upon the sidewalk, muddied by a million feet, two streams of wayfarers flowed incessantly, bound west from Green Park or east toward Piccadilly Circus, a well-dressed throng for the most part, with here and there a man in evening dress. Between the carriages at the curb and the hotel doors moved others, escorting fluttering butterfly women in elaborate toilets, heads bare, skirts daintily gathered above their perishable slippers. Here and there meaner shapes slipped silently through the crowd, sinister shadows of the city's proletariat blotting ominously the brilliance of the scene. A cab drew in at the block. The porter clapped an arc of wickerwork over its wheel to protect the girl's skirts. She ascended to the seat. Kirkwood, dropping sixpence in the porter's palm, prepared to follow, but a hand fell upon his arm, peremptory, inexorable. He faced about, frowning, to confront a slight, hatchet-faced man somewhat under medium height, dressed in a sack suit and wearing a derby well forward over his eyes that were hard and bright. "'Mr. Callender," said the man, tensely, "'I presume I needn't name my business. I'm from the yard.' "'My name's not Callender." The detective smiled wearily. "'Don't be a fool, Callender," he began. But the porter's hand fell upon his shoulder and the giant bent low to bring his mouth close to the other's ear. Kirkwood heard indistinctly his own name, followed by Callender's, and the words, Never fear, I'll point him out. But the woman, argued the detective, unconvinced, staring into the cab. Am I not at liberty to have a lady dine with me in a public restaurant? interposed Kirkwood, without raising his voice. The hard eyes looked him up and down without favour. Then, "'Beg pardon, sir. I see my mistake,' said the detective, brusquely. "'I'm glad you do,' returned Kirkwood grimly. "'I fancy it will bear investigation.' He mounted the step. "'Imperial Theatre,' he told the driver, giving the first address that occurred to him. It could be changed. For the moment 
The main issue was to get the girl out of the range of the detective's interest. He slipped into his place as the hansom wheeled into the turgid tide of westbound traffic. So, Callender had escaped after all. Moreover, he had told the truth to Kirkwood. By his side, the girl moved uneasily. "'Who was that man?' she inquired. Kirkwood sought her eyes and found them wholly ingenuous. It seemed that Callender had not taken her into his confidence after all. She was, therefore, in no way implicated in her father's affairs. Inexplicably, the young man's heart felt lighter. A mistake. The fellow took me for someone he knew, he told her carelessly. The assurance satisfied her. She rested quietly, wrapped up in personal concerns. Her companion pensively contemplated an infinity of arid and handsomeless tomorrows. About them the city throbbed in a web of misty twilight, the humid farewell of a dismal day. In the air a faint haze swam, rendering the distances opalescent. Athwart the western sky the afterglow of a drenched sunset lay like a wash of rose madder. Piccadilly's asphalt shone like watered silk, black and lustrous, reflecting a myriad lights in vibrant ribbons of party-coloured radiance. On every hand, cab lights danced like fireflies. The rumble of wheels blended with the hollow pounding of uncounted hooves, merging insensibly into the deep and solemn roar of London town. Suddenly, Kirkwood was recalled to a sense of duty by a glimpse of Hyde Park Corner. He turned to the girl. "'I didn't know where you wished to go.' She seemed to realise his meaning with surprise, as one whose thoughts have strayed afar, recalled into an imperative world. "'Oh, did I forget? Tell him, please, to drive to number 9, Frognall Street, Bloomsbury.' Kirkwood poked his cane through the trap, repeating the address. The cab wheeled smartly across Piccadilly, swung into Half Moon Street, and thereafter made better time, darting briskly down abrupt vistas of shining pavement, walled in by blank visaged houses, or round two sides of one of London's innumerable private parks, wherein spring foliage glowed a tender green in artificial light. Now and then it crossed brilliant main arteries of travel, and eventually emerged from a maze of backways into Oxford Street to hammer eastwards to Tottenham Court Road. Constraint hung like a curtain between the two, a silence which the young man forbore to moderate, finding more delight that he had cared, or dared, confess to, in contemplation of the pure, girlish profile so close to him. She seemed quite unaware of him, lost in thought, large eyes sober, lips serious that were fashioned for laughter, round little chin, firm with some occult resolution. It was not hard to fancy her nerves keyed to a high pitch of courage and determination, nor easy to guess for what reason. Watching always, keenly sensitive to the beauty of each salient line betrayed by the flying lights, Kirkwood's own consciousness lost itself in a profitless, even a perilous labyrinth of conjecture. The cab stopped. Both occupants came to their senses with little start. The girl leaned out over the apron, recognised the house she sought in one swift glance, testified to the recognition with a hushed exclamation, and began to arrange her skirts. Kirkwood, unheeding her faint-hearted protests, jumped out, interposing his cane between her skirts and the wheel. Simultaneously he received a vivid mental photograph of the locality. Frognall Street proved to be one of those byways, a short block in length, which, hemmed in on all sides by a meaner purlieu, has, even in Bloomsbury, escaped the sordid commercial eye of the keeper of furnished lodgings, retaining jealously something of the old-time dignity and reserve that were its pride in the days before society swarmed upon Mayfair and Belgravia. Its houses loomed tall, with many windows, mostly lightless, materially aggravating that air of isolate, cold dignity which distinguishes the Englishman's castle. 
Here and there stood one less bedraggled than its neighbours, though all, without exception, spoke assertively of respectability down at heel, but fighting tenaciously for existence. Some, vanguards of that imminent day when the boarding-house should reign supreme, wore with shamefaced air placards of estate agents, advertising their susceptibility to sale or lease. In the company of the latter was number nine. The American noted the circumstance subconsciously, at a moment when Miss Callender's hand, small as a child's, warm and compact in its white glove, lay in his own. And then she was on the sidewalk, her face upturned to his, vivacious with excitement. "'You have been so kind,' she told him warmly, "'that one hardly knows how to thank you, Mr. Kirkwood.' "'I, I have done nothing, nothing at all,' he mumbled, disturbed by a sudden, unreasoning alarm for her. She passed quickly to the shelter of the pillared portico. He followed clumsily. On the doorstep she turned, offering her hand. He took and retained it. "'Good night,' she said. "'I am to understand that I am dismissed, then,' he stammered ruefully. She evaded his eyes. "'I thank you, and have no further need. You are quite sure.' "'Won't you believe me at your service?' She laughed uneasily. "'No, I'm all right now. I can do nothing more.' "'Sure?' "'Nothing. But you—you you make me almost sorry I can't impose still further upon your good nature. Please, don't hesitate.' "'Aren't you very persistent, Mr. Kirkwood?' Her fingers moved in his. Burning with the reproof, he released them, and turned to her, so woebegone a countenance that she repented of her severity. Don't worry about me, please. I am truly safe now. Some day I hope to be able to thank you adequately. Good night. Her passkey grated in the lock. Opening, the door disclosed a dark and uninviting entry hall, through which there breathed an air heavy with the dank and dusty odour of untenanted rooms. Hesitating on the threshold, over her shoulder the girl smiled kindly upon her commandeered esquire, and stepped within. He lifted his hat automatically. The door closed with an echoing slam. He turned to the waiting cab, fumbling for change. "'I'll walk,' he told the cabby, paying him off. The hansom swept away to a tune of hammering hooves, and quiet rested upon the street as Kirkwood turned to the nearest corner, in an unpleasant temper, puzzled and discontented. It seemed hardly fair that he should have been dragged into so promising an adventure by his ears, so to put it, only to be thus summarily called upon to write Fini beneath the incident. He rounded the corner and walked halfway to the next street, coming to an abrupt and rebellious pause by the entrance to a covered alleyway, of two minds as to his proper course of action. In the background of his thoughts, number nine, Frognall Street, reared its five-storey façade, sinister and forbidding. He reminded himself of its unlighted windows, of its sign, to be let, of the effluvia of desolation that had saluted him when the door swung wide. A deserted house and the girl alone in it. Was it right for him to leave her so? End of chapter 3 Recording by Adam Doughty Kerry Kerry, New Zealand Chapter 4 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon the Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 4 9 Frocknell Street, W.C. The covered alleyway gave upon Quadrant Mews, or so declared a notice painted on the dead wall of the passage. Overhead, complaining as it swayed in the wind, hung the smirched and weather-worn signboard of the Hog in the Pound public house, where from escaped sounds of such revelry by night as is indulged in by the British workingmen in hours of ease. At the curb in front of the house of entertainment, 
dejected animals drooping between their shafts, two hansoms stood in waiting, until such time as the lords of their destinies should see fit to sally forth and inflict themselves upon a cab-hungry populace. As Kirkwood turned, a third vehicle rumbled up out of the mews. Kirkwood can close his eyes, even at this late day, and both see and hear it all again, even as he can see the unbroken row of dingy dwellings that lined his way back from Quadrant Mews to Frocknell Street corner, all drab and unkempt, all sporting in their fanlights the legend and lure furnished apartments. For, between his curiosity about and his concern for the girl, he was being led back to number nine by the nose, as it were, hardly willingly, at best. Profoundly stupefied by the contemplation of his own temerity, he yet returned unfaltering. He who had for so long plumed himself upon his strict supervision of his personal affairs and equally steadfast unconsciousness of his neighbour's businesses, now found himself in the very act of pushing in where he was not wanted, as he had been advised in well-nigh as many words. He experienced an effect of standing to one side a witness to his own folly, with rising wonder, unable to credit the strength of the infatuation which was placing him so conspicuously in the way of a snubbing. If perchance he were to meet the girl again, as she was leaving number nine, what then? The contingency dismayed him incredibly, in view of the fact that it did not avail to make him pause. To the contrary, he disregarded it resolutely. Mad, impertinent, justified of his unnamed apprehensions, or simply addled, he held on his way. He turned up Frocknell Street with the manner of one out for a leisurely evening stroll. Simultaneously, from the farther corner, another pedestrian debouched into the thoroughfare, a mere moving shadow at that distance, brother to blacker shadows that skulked in the fenced areas and unlively entries of that poorly lighted block. The hush was something beyond belief when one remembered the nearness of blatant Tottenham Court Road. Kirkwood conceived a wholly senseless curiosity about the other wayfarer. The man was walking rapidly, heels ringing with uncouth loudness, cane tapping the flagging at brief intervals. Both sounds ceased abruptly as their cause turned in between one of the porticos. In the emphatic and unnatural quiet that followed, Kirkwood, stepping more lightly, fancied that another shadow followed the first, noiselessly and with furtive stealth. Could it be number nine into which they had passed? The American's heart beat a livelier tempo at the suggestion. If it had not been number nine, he was still too far away to tell, it was certainly one of the dwellings adjacent thereunto. The improbable possibility, but why improbable, that the girl was being joined by her father, or by friends, annoyed him with illogical intensity. He mended his own pace, designing to pass whichever house it might be before the door should be closed, thought better of this, and slowed up again, anathematizing himself with much excuse for being the inquisitive dolt that he was. Approaching number nine with laggard feet, he manufactured a desire to light a cigarette as a cover for his design, where he spied upon by unsuspected eyes. Cane under arm, hands cupped to shield Avesta's flame, he stopped directly before the portico turning his eyes askance to the shadowed doorway, and made a discovery sufficiently startling to hold him spellbound and incidentally to scorch his gloves before he thought to drop the match. The door of number nine stood ajar, a black interval an inch or so in width showing between its edge and the jamb. Suspicion and alarm set his wits a tingle. More distinctly he recalled the jarring bang accompanied by the metallic click of the latch when the girl had shut herself in and him out. Now some person or persons had followed her, neglecting the most obvious precaution of a householder. And why? Why but because the intruder did not wish the sound of closing to be audible to her, or those within? He reminded himself that it was all none of his affair, decided to pass on and go his way in peace, and impulsively, swinging about, marched straight away from the unclosed door. Older, Governor! Kirkwood halted on the cry, faltering in indecision. Should he take the plunge, or withdraw? Synchronously, he was conscious that a man's figure had detached itself from the shadows beneath the nearest portico, and was drawing nearer, with every indication of haste, to intercept him. "'Here now, Governor. You're making a mistake. You don't live here.' "'How do you know?' demanded Kirkwood crisply, 
tightening his grip on a stick. Was this the second shadow he had seemed to see, the confederate of him who had entered number nine, a sentry to forestall interruption? If so, the fellow lacked discretion, though his determination that the American should not interfere was undeniable. It was with an ugly and truculent manner, if more warily, that the man closed in. "'I knows. You clear out, or—' He flung out a hand with the plausible design of grasping Kirkwood by the collar. The latter lifted his stick, deflecting the arm, and incontinently landed his other fist forcibly on the fellow's chest. The man reeled back, cursing. Before he could recover, Kirkwood calmly crossed the threshold, closed the door, and put his shoulder to it. In another instant, fumbling in the darkness, he found the bolts and drove them home. And it was done. The transformation accomplished. His inability to refrain from interfering had encompassed his downfall, had changed a peaceable and law-abiding alien within British shores into a busybody, a trespasser, a misdemeanant, a, yes, for all he knew to the contrary, in the estimation of the law, a burglar, prime candidate for a convict's stripes. Breathing hard with excitement, he turned and laid his back against the panels, trembling in every muscle, terrified by the result of his impulsive audacity, thunderstruck by a lightning-like foreglimpse of its possible consequences. Of what colossal imprudence had he not been guilty? "'The devil!' he whispered. "'What an ass! What an utter ass I am!' Behind him the knob was rattled urgently, to an accompaniment of feet shuffling on the stone, and immediately, if he were to make a logical deduction from the rasping and scraping sound within the door-casing, the bell-pool was violently agitated without, however, adducing any response from the bell itself, wherever that might be situate. After which, as if in despair, the outsider again rattled and jerked the knob. Be his status what it might, whether servant of the household, its caretaker, or a night watchman, the man was palpably determined both to get himself in and Kirkwood out, and yet, curious to consider, determined to gain his end without attracting undue attention. Kirkwood had expected to hear the knocker's thunder as soon as the bell failed to give tongue. But it did not sound, although there was a knocker. Kirkwood himself had remarked that antiquated and rusty bit of ironmongery affixed to the middle panel of the door, and it made him feel sure that something surreptitious and lawless was in process within those walls, that the confederate without, having failed to prevent a stranger from entering, left unemployed a means so certain sure to rouse the occupants but his inferential analysis of this phase of the proceedings was summarily abrupted by that identical alarm. In a trice the house was filled with flying echoes, wakened to sonorous riot by the crash and clamour of the knocker, and Kirkwood stood fully two yards away, his heart hammering wildly, his nerves a-jingle, much as if the resounding blows had landed upon his own person rather than on stout oaken planking. Ere he had time to wonder, the racket ceased, and from the street filtered voices in altercation. Listening, Kirkwood's pulses quickened, and he laughed uncertainly for pure relief, retreating to the door and putting an ear to a crack. The accents of one speaker were new in his hearing, stern, crisp, quick with the spirit of authority which animates that most austere and dignified limb of the law to be encountered the world over, a London bobby. "'Now then, my man, what do you want there? Come now, speak up!' and step out into the light where I can see you. The response came in the sniffling snarl of the London ne'er-do-well, the unemployable rogue whose chiefest occupation seems to be to march in the ranks of the unemployed on the occasion of its annual demonstrations. "'Let me alone, can't you? I'm doing no harm, officer.' "'Didn't you hear me? Step out here. Ah, that's better. No harm, eh? Perhaps you'll explain how there's no harm breaking into unoccupied houses.' "'God blimey, how was I to know? "'Here's a tough ends me sixpence for opening his cab door today, "'and, says he, my man,' he says, "'you've got an honest face. "'Why don't you work?' says he. "'How can I?' says I. "'Here am I, out of a job these six months, "'looking for work every day and can't find it. "'Says he, come and see me this evening at my home, "'Noin Frognall Street, he says, and that'll do for now.' You borrow a pencil and paper and write it down, and I'll read it when I've got more time. I never heard the like of it. This house hasn't been lived in these two years. Move on, and don't let me find you round here again. March, I say. There was more of it. 
more whining explanations artfully tinctured with abuse, more terse commands to depart, the whole concluding with scraping footsteps, diminuendo, and another perfunctory rattle of the knob as the bobby, having shooed the putative evildoer off, assured himself that no damage had actually been done. Then he, too, departed, satisfied and self-righteous, leaving a badly frightened but very grateful amateur criminal to pursue his self-appointed career of crime. He had no choice other than to continue. In point of fact, it had been insanity, just then, to back out, and run the risk of apprehension at the hands of that ubiquitous bobby, who, for all he knew, might be lurking not a dozen yards distant, watchful for just such a sequel. Still, Kirkwood hesitated with the best of excuses. Reassuring, as he had found, the sentinel's extemporized yarn, proof positive that the fellow had had no more right to prohibit a trespass than Kirkwood to commit one, at the same time he found himself pardonably a prey to emotions of the utmost consternation and alarm. If he feared to leave the house, he had no warrant whatever to assume that he would be permitted to remain many minutes unharmed within its walls of mystery. The silence of it discomforted him beyond measure. It was, in a word, uncanny. Before him, as he lingered at the door, vaguely disclosed by a wan illumination penetrating a dusty and begrimed fanlight, a broad hall stretched indefinitely towards the rear of the building, losing itself in blackness beyond the foot of a flight of stairs. Save for a few articles of furniture, a hall table, an umbrella stand, a tall dumb clock flanked by high-backed chairs, it was empty. Other than Kirkwood's own restrained respiration, not a sound throughout the house advertised its inhabitation. Not a board creaked beneath the pressure of a foot, not a mouse rustled in the wainscoting or beneath the floors, not a breath of air stirred sighing in the stillness. And yet a tremendous racket had been raised at the front door within the sixty seconds past, and yet within twenty minutes two persons at least had preceded Kirkwood into the building. Had they not heard? The speculation seemed ridiculous. Or had they heard and, alarmed, been too effectually hobbled by the coils of their nefarious designs to dare reveal themselves, to investigate the cause of that thunderous summons? Or were they, perhaps, aware of Kirkwood's entrance, and lying perdue, in some dark corner, to ambush him as he passed? True, that were hardly like the girl. True, on the other hand, it were possible that she had stolen away while Kirkwood was hanging in irresolution by the passage to Quadrant Mews. Again, the space of time between Kirkwood's dismissal and his return had been exceedingly brief. Whatever her errand, she could hardly have fulfilled it and escaped. At that moment she might be in the power and at the mercy of him who had followed her, providing he were not friendly, and in that case what torment! and what peril might not be hers. Spurred by solicitude, the young man put personal apprehensions in his pocket and forgot them, cautiously picking his way through the gloom to the foot of the stairs. There, by the newel post, he paused. Darkness walled him about. Overhead the steps vanished in a well of blackness. He could not even see the ceiling. His eyes ached with futile effort to fathom the unknown his ears rang with unrewarded strain of listening. The silence hung inviolate, profound. Slowly he began to ascend, a hand following the balusters, the other with his cane exploring the obscurity before him. On the steps a carpet, thick and heavy, muffled his footfalls. He moved noiselessly. Towards the top the staircase curved, and presently a foot that groped for a higher level failed to find it. Again he halted, acutely distrustful. Nothing happened. He went on, guided by the balustrade, passing three doors, all open, through which the undefined proportions of a drawing-room and boudoir were barely suggested in a ghostly dusk. By each he paused, listening, hearing nothing. His foot struck with a deadened thud against the bottom step of the second flight, and his pulses fluttered wildly for a moment. Two minutes, three, he waited in suspense. From above came no sound. He went on as before, save that twice a step yielded, complaining, to his weight. Toward the top the close air, like the darkness, seemed to weigh more heavily upon his consciousness. 
little drops of perspiration, started out on his forehead. His scalp tingled. His mouth was hot and dry. He felt as if stifled. Again the raised foot found no level higher than its fellows. He stopped and held his breath, oppressed by a conviction that someone was near him. Confirmation of this came startlingly. An eerie whisper in the night, so close to him that he fancied he could feel the disturbed air fanning his face. "'Is it you, Eccles?' He had no answer ready. The voice was masculine, if he analysed it correctly. Dumb and stupid, he stood poised upon the point of panic. "'Eccles, is it you?' The whisper was both shrill and shaky. As it ceased, Kirkwood was half blinded by a flash of light, striking him squarely in the eyes. Involuntarily, he shrank back a pace, to the first step from the top. Instantaneously, the light was eclipsed. "'Hold, or... or I fire!' By now, he realized that he had been scrutinized by the aid of an electric hand-lamp. The tremulous whisper told him something else, that the speaker suffered from nerves as high-strung as his own. The knowledge gave him inspiration. He cried at a venture, in a guarded voice, "'Hands up!' and struck out smartly with his stick. Its ferrule impinged upon something soft but heavy. Simultaneously he heard a low, frightened cry. The cane was swept aside, a blow landed glancingly on his shoulder, and he was carried fairly off his feet by the weight of a man hurled bodily upon him with staggering force and passion. Reeling, he was borne back and down a step or two, and then, choking on an oath, dropped his cane, and with one hand caught the balusters, while the other tore ineffectually at wrists of hands that clutched his throat. So, for a space, the two hung, panting and struggling. Then, endeavouring to swing his shoulders over against the wall, Kirkwood released his grip on the handrail and stumbled on the stairs, throwing his antagonist out of balance. The latter plunged downward, dragging Kirkwood with him. Clawing, kicking, grappling, they went to the bottom, jolted violently by each step. But long before the last was reached, Kirkwood's throat was free. Throwing himself off, he got to his feet and grasped the railing for support, then waited, panting, trying to get his bearings. Himself painfully shaken and bruised, he shrewdly surmised that his assailant had fared as ill, if not worse. And, in point of fact, the man lay with neither move nor moan, still as death at the American's feet. And once more... Silence had folded its wings over number nine Frocknell Street. More conscious of that terrifying, motionless presence beneath him than able to distinguish it by power of vision, he endured interminable minutes of trembling horror in a witless daze before he thought of his matchbox. Immediately he found it and struck a light, as the wood caught and the bright small flame leaped in the pent air he leant forward over the body breathlessly dreading what he must discover. The man lay quiet, head upon the floor, legs and hips on the stairs. One arm had fallen over his face, hiding the upper half. The hand gleamed white and delicate as a woman's. His chin was smooth and round, his lips thin and petulant. Beneath his top coat, evening dress clothed a short and slender figure. Nothing whatever of his appearance suggested the burly ruffian, the midnight marauder, he seemed little more than a boy old enough to dress for dinner. In his attitude there was something pitifully suggestive of a beaten child thrown into a corner. Conscious smitten and amazed, Kirkwood stared on, until, without warning, the match flickered and went out. Then, straightening up with an exclamation at once of annoyance and concern, he rattled the box. It made no sound. It was empty. In disgust, he swore it was the devil's own luck that he should run out of Vesta's at a time so critical. He could not even say whether the fellow was dead, unconscious, or simply shamming. He had little idea of his looks, and to be able to identify him might save a deal of trouble at some future time, since he, Kirkwood, seemed so little able to disengage himself from the clutches of this insane adventure. And the girl! What had become of her? How could he continue to search for her, without lights or guide, through all those silent rooms whose walls might enclose a hundred hidden dangers in that house of mystery? But he debated only briefly. His blood was young, and it was hot. It was quite plain to him that he could not withdraw and retain his self-respect. If the girl was there to be found, most assuredly he must find her. The hand-lamp that had dazzled him at the head of the stairs should be his aid, now that he thought of it, 
and providing he was able to find it. In the scramble on the stairs he had lost his hat, but he remembered that the Vesta's short-lived light had discovered this on the floor beyond the man's body. Carefully stepping across the latter, he recovered his headgear, and then, kneeling, listened with an ear close to the fellow's face. A softly regular beat of breathing reassured him. Half rising, he caught the body beneath the armpits, lifting and dragging it off the staircase, and knelt again to feel of each pocket in the man's clothing, partly as an obvious precaution to relieve him of his advertised revolver against an untimely wakening, partly to see if he had the lamp about him. The search proved fruitless. Kirkwood suspected that the weapon, like his own, had existed only in his victim's ready imagination. As for the lamp, in the act of rising he struck it with his foot and picked it up. It felt like a metal tube, a couple of inches in diameter, a foot or so in length, passably heavy. He fumbled with it impatiently. However the dickens, he wondered audibly, does the infernal machine work? As it happened, the thing worked with disconcerting abruptness as his untrained fingers fell hapchance on the spring. A sudden glare again smote him in the face, and at the same instant, from a point not a yard away apparently, an inarticulate cry rang out upon the stillness. Hard in his mouth, he stepped back, lowering the lamp, which impishly went out, and lifting a protecting forearm. "'Who's that?' he demanded harshly. A strangled sob of terror answered him, blurred by a swift rush of skirts, and in a breath his shattered nerves quieted, and a glimmer of common sense penetrated the murk anger and fear had bred in his brain. He understood, and stepped forward, catching blindly at the darkness with eager hands. "'Miss Callender!' he cried guardedly. "'Miss Callender, it is I, Philip Kirkwood!' There was a second sob, of another caliber than the first. Timid fingers brushed his, and a hand, warm and fragile, closed upon his own in a passion of relief and gratitude. "'Oh, I am so glad!' It was Dorothy Callender's voice, beyond mistake. "'I... I didn't know what to, to think. When the light struck your face, I was sure it was you. But when I called... You answered in a voice so strange, not like yours at all. Tell me, she pleaded, with palpable effort to steady herself, what has happened? I think, perhaps, said Kirkwood uneasily, again troubled by his racing pulses, perhaps you can do that better than I. Oh, said the voice guiltily, her fingers trembled in his, and were gently withdrawn. I was so frightened she confessed after a little pause. So frightened that I hardly understand. But you, how did you— I worried about you, he replied, in a tone absurdly apologetic. Somehow it didn't seem right. It was none of my business, of course, but I couldn't help coming back. This fellow, whoever he is, don't worry, he's unconscious, slipped into the house in a manner that seemed to me suspicious. I hardly know why I followed— except that he left the door an open invitation to interference. "'I can't be thankful enough,' she told him warmly, "'that you did interfere. You have indeed saved me from—' "'Yes?' "'I don't know what. If I knew the man—' "'You don't know him?' "'I can't even guess. The light?' She paused inquiringly. Kirkwood fumbled with the lamp, but whether its rude handling had impaired some vital part of the mechanism— or whether the batteries, through much use, were worn out, he was able to elicit only one feeble glow, which was instantly smothered by the darkness. "'It's no use,' he confessed. "'The thing's gone wrong.' "'Have you a match?' "'I used my last before I got hold of this.' "'Oh,' she commented, discouraged. "'Have you any notion what he looks like?' Kirkwood thought briefly. "'Raffles,' he replied with a chuckle. He looks like an amateurish and very callow Raffles. He's in dress clothes, you know. I wonder. There was a nuance of profound bewilderment in her exclamation. Then, he knocked against something in the hall. A chair, I presume. At all events, I heard that and put out the light. I was in the room above the drawing room, you see. I stole down to this floor, was there, in the corner by the stairs, when he parted within six inches and never guessed it. Then, when he got on the next floor, I started on. But you came in. I slipped into the drawing-room and crouched behind a chair. You went on, but I dared not move until... 
and then I heard someone cry out, and you fell down the stairs together. I hope you were not hurt. Nothing worth mention, but he must have got a pretty stiff knock to lay him out so completely. Kirkwood stirred the body with his toe, but the man made no sign. Death to the world. And now, Miss Callender? If she answered, he did not hear, for on the heels of his query banged the knocker down below, and thereafter crash followed crash, brewing a deep and sullen thundering to rouse the echoes and send them rolling, like voices of enraged ghosts, through the lonely rooms. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Black Bag》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon.《The Black Bag》by Louis Joseph Vance.《Chapter Five: The Mystery of a Four-Wheeler. What's that? At the first alarm, the girl had caught convulsively at Kirkwood's arm. Now, when a pause came in the growling of the knocker, she made him hear her voice it was broken and vibrant with a threat of hysteria. Oh, what can it mean? I don't know. He laid a hand reassuringly over that which trembled on his forearm. The police, possibly. Police? She iterated, aghast. What makes you think? A man tried to stop me at the door, he answered quickly. I got in before he could. When he tried the knocker, a bobby came along and stopped him. The latter may have been watching the house since then, been only his duty to keep an eye on it, and heaven knows we raised a racket coming head first down those stairs. Now we're up against it, he added brightly, but the girl was tucking at his arm. Come, she begged breathlessly. Come, there is a way, before they break in. But this man, Kirkwood hung back, troubled. They, the police are sure to find and care for him. So they will, he chuckled, and serve him right. He'd have choked me to death with all the good will in the world. Oh, do hurry! Turning, she sped light-footed down the staircase to the lower hall, he at her elbow. Here the uproar was loudest, deep enough to drown whatever sounds might have been made by two pairs of flying feet. For all that, they fled on tiptoe, stealthily, guilty shadows in the night, and at the newel post swung back into their unbroken blackness which shrouded the fastnesses backward of the dwelling. A sudden excess of fury on the part of the alarmist at the knocker spurred them on with quaking hearts. In half a dozen strides, Kirkwood, guided only by instinct and the frou-frou of the girl's skirts as she ran invisible before him, stumbled on the uppermost steps of a steep staircase. Only a handrail saved him, and that at the last moment. He stopped short, shocked into caution. From below came a contrite whisper. "'I'm so sorry. I should have warned you.' He pulled himself together glaring wildly at nothing. "'It's all right.' "'You are not hurt, truly? Oh, do come quickly!' She waited for him at the bottom of the flight. Happily for him, for he was all at sea. "'Here, your hand. Let me guide you. This darkness is dreadful.' He found her hand, somehow, and tucked his into it, confidingly, and not without an uncertain thrill of satisfaction. "'Come,' she panted. "'Come. If they break in—' Stifled by apprehension, her voice failed her. They went forward, now less impetuously, for it was very black, and the knocker had fallen still. "'No fear of that,' he remarked after a time. "'They wouldn't dare break in.' A fluttering whisper answered him. "'I don't know. We dare risk nothing.' They seemed to explore, to penetrate, acres of labyrinthine chambers and passages, delving deep into the bowels of the earth, like rabbits burrowing in a warren, hounded by beagles. Above stairs, the hush continued unbroken, as if the dumb genius of the place had cast a spell of silence on the knocker, or else, outraged, had smitten a noisy disturber with a palsy. The girl seemed to know her way. Whether guided by familiarity or by intuition, she led on without hesitation, Kirkwood blundering in her wake, between confusion of impression and dawning dismay, conscious of but one tangible thing to which he clung as to his hope of salvation, those firm, friendly fingers that clasped his own. It was as if they wandered on for an hour. Probably from start to finish their flight took up three minutes, no more. Eventually the girl stopped, releasing his hand. 
could hear her syncopated breathing before him, and gather that something was wrong. He took a step forward. "'What is it?' Her full voice broke out of the obscurity startlingly close in his very ear. "'The door! The bolts! I can't budge them!' "'Let me!' He pressed forward, brushing her shoulder. She did not draw away, but willingly yielded place to his hands at the fastenings, and what had proved impossible to her, to his strong fingers, was a matter of comparative ease. Yet, not entirely consciously, he was not quick. As he tucked at the bolts, he was poignantly sensitive to the subtle warmth of her at his side. He could hear her soft, dry sobs of excitement and suspense, punctuating the quiet, and was frightened, absolutely, by an impulse, too strong for ridicule, to take her in his arms, and comfort her with the assurance that, whatever her trouble, he would stand by her, and protect her. It were futile to try to laugh it off. He gave over the endeavour. Even at this critical moment he found himself repeating over and over to his heart the question, Can this be love? Can this be love? Could it be love at an hour's acquaintance? Absurd! But he could not laugh, nor render himself insensible to the suggestion. He found that he had drawn the bolts. The girl tugged and rattled at the knob. Reluctantly the door opened inwards. Beyond its threshold stretched ten feet or more of covered passageway, whose entrance framed an oblong glimmering with light. A draught of fresh air smote their faces. Behind them a door banged. "'Where does this open?' "'On the Mews,' she informed him. "'The Mews?' He stared in consternation at the pallid oval that stood for her face. "'The Mews? But you, in your evening gown, and I... "'There's no other way. We must chance it. Are you afraid? Afraid? He stepped aside. She stepped by him and on. He closed the door, carefully removing the key and locking it on the outside, then joined the girl at the entrance to the mews, where they paused perforce, she as much disconcerted as he, his primary objection momentarily waxing in force as they surveyed the conditions circumscribing their escape. Quadrant Mews was busily engaged in enjoying itself. Night had fallen sultry and humid, and the walls and doorsteps were well fringed and clustered with representatives of that class of London's population which infests mews through habit, taste, or force of circumstance. On the stoops men sprawled at easy length, discussing short, foul cutties loaded with that rank and odoriferous compound which, under the name and the fame of tobacco, is widely retailed at tuppence the ounce. Their womenfolk more commonly squatted on the thresholds, cheerfully squabbling. From opposing second-story windows, two leaned perilously forth, slanging one another across the square briskly in the purest billingsgate, and were impartially applauded from below by an audience whose appreciation seemed faintly tinged with envy. Squawking and yelling children swarmed over the flags and rude cobblestones that paved the ways. Like incense, heavy and pungent, the rich effluvia of stable-yards swirled in air made visible by its faint burden of mist. Over against the entrance, wherein Kirkwood and the girl lurked, confounded by the problem of escaping undetected through this vivacious scene, a stable-door stood wide, exposing a dimly illumined interior. Before it waited a four-wheeler, horse already hitched in between the shafts, while its driver, a man of leisurely turn of mind, made lingering inspection of straps and buckles, and, while Kirkwood watched him, turned attention to the carriage lamps. The match which he raked spiritedly down his thigh flared readily. The succeeding paler glow of the lamp threw into relief a heavy beefy mask, with shining bosses for cheeks and nose and chin. Through narrow slits two cunning eyes glittered like dull gems. Kirkwood appraised him with attention, as one in whose gross carcass was embodied their only hope of unannoyed return to the streets and normal surroundings of their world. The difficulty lay in attracting the man's attention and engaging him without arousing his suspicions or bringing the population about their ears. Though he hesitated long, no favourable opportunity presented itself, and in time the Jew approached the box with the ostensible purpose of mounting and driving off. In this critical situation, the American, forced to recognize that boldness must mark his course, took the girl's fate and his own in his hands, and with a quick word to his companion, stepped out of hiding. The cabby had a foot upon the step when Kirkwood tapped his shoulder. "'My man!' "'Law, me!' cried the fellow in amaze, pivoting on his heel. 
cupidity and quick understanding enlivened the eyes which in two glances looked Kirkwood up and down, comprehending at once both his badly rumpled hat and patent leather shoes. "'Help me,' thickly. "'Where'd you drop from, Governor?' "'That's my affair,' said Kirkwood briskly. "'Are you engaged?' "'If you mikes yourself my affair,' returned the cabby shrewdly, "'I am.' Ten shillings, then, if you get us out of here in one minute, and to, say, Hyde Park Corner in fifteen. "'Us?' demanded the fellow aggressively. Kirkwood motioned towards the passageway. "'There's a lady with me. There. Quick now.' Still the man did not move. "'Tam Bob,' he bargained. "'And you running away with the stuffy old gent's fair daughter? Come now, governor. Is it generous? My kid a quid, and—' "'A pound, then. Will you hurry?' By way of answer, the fellow scrambled hastily up to the box and snatched at the reins. "'Chuck! Gee up!' he cried sonorously. By now the muse had awakened to the fact of the presence of a toff in its midst. His light top-coat and silk hat rendered him as conspicuous as a red Indian in war-paint would have been on Rotten Row. A cry of surprise was raised, and drowned in a volley of ribald inquiry and chaff. Fortunately, the cabby was instant to rein in skilfully before the passageway, and Kirkwood had the door open before the four-wheeler stopped. The girl, hugging her cloak about her, broke cover, whereat the hue and cry redoubled, and sprang into the body of the vehicle. Kirkwood followed, shutting the door. As the cab lurched forward, he leaned over and drew down the window-shade, shielding the girl from half a hundred prying eyes. At the same time, they gathered momentum, banging swiftly, if loudly, out of the mews. An urchin, leaping on the step to spy in Kirkwood's window, fell off, yelping, as the driver's whiplash curled about his shanks. The gloom of the tunnel enclosed them briefly, ere the lights of the hog in the pound flashed by, and the wheels began to roll more easily. Kirkwood drew back with a sigh of relief. "'Thank God,' he said softly. The girl had no words. Worried by her silence, solicitous lest the strain ended she might be on the point of fainting, he let up the shade and lowered the window at her side. She seemed to have collapsed in her corner. Against the dark upholstery her hair shone like pale gold in the half-light. Her eyes were closed, and she held a handkerchief to her lips. The other hand lay limp. "'Miss Calendar?' She started, and something bulky fell from the seat and thumped heavily on the floor. Kirkwood bent to pick it up and so for the first time was made aware that she had brought with her a small black gladstone bag of considerable weight. As he placed it on the forward seat, their eyes met. "'I didn't know,' he began. "'It was to get that,' she hastened to explain, "'that my father sent me.' "'Yes,' he assented, in a tone indicating his complete comprehension. "'I trust,' he added vaguely, and neglected to complete the observation, losing himself in a maze of conjecture not wholly agreeable. This was a new phase of the adventure. He eyed the bag uneasily. What did it contain? How did he know? Hastily he abandoned that line of thought. He had no right to infer anything whatever, who had thrust himself uninvited into her concerns. Uninvited, that was to say, in the second instance, having been once definitely given his congé. Inevitably, however, a thousand unanswerable questions pestered him, just as, at each fresh facet of mystery disclosed by the sequence of the adventure, his bewilderment deepened. The girl stirred restlessly. "'I've been thinking,' she volunteered in a troubled tone, "'that there is absolutely no way I know of to thank you properly.' "'It is enough if I've been useful,' he rose in gallantry to the emergency. "'That,' she commented, was very prettily said. But then, I have never known anyone more kind and courteous and, and considerate than you. There was no savour of flattery in the simple and direct statement. Indeed, she was looking away from him, out of the window, and her face was serious with thought. She seemed to be speaking of rather than to Kirkwood. And I have been wondering, she continued with unaffected candour, what you must be thinking of me. I? "'What should I think of you, Miss Callender? With the air of a weary child, she laid her head against the cushions again, face to him, and watched him through the lowered lashes, unsmiling. "'You might be thinking that an explanation is due. Even the way we were brought together was extraordinary, Mr. Kirkwood. You must be very generous, 
as generous as you have shown yourself brave, not to require some sort of an explanation of me. I don't see it that way. I do. You've made me like you very much, Mr. Kirkwood. He shot her a covert glance, cautiously, for her naivete was flawless. With a feeling of some slight awe he understood this, a sensation of sincere reference for the unspoiled, candid, child's heart and mind that were hers. I'm glad, he said simply, very glad if that's the case, and presupposing I deserve it. Personally, he laughed, I seem to myself to have been rather forward. No, only kind, and a gentleman. But, please, he protested. Oh, but I mean it, every word. Why shouldn't I? In a little while, ten minutes, half an hour, we shall have seen the last of each other. Why shouldn't I tell you how I appreciate all that you have unselfishly done for me? If you put it that way, I am sure I don't know, beyond that it embarrasses me horribly to have you overestimate me so. If any courage has been shown this night, it is yours. But I am forgetting again. He thought to divert her. Where shall I tell the cabby to go this time, Miss Callender? Craven Street, please, said the girl, and added a house number. I am to meet my father there, with this, indicating the Gladstone bag. Kirkwood thrust head and shoulders out of the window, and instructed the cabby accordingly. But his ruse had been ineffectual, as he found when he sat back again. Quite composedly, the girl took up the thread of conversation where it had been broken off. "'It's rather hard to keep silence, when you've been so good. I don't want you to think me less generous than yourself, but, truly, I can tell you nothing.' She sighed a trace resentfully, or so he thought. "'There's little enough in this, this wretched affair, that I understand myself, and that little I may not tell. I want you to know that.' "'I understand, Miss Callender. "'There's one thing I may say, however. I've done nothing wrong to-night, I believe,' she added quickly. "'I've never for an instant questioned that,' he returned with a qualm of shame, for what he said was not true." Thank you. The four-wheeler swung out of Oxford Street into Charing Cross Road. Kirkwood noted the fact with a feeling of some relief that their ride was to be so short. Like many of his fellow sufferers from the artistic temperament, he was acutely disconcerted by spoken words of praise and gratitude. Miss Callender, unintentionally enough, had succeeded only in rendering him self-conscious and ill at ease. Nor had she fully relieved her mind, nor voiced all that perturbed her. And there's one thing more, she said presently. My father. I I hope you'll think charitably of him. Indeed, I've no reason or right to think otherwise. I was afraid uh, afraid his actions might have seemed peculiar to night. There are lots of things I don't understand, Miss Callender. Some day, perhaps, it will all clear up this trouble of yours. At least, one supposes it is trouble of some sort. "'And then you will tell me the whole story. "'Won't you?' Kirkwood insisted. "'I'm afraid not,' she said, with a smile of shadowed sadness. "'We are to say good-night in a moment or two, "'and it will be good-bye as well. "'It's unlikely that we shall ever meet again. "'I refuse positively to take such a gloomy view of the case.' "'She shook her head, laughing with him, but with shy regret. "'It's so, nonetheless.' We're leaving London this very night, my father and I. Leaving England, for that matter. Leaving England, he echoed. You're not by any chance bound for America, are you? I can't tell you. But you can tell me this. Are you booked on the Minneapolis? No. It is a... quite another boat. Of course, he commented savagely. It wouldn't be me to have any sort of luck. She made no reply beyond a low laugh. He stared gloomily out of his window, noting indifferently that they were passing the National Gallery. On their left, Trafalgar Square stretched, broad and bare, a wilderness of sooty stone, with an air of mutely tolerating its incongruous fountains. Through Charing Cross roared a tight rip of motor-buses and hackney carriages. Glumly, the young man foresaw the passing of his abbreviated romance. Their destination was near at hand. Brentwick had been right, to some extent at least. It was quite true that the curtain had been rung up that very night upon Kirkwood's romance. Unhappily, as Brentwick had not foreseen, it was immediately to be rung down. 
the cab rolled soberly into the strand. "'Since you are to say good-bye so very soon,' suggested Kirkwood, "'may I ask a parting favour, Miss Calendar? She regarded him with friendly eyes. "'You have every right,' she affirmed gently. "'Then, please to tell me frankly, are you going into any further danger?' "'And is that the only boon you crave at my hands, Mr. Kirkwood?' "'Without impertinence.' For a little time, waiting for him to conclude his vague phrase, she watched him in an expectant silence. But the man was diffident to a degree. At length, somewhat unconsciously. "'I think not,' she answered. "'No, there will be no danger awaiting me at Mrs. Hallam's. You need not fear for me any more. Thank you.' He lifted his brows at the unfamiliar name. "'Mrs. Hallam?' "'I am going to her house in Craven Street.' "'Your father is to meet you there?' persistently. "'He promised to.' "'But if he shouldn't?' "'Why?' Her eyes clouded. She pursed her lips over the conjectural annoyance. "'Why, in that event, I suppose, it would be very embarrassing. You see, I don't know Mrs. Hallam. I don't know that she expects me, unless my father is already there. They're old friends. I could drive round for a while and come back, I suppose.' but she made it plain that the prospect did not please her. "'Won't you let me ask if Mr. Callender is there, before you get out, then? I don't like to be dismissed,' he laughed. "'And, you know, you shouldn't go wandering round all alone.' The cab drew up. Kirkwood put a hand on the door and waited her will. "'It... it would be very kind. I hate to impose upon you.' He turned the knob and got out. "'If you'll wait one moment,' he said superfluously, as he closed the door. Pausing only to verify the number, he sprang up the steps and found the bell button. It was a modest little residence, in nothing more remarkable than its neighbours, unless it was for a certain air of extra grooming. The area railing was sleek with fresh black paint. The doorstep looked the better for vigorous stoning. The door itself was immaculate, its brasses shining lustrous against the red-lacquered woodwork. A soft glow filled the fanlight. Overhead, the drawing-room windows shone with a cosy, warm radiance. The door opened, framing the figure of a maid sketched broadly in masses of sombre black and dead white. "'Can you tell me, is Mr. Callender here?' The servant's eyes left his face, looked past him at the waiting cab, and returned. "'I'm not sure, sir. If you'll please step in.' Kirkwood hesitated briefly, then acceded. The maid closed the door. "'What name shall I say, sir?' "'Mr. Kirkwood.' "'If you'll please to wait one moment, sir.' He was left in the entry hall, the servant hurrying to the staircase and up. Three minutes elapsed. He was on the point of returning to the girl when the maid reappeared. "'Mrs. Hallam says, will you kindly step upstairs, sir?' Disgruntled, he followed her. At the head of the stairs she bowed him into the drawing-room, and again left him to his own resources. Nervous, annoyed, he paced the floor from wall to wall, his footfalls silenced by heavy rugs. As the delay was prolonged, he began to fume with impatience, wondering, half regretting that he had left the girl outside, definitely sorry that he had failed to name his errand more explicitly to the maid. At another time, in another mood, he might have accorded more appreciation to the charm of the apartment, which, betraying the feminine touch in every detail of arrangement and furnishing, was very handsome in an unconventional way but he was quite heedless of externals. Wearied, he deposited himself sulkily in an armchair by the hearth. From a boudoir on the same floor there came murmurs of two voices, a man's and a woman's. The latter laughed prettily. "'Oh, any time,' snorted the American. "'Any time you're through with your confounded flirtation, Mr. George B. Callender. The voices rose, approaching. "'Good night,' said the woman gaily. "'Farewell, and—' "'Good luck go with you.' "'Thank you. Good night,' replied the man more conservatively. Kirkwood rose, expectant. There was a swish of draperies, and a moment later he was acknowledging the totally unlooked-for entrance of the mistress of the house. He had thought to see Callender, presuming him to be the man closeted with Mrs. Hallam, but, whoever that had been, he did not accompany the woman. Instead, as she advanced from the doorway, Kirkwood could hear the man's footsteps on the stairs. "'This is Mr. Kirkwood?' The note of inquiry in the well-trained voice, a very alluring voice, and one pleasant to listen to, he thought, 
made it seem as though she had asked, point-blank, "'Who is Mr. Kirkwood?' He bowed, discovering himself in the presence of an extraordinarily handsome and interesting woman, a woman of years which as yet had not told upon her, of experience that had not availed to harden her, at least in so far as her exterior charm of personality was involved, a woman in brief who bore close inspection well, despite an elusive effect of maturity, not without its attraction for men. Kirkwood was impressed that it would be very easy to learn to like Mrs. Hallam more than well, with her approval. Although he had not anticipated it, he was not at all surprised to recognize in her the woman who, if he were not mistaken, had slipped the calendar that warning in the dining-room of the Pless. Kirkwood's state of mind had come to be such, through his experiences of the past few hours, that he would have accepted anything, however preposterous, as a commonplace happening. But for that matter, there was nothing particularly astonishing in this rencontre. "'I am Mrs. Hallam. You are asking for Mr. Callender?' "'He was to have been here at this hour, I believe,' said Kirkwood. "'Yes?' There was just the right inflection of surprise in a carefully controlled tone. He became aware of an undercurrent of feeling, that the woman was estimating him shrewdly with her fine direct eyes. He returned her regard with admiring interest. They were grey-green eyes, deep-set but large, a little shallow, a little changeable, calling to mind the sea on a windy, cloudy day. Below stairs a door slammed. "'I am not a detective, Mrs. Hallam,' announced the young man suddenly. "'Mr. Callender required a service of me this evening. I am here a natural consequence. If it was Mr. Callender who left this house just now, I am wasting time.' "'It was not Mr. Callender. The fine light brows arched in surprise, real or pretended, at his first blurted words, and relaxed. Amused, the woman laughed deliciously. "'But I am expecting him any moment. He must have been here half an hour since.' "'Won't you wait?' She indicated, with a gracious gesture, a chair, and took for herself one end of a Devonport. "'I'm sure he won't be long now.' "'Thank you. I will return, if I may.' Kirkwood moved toward the door. "'But there's no necessity.' She seemed insistent on detaining him, possibly because she questioned his motive, possibly for her own divertisement. Kirkwood deprecated his refusal with a smile. "'The truth is—' "'Miss Callender is waiting in a cab outside. I—' "'Dorothy Callender!' Mrs. Hallam rose alertly. "'But why should she wait there? To be sure we've never met, but I've known her father for many years.' Her eyes held steadfast to his face. Shallow, flawed by her every thought, like the sea by a cat's paw, he found them altogether inscrutable, yet received an impression that their owner was now unable to account for him. She swung about quickly, preceding him to the door and down the stairs. "'I'm sure Dorothy will come in to wait if I ask her,' she told Kirkwood in a high, sweet voice. "'I'm so anxious to know her. It's quite absurd, really, of her, to stand on ceremony with me when her father made an appointment here. I'll run out and ask.' Mrs. Hallam's slim white fingers turned latch and knob, opening the street door, and her voice died away as she stepped out into the night. For a moment, to Kirkwood, tagging after her with an uncomfortable sense of having somehow done the wrong thing, her figure, full fair shoulders and arms rising out of the glittering dinner-gown, cut a gorgeous silhouette against the darkness. Then, with a sudden imperative gesture, she half turned towards him. But, she exclaimed, perplexed, gazing to right and left, but the cab, Mr. Kirkwood. He was on the stoop a second later. Standing beside her, he stared blankly. To the left, the strand roared, the stream of its night life in high spate. On the right lay the embankment, comparatively silent and deserted, if brilliant with its high-swung lights. Between the two, quiet Craven Street ran, short and narrow, and wholly innocent of any form of equipage. End of chapter 5《チャプター six of the black bag。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。recording by william tomko。the black bag by lewis joseph vance。チャプター six。below bridge。
In silence, Mrs. Hallam turned to Kirkwood, her pose in itself a question and a peremptory one. Her eyes had narrowed. Between their lashes the green showed, a thin edge like jade, cold and calculating. The firm lines of her mouth and chin had hardened. Temporarily dumb with consternation, he returned her stare as silently. "'Well, Mr. Kirkwood?' "'Mrs. Hallam,' he stammered, "'I—' She lifted her shoulders impatiently, and with a quick movement stepped back across the threshold, where she paused, a rounded arm barring the entrance, one hand grasping the doorknob as if to shut him out at any moment. "'I'm awaiting your explanation,' she said coldly. He grinned with nervousness, striving to penetrate the mental processes of this handsome Mrs. Hallam. She seemed to regard him with a suspicion which he thought inexcusable. Did she suppose he had spirited Dorothy Callender away, and then called to apprise her of the fact? Or that he was some sort of an adventurer, who had manufactured a plausible yarn to gain him access to her home? Or, harking back to her original theory, that he was an emissary from Scotland Yard? Probably she distrusted him on the latter hypothesis. The reflection left him more at ease. "'I am quite as mystified as you, Mrs. Hallam,' he began. "'Miss Callender was here, at this door, in a four-wheeler, not ten minutes ago, and—' "'Then where is she now?' "'Tell me where Callender is,' he retorted, inspired, "'and I'll try to answer you.' But her eyes were blank. "'You mean—' That calendar was in this house when I came, that he left, found his daughter in the cab, and drove off with her. It's clear enough. You are quite mistaken, she said thoughtfully. George Callender has not been here this night. He wondered that she did not seem to resent his imputation. I think not. Listen, she cried, raising a warning hand and, relaxing her vigilant attitude, moved forward once more to peer down toward the embankment. A cab had cut in from that direction, and was bearing down upon them with a brisk rumble of hooves. As it approached, Kirkwood's heart, that had lightened, was weighed upon again by disappointment. It was no four-wheeler, but a hansom, and the open wings of the apron, disclosing a white triangle of linen surmounted by a glowing spot of fire, betraying the sex of the fair too plainly to allow a further hope that it might be the girl returning. At the door, the cab pulled up sharply, and a man tumbled hastily out upon the sidewalk. "'Here!' he cried throatily, tossing the cabby his fare, and turned toward the pair upon the doorstep evidently surmising that something was amiss, for he was calendar in proper person, and a sight to upset in a twinkling Kirkwood's ingeniously builded castle of suspicion. "'Mrs. Hallam!' he cried, out of breath. "'S my daughter here?' And then, catching sight of Kirkwood's countenance, "'Why, hello, Kirkwood!' He saluted him with a dubious air. The woman interrupted hastily. "'Please come in, Mr. Callender. This gentleman has been inquiring for you, with an astonishing tale about your daughter.' "'Dorothy!' Callender's moonlike visage was momentarily divested of any trace of color. "'What of her?' "'You had better come in,' advised Mrs. Hallam, brusquely. The fat adventurer hopped hurriedly across the threshold, Kirkwood following. The woman shut the door, and turned with back to it, nodding significantly at Kirkwood as her eyes met Callender's. "'Well, well,' snapped the latter impatiently, turning to the young man. But Kirkwood was thinking quickly. For the present, he contented himself with a deliberate statement of fact. "'Miss Callender has disappeared.' It gave him an instant's time. "'There's something damned fishy,' he told himself. These two are playing at cross-purposes. Callender's no fool. He's evidently a crook, to boot. As for the woman, she's had her eyes open for a number of years. The main thing's Dorothy. She didn't vanish of her own initiative. And Mrs. Hallam knows, or suspects, more than she's going to tell. I don't think she wants Dorothy found. Callender does. So do I. Ergo, I'm for Callender. Disappeared? Callender was barking at him. How? When? Where? Within ten minutes, said Kirkwood. Here, let's get it straight. With her permission, I brought her here in a four-wheeler. 
he was carefully suppressing all mention of Frognall Street, and in Calendar's glance read approval of the elision. She didn't want to get out unless you were here. I asked for you. The maid showed me upstairs. I left your daughter in the cab, and, by the way, I hadn't paid the driver. That's funny, too. Perhaps six or seven minutes after I came in, Mrs. Hallam found out that Miss Calendar was with me and wanted to ask her in. When we got to the door, no cab. There you have it all. Thanks. It's plenty, said Calendar dryly. He bent his head in thought for an instant, then looked up and fixed Mrs. Hallam with an unprejudiced eye. I say, he demanded explosively, there wasn't anyone here that knew, eh? Her fine eyes wavered and fell before his, and Kirkwood remarked that her underlip was curiously drawn in. I heard a man leave as Mrs. Hallam joined me, he volunteered helpfully, and with a suspicion of malice. And after that, I paid no attention at the time. It seems to me I did hear a cab in the street. Ow! interjected Calendar, eyeing the woman steadfastly and employing an exclamation of combined illumination and inquiry more typically British than anything Kirkwood had yet heard from the man. For her part, the look she gave Kirkwood was sharp with fury. It was more. It was a mistake, a flaw in her diplomacy, for Calendar intercepted it. Unceremoniously, he grasped her bare arm with his fat hand. "'Tell me who it was,' he demanded in an ugly tone. She freed herself with a twist and stepped back, a higher color in her cheeks, a flash of anger in her eyes. "'Mr. Mulready,' she retorted defiantly, "'what of that?' "'I wish I was sure,' declared the fat adventurer, exasperated. "'As it is, I bet a dollar you've put your foot in it, my lady.' I warned you of that blackguard. There, the mischief's done. We won't row over it. One moment. He begged it with a wave of his hand, stood pondering briefly, fumbled for his watch, found and consulted it. It's the barest chance, he muttered. Perhaps we can make it. What are you going to do? asked the woman. Give Mr. Mulready a run for his money. Come along, Kirkwood. We haven't a minute. Mrs. Hallam, permit us. She stepped aside, and he brushed past her to the door. "'Come, Kirkwood!' He seemed to take Kirkwood's company for granted, and the young man was not inclined to argue the point. Meekly enough, he fell in with Calendar on the sidewalk. Mrs. Hallam followed them out. "'You won't forget,' she called tentatively. "'I'll phone you if we find out anything.' Calendar jerked the words unceremoniously over his shoulder as, linking arms with Kirkwood, he drew him swiftly along. They heard her shut the door. Instantly, Calendar stopped. Look here, did Dorothy have a... a small parcel with her? She had a Gladstone bag. Oh, the devil, the devil! Calendar started on again, muttering distractedly. As they reached the corner, he disengaged his arm. We've a minute and a half to reach Charing Cross Pier and I think it's the last boat. You set the pace, will you? But remember, I'm an oldish man, and... and... fat. They began to run, the one easily, the other lumbering after like an old-fashioned square-rigged ship paced by a liner. Beneath the railway bridge, in front of the underground station, the cab rank cried them on with sardonic, view, hellos, and a bobby remarked them with suspicion turning to watch as they plunged round the corner and across the wide embankment. The Thames appeared before them, a river of ink on whose burnished surface light swam in long winding streaks and oily blobs. By the floating pier, a county council steamboat strained its hawsers, snoring huskily. Bells were jingling in her engine room as the two gained the head of the sloping gangway. Kirkwood slapped a shilling down on the ticket window ledge. Where to? he cried back to Calendar. "'Cherry Gardens Pier!' rasped the winded man. He stumbled after Kirkwood, groaning with exhaustion. Only the tolerance of the pier employees gained them their end. The steamer was held some seconds for them. As Calendar staggered to its deck, the gangway was jerked in, the last hawser cast off. The boat sheered wide out on the river, then shot in, arrow-like, to the pier beneath Waterloo Bridge. The deck was crowded, and additional passengers embarked at every stop. 
In the circumstances conversation, save on the most impersonal topics, was impossible, and, even had it been necessary or advisable to discuss the affair which occupied their minds, where so many ears could hear, Calendar had breath enough neither to answer nor to catechize Kirkwood. They found seats on the forward deck and rested there in grim silence, both fretting under the enforced restraint, while the boat darted like some illuminated and exceptionally active water insect from pier to pier. As it snorted beneath London Bridge, Calendar's impatience drove him from his seat back to the gangway. "'Next stop,' he told Kirkwood curtly, and rested his heavy bulk against the paddle-box, brooding morosely, until, after an uninterrupted run of more than a mile, the steamer swept in, side-wheels backing water furiously against the ebbing tide, to Cherry Garden's landing. Sweet name for a locality unsavory beyond credence. As they emerged on the street level and turned west on Bermondsey Wall, Kirkwood was fain to tug his topcoat over his chest and button it tight, to hide his linen. In a guarded tone he counseled his companion to do likewise, and Calendar, after a moment's blank, uncomprehending stare, acknowledged the wisdom of the advice with a grunt. The very air they breathed was rank with fetid odors bred of the gaunt dark warehouses that lined their way. The lights were few. Beneath the looming buildings the shadows were many and dense. Here and there dreary and cheerless public-houses appeared, with lighted windows conspicuous in the lightless waste. From time to time, as they hurried on, they encountered and made wide detours to escape contact with knots of wayfarers, men debased and begrimed, with dreary and slatternly women, arm in arm, zigzagging widely across the sidewalks, chorusing with sodden voices the burden of some popularized ballad. The cheapened sentimental refrains echoed sadly between benighted walls. Kirkwood shuddered, sticking close to Calendar's side. Life's naked brutalities had theretofore been largely out of his ken. He had heard of slums, had even ventured to mouth politely moral platitudes on the subject of overcrowding in great centers of population, but in the darkest flights of imagination had never pictured to himself anything so unspeakably foul and hopeless as this, and they were come hither seeking Dorothy Calendar. He was unable to conceive what manner of villainy could be directed against her, that she must be looked for in such surroundings. After some ten minutes' steady walking, Calendar turned aside with a muttered word and dived down a covered, dark and evil-smelling passageway that seemed to lead toward the river. Mastering his involuntary qualms, Kirkwood followed. Some ten or twelve paces from its entrance, the passageway swerved at a right angle, continuing three yards or so to end in a blank wall, wherefrom a flickering, inadequate gas-lamp jutted. At this point, a stone platform, perhaps four feet square, was discovered, from the edge of which a flight of worn and slimy stone steps led down to a permanent boat landing, where another gaslight flared gustily, despite the protection of its frame of begrimed glass. "'Good Lord!' exclaimed the young man. "'What in heaven's name, Calendar?' "'Bermondsey, old stairs. Come on!' They descended to the landing stage. Beneath them the pool slept, a sheet of polished ebony, whispering to itself, lapping with small stealthy gurgles angles of masonry and ancient piles. On the farther bank tall warehouses reared square old-time heads, their uncompromising rugged profile relieved here and there by tapering mastheads. A few, scattering, feeble lights were visible. Nothing moved save the river and the wind. The landing itself they found quite deserted, something which the adventurer comprehended with a nod, which, like its accompanying inarticulate ejaculation, might have been taken to indicate either satisfaction or disgust. He ignored Kirkwood altogether, for the time being, and presently produced a small, bright object which, applied to his lips, proved to be a boatswain's whistle. He sounded two blasts, one long, one brief. There fell a lull. Kirkwood watching the other, and wondering what next would happen. 
Calendar paced restlessly to and fro upon the narrow landing, now stopping to incline an ear to catch some anticipated sound, now searching, with sweeping glances, the black reaches of the pool. Finally, consulting his watch, almost ten, he announced. We're in time? Can't say. Damn! If that infernal boat would only show up, he was lifting the whistle to sound a second summons when a rowboat rounded a projecting angle formed by the next warehouse downstream, and with clanking oarlocks swung in toward the landing. On her thwarts, two figures, dipping and rising, labored with the sweeps. As they drew in, one man forward shipped his blades and, rising, scrambled to the bows in order to grasp an iron mooring ring set in the wall. The other awkwardly took in his oars, and, as the current swung the stern downstream, placed a hand palm downward upon the bottom step to hold the boat steady. Calendar waddled to the brink of the stage, grunting with relief. "'The other man?' he asked brusquely. "'Has he gone aboard, or is this the first trip to-night?' One of the watermen nodded assent to the latter question, adding gruffly, "'Seen nothing of him, sir?' "'Very good,' said Calendar, as if he doubted whether it were very good or bad. "'We'll wait a bit.' "'Right oh agreed the waterman civilly. Calendar turned back, his small eyes glimmering with satisfaction. Fumbling in one coat pocket, he brought to light a cigar case. "'Have a smoke?' he suggested with a show of friendliness. "'By heaven, I was beginning to get worried.' "'As to what?' inquired Kirkwood pointedly. "'selecting a cigar. "'He got no immediate reply, "'but felt Calendar's sharp eyes upon him "'while he maneuvered with matches for a light. "'That's so,' it came at length. "'You don't know. "'I kind of forgot for a minute. "'Somehow you seemed on the inside.' "'Kirkwood laughed lightly. "'I've experienced something of the same sensation "'in the past few hours. "'Don't doubt it.' "'Calendar was watching him narrowly. "'I suppose.' He put it to him abruptly. You haven't changed your mind. Changed my mind? About coming in with me. My dear sir, I can have no mind to change until a plain proposition is laid before me. Hmm. Calendar puffed vigorously until it occurred to him to change the subject. You won't mind telling me what happened to you and Dorothy? Certainly not. Calendar drew nearer, and Kirkwood lowering his voice, narrated briefly the events since he had left the Pless in Dorothy's company. Her father followed him intently, interrupting now and again with exclamation or pertinent question, as, had Kirkwood been able to see the face of the man in Number 9 Frognall Street, the negative answer seemed to disconcert him. Youngster, you say? Blam, if I can lay my mind to him. Now, if that Mulready... It would have been impossible for Mulready whoever he is, to recover and get to Craven Street before we did, Kirkwood pointed out. Well, go on. But when the tale was told, It's that scoundrel Mulready, the man affirmed with heat. It's his hand. I know him. I might have had sense enough to see he'd taken the first chance to hand me the double cross. Well, this does for him all right. Calendar lowered viciously at the river. You've been blame useful he told Kirkwood assertively. If it hadn't been for you, I don't know where I'd be now. Nor Dorothy, either. An obvious afterthought. There's no particular way I can show my appreciation. I suppose. Money? I've got enough to last me till I reach New York. Thank you. Well, if the time ever comes, just shout for George B. I won't be wanting. I only wish you were with us. But that's out of the question. Doubtless. No two ways about it. I bet anything you've got a conscience concealed about your person. What? You're an honest man, eh? I don't want to sound immodest, returned Kirkwood, amused. You don't need to worry about that. But an honest man's got no business in my line. He glanced again at his watch. Damn that Mulready. I wonder if he was cute enough to take another way. Or did he think... The fool... He cut off abruptly, seeming depressed by the thought that he might have been outwitted, and, clasping hands behind his back, chewed savagely on his cigar, watching the river. Kirkwood found himself somewhat wearied. 
the uselessness of his presence there struck him with added force he bethought him of his boat train scheduled to leave a station miles distant in an hour and a half if he missed it he would be stranded in a foreign land penniless and practically without friends brentwick being away and all the rest of his circle of acquaintances on the other side of the channel yet he lingered in poor company daring fate that he might see the end of the affair why there was only one honest answer to that question he stayed on because of his interest in a girl whom he had known for a matter of three hours at most it was insensate folly on his part ridiculous from any point of view but he made no move to go the slow minutes lengthened monotonously there came a sound from the street level calendar held up a hand of warning here they come steady he said tensely kirkwood listening intently interpreted the noise as a clash of hoofs upon cobbles calendar turned to the boat sheer off he ordered drop out of sight i'll whistle when i want you aye aye sir the boat slipped noiselessly away with the current and in an instant was lost to sight calendar plucked at kirkwood's sleeve drawing him into the shadow of the steps e easy he whispered and i say lend me a hand will you if mulready turns ugly oh yes asserted kirkwood with a nonchalance not entirely unassumed the racket drew nearer and ceased the hush that fell thereafter seemed only accentuated by the purling of the river it was ended by footsteps echoing in the covered passageway calendar craned his thick neck round the shoulder of stone reconnoitering the landing and stairway thank god he said under his breath i was right after all a man's deep tones broke out above this way mind the steps they're a bit slippery miss dorothy but my father came the girl's voice attuned to doubt oh he'll be along if he isn't waiting now in the boat they descended the man leading at the foot without a glance to the right or left he advanced to the edge of the stage leaning out over the rail as if endeavoring to locate the rowboat at once the girl appeared moving to his side but mr mulready the girl's words were drowned by a prolonged blast on the boatswain's whistle at her companion's lips the shorter one followed in due course calendar edged forward from kirkwood's side but what shall we do if my father isn't here wait no best not to best to get on the alethea as soon as possible miss calendar we can send the boat back once aboard the lugger the girl is mine eh mulready to say nothing of the loot if calendar's words were jocular his tone conveyed a different impression entirely both man and girl wheeled right about to face him, the one with a strangled oath, the other with a low cry. "'The devil!' exclaimed this Mr. Mulready. "'Oh, my father!' the girl voiced her recognition of him. "'Not precisely one and the same person,' commented Calendar suavely. "'But, uh, thanks just as much. "'You see, Mulready, when I make an appointment, I keep it.' "'We've begun to get a bit anxious about you.' mulready began defensively so i surmised from what mrs hallam and mr kirkwood told me well the man found no ready answer he fell back a pace to the railing his features working with his deep chagrin the murky flare of the gas lamp overhead fell across a face handsome beyond the ordinary but marred by a sullen humor and seamed with indulgence a face that seemed hauntingly familiar until kirkwood in a flash of visual memory reconstructed the portrait of a man who lingered over a dining table with two empty chairs for company this then was he whom mrs hallam had left at the pless a tall strong man very heavy about the chest and shoulders why my dear friend calendar was taunting him you don't seem overjoyed to see me for all your wild anxiety Upon my word, you act as if you hadn't expected me, and our engagement so clearly understood at that. Why, you fool! Here the mask of irony was cast. Did you think for a moment I let myself be nabbed by that yap from Scotland Yard? Were you banking on that? 
I give you my faith I ambled out under his very nose. Dorothy, my dear, turning impatiently from Mulready, where's that bag? The girl withdrew a puzzled gaze from Mulready's face. It was apparent to Kirkwood that this phase of the affair was no more enigmatic to him than to her, and drew aside a corner of her cloak, disclosing the gladstone bag securely grasped in one gloved hand. "'I have it, thanks to Mr. Kirkwood,' she said quietly. Kirkwood chose that moment to advance from the shadow. Mulready started and fixed him with a troubled and unfriendly stare. The girl greeted him with a note of sincere pleasure in her surprise. "'Why, Mr. Kirkwood! But I left you at Mrs. Hallam's!' Kirkwood bowed, smiled openly at Mulready's discomfiture. "'By your father's grace, I came with him,' he said. "'You ran away without saying good-night, you know, and I'm a jealous creditor.' She laughed excitedly, turning to Calendar. "'But you were to meet me at Mrs. Hallam's!' Mulready was good enough to try to save me the trouble, my dear. He's an unselfish soul, Mulready. Fortunately, it happened that I came along not five minutes after he carried you off. How was that, Dorothy? Her glance wavered uneasily between the two, Mulready and her father. The former, shrugging to declare his indifference, turned his back squarely upon them. She frowned. He came out of Mrs. Hallam's and got into the four-wheeler, saying you had sent him to take your place, and would join us on the Alethea. So, how about it, Mulready? The man swung back slowly. What you choose to think, he said, after a deliberate pause. Well, never mind. We'll go over the matter at our leisure on the Alethea. There was in the adventurous tone a menace bitter and not to be ignored, which Mulready saw fit to challenge. "'I think not,' he declared. "'I think not. I'm weary of your addle-pated suspicions. It would be plain to anyone but a fool that I acted for the best interests of all concerned in this matter. If you're not content to see it in that light, I'm done.' "'Oh, if you want to put it that way, I'm not content, Mr. Mulready.' retorted Calendar dangerously. "'Please yourself. I bid you good evening and good-bye.' The man took a step toward the stairs. Calendar dropped his right hand into his top coat pocket. "'Just a minute,' he said sweetly, and Mulready stopped. Abruptly, the fat adventurer's smoldering resentment leaped in flame. "'That'll be about all, Mr. Mulready. Bout face, you hound, and get into that boat.' "'Do you think I'll temporize with you till doomsday? "'Then forget it. "'You're wrong. "'Dead wrong. "'Your bluff's called, and, with an evil chuckle, "'I hold a full house, Mulready. "'Every chamber taken.' "'He lifted meaningly the hand in the coat pocket. "'Now, in with you.' "'With a grin and a swagger of pure bravado, "'Mulready turned and obeyed. Unnoticed of any, save perhaps Calendar himself, the boat had drawn in at the stage a moment earlier. Mulready dropped into it and threw himself sullenly upon the midship's thwart. "'Now, Dorothy, in you go, my dear,' continued Calendar, with a self-satisfied wag of his head. Half-dazed, to all seeming, she moved toward the boat. With clumsy and assertive gallantry, her father stepped before her, offering his hand his hand which she did not touch, for in the act of descending she remembered and swung impulsively back to Kirkwood. "'Good night, Mr. Kirkwood. Good night. I shan't forget.' He took her hand and bowed above it, but when his head was lifted he still retained her fingers in a lingering clasp. "'Good night,' he said reluctantly. The crass incongruity of her in that setting smote him with renewed force. Young, beautiful, dainty, brilliant, and graceful, in her pretty evening gown, she figured strangely against the gloomy background of the river, in those dull and mean surroundings of dank stone and rusted iron. She was like, he thought extravagantly, a whiff of flower fragrance lost in the miasmatic vapors of a slough. The innocent appeal and allure of her face, upturned to his beneath the gas light, wrought compassionately upon his sensitive and generous heart. 
he was aware of a little surge of blind rage against the conditions that had brought her to that spot, and against those whom he held responsible for those conditions. In a sudden flush of daring, he turned and nodded coolly to Calendar. "'With your permission,' he said negligently, and drew the girl aside to the angle of the stairway. "'Miss Calendar,' he began, but was interrupted. "'Here, I say!' Calendar had started toward him, angrily. Kirkwood calmly waved him back. "'I want a word in private with your daughter, Mr. Calendar,' he announced with quiet dignity. "'I don't think you'll deny me. I'd saved you some slight trouble tonight.' Disgruntled, the adventurer paused. "'Oh, all right,' he grumbled. "'I don't see what—' he returned to the boat. "'Forgive me, Miss Calendar,' continued Kirkwood nervously. "'I know I've no right to interfere, but—' "'Yes, Mr. Kirkwood?' "'But hasn't this gone far enough?' he floundered unhappily. "'I can't like the look of things. "'Are you sure, sure that it's all right? "'With you, I mean?' She did not answer at once, but her eyes were kind and sympathetic. He plucked heart of their tolerance. "'It isn't too late yet,' he argued. "'Let me take you to your friends. "'You must have friends in the city.' But this, this midnight flight down the Thames, this atmosphere of stealth and suspicion, this— But my place is with my father, Mr. Kirkwood, she interposed. I dared doubt him, dare I? I suppose not. So I must go with him. I'm glad. Thank you for caring, dear Mr. Kirkwood. And again, good night. Good luck attend you, he muttered, following her to the boat. Calendar helped her in, and turned back to Kirkwood with a look of arch triumph. Kirkwood wondered if he had overheard. Whether or no, he could afford to be magnanimous. Seizing Kirkwood's hand, he pumped it vigorously. "'My dear boy, you've been an angel in disguise, and I guess you think me the devil in masquerade.' He chuckled, in high conceit with himself over the turn of affairs. "'Good night, and—and fare thee well.' He dropped into the boat, seating himself to face the recalcitrant Mulready. "'Cast off there!' The boat dropped away, the oars lifting and falling. With a weariful sense of loneliness and disappointment, Kirkwood hung over the rail to watch them out of sight. A dozen feet of water lay between the stage and the boat. The girl's dress remained a spot of cheerful color. Her face was a blur. As the watermen swung the bows downstream, she looked back lifting an arm spectral in its white sheath. Kirkwood raised his hat. The boat gathered impetus, momentarily diminishing in the night's illusory perspective. Presently it was little more than a fugitive blot, gliding swiftly in midstream. And then it was gone entirely, engulfed by the obliterating darkness. Somewhat wearily the young man released the railing and ascended the stairs. And that is the end, he told himself struggling with an acute sense of personal injury. He had been hardly used. For a few hours his life had been lightened by the ineffable glamour of romance. Mystery and adventure had engaged him. Exorcising for the time the shade of care, he had served a fair woman and been associated with men whose ways, however questionable, were the ways of courage, hedged thickly about with perils. All that was at an end. Prosaic and workaday tomorrows confronted him in endless and dreary perspective, and he felt again upon his shoulder the bony hand of his familiar. Care. He sighed. Ah, well. Disconsolate and aggrieved, he gained the street. He was miles from St. Pancras, foot-weary, to all intents and purposes, lost. In this extremity, chance smiled upon him. The cabby, who, at his initial instance, had traveled this weary way from Quadrant Mews, after the manner of his kind, ere turned back, had sought surcease of fatigue at the nearest public. From afar Kirkwood saw the four-wheeler at the curb, and made all haste toward it. Entering the gin-mill, he found the cabby, soothed him with bitter, and, instructing him for St. Pancras with all speed, dropped, limp and listless with fatigue, into the conveyance. As it moved, he closed his eyes. The face of Dorothy Callender shone out from the blank wall of his consciousness, like an illuminated picture, 
cast upon a screen. She smiled upon him, her head high, her eyes tender and trustful, and he thought that her scarlet lips were sweet with promise and her glance abrim with such a light as he had never dreamed to know. And now that he knew it and desired it, it was too late. An hour gone he might, by a nod of his head, have cast his fortunes with hers for weal or woe. But now, alas and alack a day, that romance was no more. End of chapter 6 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 7 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 7 Diversions of a Ruined Gentleman. Resumed. From the commanding elevation of the box, Three and six, enunciated the cabby, his tone that of a man prepared for trouble, acquainted with trouble, inclined to give trouble a welcome. His bloodshot eyes blinked truculently at his alighted fare. Three and six, he iterated aggressively. An adjacent but theretofore abstracted policeman pricked up his ears and assumed an intelligent expression. Bermondsey old stairs to St. Pancras, argued the cabby assertively, seven miles by the radius, three and six. Kirkwood stood on the outer station platform near the entrance to third-class waiting rooms. Continuing to fumble through his pockets for an elusive sovereign purse, he looked up mildly at the man. All right, cabby, he said with pacific purpose. You'll get your fare in half a shake. Three and six, croaked the cabby like a blousy and vindictive parrot. The bobby strolled nearer. Yes, said Kirkwood, mildly diverted. Why not sing it, cabby? Lor loom, the cabby exploded with indignation, continuing to give a lifelike imitation of a rumpled parrot. I had trouble enough with you at Bermondsey Old Stairs. Hover that quid you promised, didn't I? Sing it? My high! Quid, cabby? And then, remembering that he had promised the fellow a sovereign for fast driving from Quadrant Mews, Kirkwood grinned broadly, eyes twinkling, for Mulready must have fallen heir to that covenant. But you got the sovereign. You got it, didn't you, cabby? The driver affirmed the fact with unnecessary heat and profanity, and an amendment to the effect that he would have spoiled his fare's sanguinary conch had the outcome been less satisfactory. The information proved so amusing that Kirkwood, chuckling, forbore to resent the manner of its delivery, and, abandoning until a more favorable time the chase of the coy sovereign purse, extracted from one trouser pocket half a handful of large English small change. Three shillings, sixpence, he counted the coins into the cabby's grimy and bloated paw, and added quietly, The exact distance is rather less than four miles, my man. Your fare, precisely, two shillings. You may keep the extra eighteen pence for being such a conscientious blackguard, or talk it over with the officer here. Please yourself. He nodded to the bobby, who, favorably impressed by the silk hat which Kirkwood, by diligent application of his sleeve during the cross-town ride, had managed to restore to a state somewhat approximating its erstwhile luster, smiled at the cabby, a cold, hard smile, whereupon the latter, smirking in unabashed triumph, spat on the pavement at Kirkwood's feet, gathered up the reins, and wheeled out. A hard lot, sir, commented the policeman, jerking his helmeted head towards the vanishing four-wheeler. Right you are, agreed Kirkwood, amiably, still tickled by the knowledge that Mulready had been obliged to pay three times over for the ride that ended in his utter discomfiture. Somehow, Kirkwood had conceived no liking whatever for the man. Calendar he could, at a pinch, tolerate for his sense of humor, but Mulready? A surly dog, he thought him. 
Acknowledging the policeman's salute and restoring two shillings and a few fat copper pennies to his pocket, he entered the vast and echoing train shed. In the act, his attention was attracted and immediately riveted by the spectacle of a burly luggage navy in a blue jumper in the act of making off with a large, folding signboard of which the surface was lettered expansively with the advice, in red against a white background, Boat train leaves on track three. Incredulous, yet aghast, the young man gave instant chase to the navy, overhauling him with no great difficulty. For your horny-handed British working man is apparently born with two golden aphorisms in his mouth. Look before you leap, and haste makes waste. He looks continually, seldom if ever leaps, and never is prodigal of his leisure. Excitedly, Kirkwood touched the man's arm with a detaining hand. "'Boat train?' he gasped, pointing at the board. "'Left ten minutes ago. Thank you, sir.' "'Well, but of course I can get another train at Tilbury.' "'For your boat?' "'No, sir. Thank you, sir. Won't be another train till morning, sir.' "'Oh!' Aimlessly, Kirkwood drifted away, his mind a blank. Some time later he found himself on the steps outside the station, trying to stare out of countenance a glaring electric mineral water advertisement on the farther side of the Euston Road. He was stranded. Beyond the spiked iron fence that enhedges the incurving drive, the roar of traffic, human, wheel and hoof, rose high for all the lateness of the hour, sidewalks groaning with the restless contact of hundreds of ill-shod feet the roadway thundering hansoms four-wheelers motor-cars dwarfed costermongers donkey carts and ponderous rumbling c p motor vans struggling for place and progress for st pancras never sleeps the misty air swam luminous with the light of electric signs as with the radiance of some lurid and sinister moon the voice of London sounded in Kirkwood's ears like the ominous purring of a somnolent brute beast, resting, gorged, and satiated, ere rising again to devour. To devour! Stranded. Distracted, he searched pocket after pocket, locating his watch, cigar, and cigarette cases, matchbox, penknife, all the minutiae of pocket hardware affected by civilized man with old letters, a card case, a square envelope containing his steamer ticket, but no sovereign purse. His small change pocket held less than three shillings, two and eight to be exact, and a brass key which he failed to recognize as one of his belongings. And that was all. At some time during the night he had lost, or been cunningly bereft of, that little purse of chamois skin containing the three golden sovereigns which he had been husbanding to pay his steamer expenses, and which, if only he had them now, would stand between him and starvation and a night in the streets. And, searching his heart, he found it brimming with gratitude to Mulready, for having relieved him of the necessity of settling with the cabby. "'Vagabond,' said Kirkwood musingly, "'Vagabond?' He repeated the word softly a number of times to get the exact flavor of it, and found it little to his taste. And yet... He thrust both hands deep in his trouser pockets and stared purposelessly into space, twisting his eyebrows out of alignment and crookedly protruding his lower lip. If Brentwick were only in town, but he wasn't, and wouldn't be within the week. No good waiting here, he concluded. Composing his face, he re-entered the station. There were his trunks, of course. He couldn't leave them standing on the station platform forever. He found the luggage room and interviewed a mechanically courteous attendant, who, as the result of profound deliberation, advised him to try his luck at the lost luggage room across the station. He accepted the advice. It was a foregone conclusion that his effects had not been conveyed to the Tilbury dock. They could not have been loaded into the luggage van without his personal supervision. Still, anything was liable to happen when his unlucky star was in the ascendant. He found them in the lost luggage room. A clerk helped him identify the articles, and ultimately clucked with a perfunctory note, Sixpence each, please. I, uh, 
pardon? Sixpence each for fixed charge, sir. For every twenty-four hours or fraction thereof, sixpence per parcel. Oh, thank you so much, said Kirkwood sweetly. I will call to-morrow. Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Five times sixpence is two and six, Kirkwood computed, making his way hastily out of the station, lest a worse thing befall him. No, bless your heart, not while two and eight represents the sum total of my fortune. He wandered out into the night. He could not linger round the station till dawn, and what profit to him if he did? Even were he to ransom his trunks, one can scarcely change one's clothing in a public waiting-room. Somewhere in the distance a great clock chimed a single stroke, freighted sore with melancholy. It knelled the passing of the half-hour after midnight, a witching hour, when every public shuts up tight, and gentlemen in top-hats and evening-dress are doomed to pace the pave till day, barring they have homes or visible means of support, till day, when pawn-shops open, and such personal effects as watches and hammered silver cigar-cases may be hypothecated. Sable garments fluttering, care fell into step with Philip Kirkwood. Care, the inexorable, slipped a skeleton arm through his, and would not be denied. Care, the jade clung affectionately to his side, refusing to be jilted. Ah, you thought you would forget me, chuckled the fleshless lips by his ear. But no, my boy, I'm with you now, for ever and a day. Misery loves company, and it wouldn't be pretty of me to desert you in this extremity, would it? Come, let us beguile the hours till dawn with conversation. Here's a sprightly subject. What are you going to do, Mr. Kirkwood? What are you going to do? But Kirkwood merely shook a stubborn head and gazed straight before him, walking fast through ways he did not recognize and pretending not to hear. Nonetheless the sense of care's solicitous query struck like a pain into his consciousness. What was he to do? An hour passed. Denied the opportunity to satisfy its beast hunger and thirst, humanity goes off to its beds. In that hour, London quieted wonderfully. The streets achieved an effect of deeper darkness. The skies, lowering, looked down with a blush less vivid for the shamelessness of man. Cab ranks lengthened. Solitary footsteps added unto themselves loud, alarming, offensive echoes. Policemen, strolling with lamps blazing on their breasts, became as lightships in a trackless sea. Each new-found street unfolded its perspective like a canyon of mystery, and yet teeming with a hundred masked hazards. The air acquired a smell more clear and clean, an effect more volatile, and the night mist thickened until it studded one's attire with myriads of tiny buttons, bright as diamond dust. Through this long hour, Kirkwood walked without a pause. Another clock somewhere clanged resonantly twice. The world was very still. And so, wandering footloose in a wilderness of ways, turning aimlessly, now right, now left, he found himself in a street he knew, yet seemed not to know. A silent black street, one brief block in length, walled with dead and lightless dwellings, haunted by his errant memory a street whose atmosphere was heavy with impalpable essence of desuetude. In two words, Frognall Street. Kirkwood identified it with a start and a guilty tremor. He stopped stock still in an unreasoning state of semi-panic, arrested by a silly impulse to turn and fly, as if the bobby, whom he decried approaching him with measured stride, pausing now and again to try a door or flash his bull's eye down an area, were to be expected to identify the man responsible for that damnable racket raised ere midnight in vacant number nine. Oddly enough, the shock of recognition brought him to his senses, temporarily. He was even able to indulge himself in a quiet, sobering grin at his own folly. He passed the policeman with a nod and a cool word in response to the man's good-natured, Good night, sir. Number nine was on the other side of the street, and he favored its blank and dreary elevation with a prolonged and frank stare. That profited him nothing, by the way. 
for a crazy notion popped incontinently into his head and would not be cast forth. At the corner he swerved and crossed, still possessed of his devil of inspiration. It would be unfair to him to say that he did not struggle to resist it, for he did, because it was fairly and egregiously asinine, yet, struggling, his feet trod the path to which it tempted him. Why, he expostulated feebly, I might's well turn back and beat that bobby over the head with my cane. But at the moment his hand was in his change pocket, feeling over that same brass door key which earlier he had been unable to account for and he was informing himself how very easy it would have been for the sovereign purse to have dropped from his waistcoat pocket while he was sliding on his ear down the dark staircase. To recover it meant, at the least, shelter for the night, followed by a decent, comfortable, and sustaining morning meal. Fortified by both, he could redeem his luggage, change to clothing more suitable for daylight traveling, pawn his valuables, and enter into negotiations with the steamship company for permission to exchange his passage, with a sum to boot, for transportation on another liner. A most feasible project, a temptation all but irresistible. But then the risk. Supposing, for the sake of argument, the customary night watchman to have taken up a transient residence in number nine, supposing the police to have entered with him and found the stunned man on the second floor, would the watchman not be vigilant for another nocturnal marauder? Would not the police now, more than ever, be keeping a wary eye on that house of suspicious happenings? Decidedly, to re-enter it would be to incur a deadly risk and yet undoubtedly, beyond question, his sovereign purse was waiting for him somewhere on the second flight of stairs. While, as his means of clandestine entry lay warm in his fingers, the key to the dark entry, which he had by force of habit pocketed after locking the door. He came to the hog in the pound. Its windows were dim with low-turned gaslights. Down the covered alleyway, Quadrant Muse slept in a dusk but fitfully relieved by a lamp or two round which the friendly mist clung close and thick. There would be none to see. Skulking, throat swollen with fear, heart beating like a snare drum, Kirkwood took his chance. Buttoning his overcoat collar up to his chin, and cursing the fact that his hat must stand out like a chimney-pot on a detached house, he sped on tiptoe down the cobbled way and close beneath the house walls of Quadrant Mews. But, halfway in, he stopped, confounded by an unforeseen difficulty. How was he to identify the narrow entry of number nine, whose counterparts doubtless communicated with the mews from every residence on four sides of the city block? The low inner tenements were yet high enough to hide the rear elevations of Frognall Street houses, and the mist was heavy besides. Otherwise, he had made shift to locate number nine by taking off the dwellings from the corner. If he went on, hit or miss, the odds were anything you please to one that he would blunder into the servants' quarters of some inhabited house, and he promptly and righteously sat upon the service staff while the bobby was summoned. Be that as it might, he almost lost his head when he realized this. Escape was already cut off by the way he had come. Some one, or rather some two men, were entering the alley. He could hear the tramping and shuffle of clumsy feet, and voices that muttered indistinctly. One seemed to trip over something and cursed. The other laughed. The voices grew more loud. They were coming his way. He dared no longer vacillate. But which passage should he choose? He moved on with more haste than discretion. One heel slipped on a cobbled time-worn to glassy smoothness. He lurched, caught himself up in time to save a fall, lost his hat, recovered it, and was discovered. A voice, maudlin with drink, hailed and called upon him to stand and give an account of himself. Like a goo-feller! Another tempted him with offers of drink and sociable confabulation. He yielded not. Adamantine to the seductive lure, he picked up his heels and ran. Those behind him, remarking with resentment the amazing fact that an intimate of the muse should run away from liquor, cursed and made after him, veering, staggering, howling like ravening animals. 
for all their burden of intoxication, they knew the ground by instinct and from long association. They gained on him. Across the way, a window sash went up with a bang, and a woman screamed. Through the only other entrance to the mews, a belated cab was homing. Its driver, getting wind of the unusual, pulled up, blocking the way, and added his advice to the uproar. Caught thus between two fires, and with his persecutors hard upon him, Kirkwood dived into the nearest black hole of a passageway, and in sheer desperation flung himself, key in hand, against the door at the end. Mark how his luck served him who had forsworn her. He found a keyhole and inserted the key. It turned. So did the knob. The door gave inward. He fell in with it, slammed it, shot the bolts, and, panting, leaned against its panels in a pit of everlasting night, but saved, for the time being, at all events. Outside, someone brushed against one wall, cannoned to the other, brought up with a crash against the door, and, perforce at a standstill, swore from his heart. "'Gar blimey!' he declared feelingly. "'I'd a took my oath I saw him run in air." And then, in answer to an inaudible question, "'No, he ain't!' Going to let the fool go to L. Who wants him to share goo liquor? Not I. Joining his companion, he departed, leaving behind him a trail of sulphur tainted air. The muse quieted gradually. Indoors, Kirkwood faced unhappily the enigma of fortuity, wondering was this by any possibility number nine? The key had fitted. The bolts had been drawn on the inside, and while the key had been one of ordinary pattern, and would no doubt have proven effectual with any of a hundred common locks, the finger of probability seemed to indicate that his luck had brought him back to number nine. In spite of all this, he was sensible of little confidence. Though this were truly number nine, his freedom still lay on the knees of the gods. His very life belike, was poised, tottering on a pinnacle of chance. In the end, taking heart of desperation, he stooped and removed his shoes, a precaution which later appealed to his sense of the ridiculous in view of the racket he had raised in entering, but which, at the moment, seemed most natural and in accordance with common sense. Then, rising, he held his breath, staring and listening. About him the pitch darkness was punctuated with fading points of fire, and in his ears was a noise of strange whisperings, very creepy, until, gritting his teeth, he controlled his nerves and gradually realized that he was alone, the silence undisturbed. He went forward gingerly, feeling his way like a blind man on strange ground. Ere long he stumbled over a door sill and found that the walls of the passage had fallen away. He had entered a room, a black cavern of indeterminate dimensions. Across this he struck at random, walked himself flat against a wall, felt his way along to an open door, and passed through to another apartment as dark as the first. Here, endeavoring to make a circuit of the walls, he succeeded in throwing himself bodily across a bed, which creaked horribly, and for a full minute lay as he had fallen, scarce daring to think. But nothing followed, and he got up and found a shut door which led him into yet a third room, wherein he barked both shins on a chair, and escaped to a fourth whose atmosphere was highly flavored with reluctant odors of bygone cookery, stale water and damp plumbing, probably the kitchen. Thence, progressing over complaining floors, through what may have been the servant's hall, a large room with a table in the middle and a number of promiscuous chairs, witness his tortured shins, he finally blundered into the basement hallway. By now, a little calmer, he felt assured that this was really number 9 Frognall Street, and a little happier about it all, though not even momentarily forgetful of the potential police and night watchmen. However, he mounted the steps to the ground floor without adventure, and found himself at last in the same dim and ghostly hall which he had entered some six hours before. The mockery of dusk admitted by the fanlight was just strong enough to enable him to identify the general lay of the land and arrangement of furniture. More confidently with each uncontested step, he continued his quest. 
Elation was stirring his spirit when he gained the first floor and moved toward the foot of the second flight, approaching the spot whereat he was to begin the search for the missing purse. The knowledge that he lacked means of obtaining illumination deterred him nothing. He had some hope of finding matches in one of the adjacent rooms, but, failing that, was prepared to ascend the stairs on all fours, feeling every inch of their surface, if it took hours. Ever an optimistic soul, instinctively inclined to father faith and a hope, he felt supremely confident that his search would not prove fruitless, that he would win early release from his temporary straits. And thus it fell out that, at the instant he was thinking it time to begin to crawl and hunt, his stockinged feet came into contact with something heavy, yielding, warm, something that moved, moaned, and caused his hair to bristle and his flesh to creep. We will make allowances for him. All along he had gone on the assumption that his antagonist of the dark stairway would have recovered and made off with all expedition in the course of ten or twenty minutes at most from the time of his accident. To find him still there was something entirely outside of Kirkwood's reckoning. He would as soon have thought to encounter, say, Calendar, would have preferred the latter, indeed. But this fellow, whose disability was due to his own interference, who was reasonably to be counted upon to raise the very deuce and all of a row. The initial shock, however, shattering to his equanimity, soon lost effect. The man evidently remained unconscious, in fact, had barely moved, while the moan that Kirkwood heard had been distressingly faint. "'Poor devil,' murmured the young man. "'He must be in a pretty bad way, for sure.' He knelt, compassion gentling his heart, and put one hand to the insentient face. A warm sweat moistened his fingers. His palm was fanned by steady respiration." Immeasurably perplexed, the American rose, slipped on his shoes, and buttoned them, thinking hard the while. What ought he to do? Obviously, flight suggested itself. Incontinent flight, anticipating the man's recovery. On the other hand, indubitably the latter had sustained such injury that consciousness, when it came to him, would hardly be reinforced by much aggressive power. Moreover, it was to be remembered that the one was in that house with quite as much warrant as the other, unless Kirkwood had drawn a rash inference from the incident of the ragged sentry. The two of them were mutual, if antagonistic, trespassers. Neither would dare bring about the arrest of the other. And then, and this was not the least consideration to influence Kirkwood, perhaps the fellow would die if he got no attention. Kirkwood shut his teeth grimly. I'm no assassin, he informed himself, to strike and run. If I've maimed this poor devil, and there are consequences, I'll stand him. The Lord knows it doesn't matter a damn to anybody, not even to me, what happens to me, while he may be valuable. Light upon the subject, actual as well as figurative, seemed to be the first essential. His mind composed, Kirkwood set himself in search of it. The floor he was on, however, afforded him no assistance. The mantels were guiltless of candles, and he discovered no matches, either in the wide and silent drawing-room, with its ghastly furniture, like mummies in their linen swathings, or in the small boudoir at the back. He was to look either above or below, it seemed. After some momentary hesitation, he went upstairs, his ascent marked by a single and grateful accident. Halfway to the top, he trod on an object that clinked underfoot, and, stooping, retrieved the lost purse. Thus was he justified of his temerity. The day was saved. That is, tomorrow was. The rooms of the second floor were bedchambers, broad, deep, stately, inhabited by seven devils of loneliness. In one, on a dresser, Kirkwood found a stump of candle in a china candlestick. The two charred ends of matches at its base were only an irritating discovery, however, evidence that real matches had been the mode in number nine at some remote date. Disgusted and oppressed by cumulative inquisitiveness, he took the candle end back to the hall. He would have given much for the time and means to make a more detailed investigation into the secret of the house. Perhaps it was mostly his hope of chancing on some clue to the mystery of Dorothy Calendar bewitching riddle that she was, that fascinated his imagination so completely. 
aside from her altogether, the great house that stood untenanted, yet in such complete order, so self-contained in its darkened quiet, intrigued him equally with the train of inexplicable events that had brought him within its walls. Now, since his latest entrance, his vision had adjusted itself to cope with the obscurity to some extent, and the street lights, meagerly reflected through the windows from the bosom of a sullen pall of cloud, low swung above the city, had helped him to piece together many a detail of decoration and furnishing, alike somber and richly dignified. Kirkwood told himself that the owner, whoever he might be, was a man of wealth and taste inherited from another age. He had found little of meretricious to-day in the dwelling, much that was solid and sedate and homely and Victorian. He could have wished for more. A box of early Victorian vestas had been highly acceptable. Making his way downstairs to the stricken man, who was quite as he had been, Kirkwood bent over and thrust rifling fingers into his pockets. Regardless of the wretched sense of guilt and sneakishness imparted by the action, stubbornly heedless of the possibility of the man's awakening to find himself being searched and robbed. In the last place he sought, which should, he realized, have been the first, to wit the fob pocket of the white waistcoat, he found a small gold matchbox, packed tight with wax vestas and, berating himself for crass stupidity, he had saved a deal of time and trouble by thinking of this before, lighted the candle. As its golden flame shot up with scarce a tremor, preyed upon by a perfectly excusable concern, he bent to examine the man's countenance. The arm which had partly hidden it had fallen back into a natural position. It was a young face that gleamed pallid in the candlelight, a face unlined, a little vapid and insignificant, with features regular and neat, betraying few characteristics other than the purely negative attributes of a character as yet unformed, possibly unformable, much the sort of a face that he might have expected to see, remembering those thin and pouting lips that before had impressed him. Its owner was probably little more than twenty. In his attire there was a suspicion of a fop's preciseness, Aside from its accidental disarray, the cut of his waistcoat was the extreme of the then fashion. The white tie, twisted beneath one ear, an exaggerated butterfly. His collar nearly an inch too tall, and he was shod with pumps suitable only for the dancing floor. A whim of the young bloods of London of that year. "'I can't make him out at all,' declared Kirkwood." the son of a gentleman too weak to believe that cubs need licking into shape, reared to man's estate, so sheltered from the wicked world that he never grew a bark, the sort that never had a quarrel in his life, except with his tailor. Now, what the devil is this thing doing in this midnight mischief? Damn! It was most exasperating, the incongruity of the boy's appearance assorted with his double role of persecutor of distressed damsels and nocturnal housebreaker. Kirkwood bent closer above the motionless head, with puzzled eyes striving to pin down some elusive resemblance that he thought to trace in those vacuous features, a resemblance to someone he had seen or known at some past time, somewhere, somehow. I give it up. Guess I'm mistaken. Anyhow, five young Englishmen out of every ten of his class are just as blond and foolish. Now, let's see how bad he's hurt. With hands strong and gentle, he turned the round, light head. Then, ah, he commented in the ascent of comprehension. For there was an angry-looking bump at the base of the skull, and the skin having been broken, possibly in collision with the sharp-edged nouvel post, a little blood had stained and matted the straw-colored hair. Kirkwood let the head down and took thought. Recalling a bathroom on the floor above, thither he went, unselfishly forgetful of his predicament if discovered, and, turning on the water, sopping his handkerchief until it dripped, then, returning, he took the boy's head on his knees, washed the wound, purloined another handkerchief, of silk with a giddy border, from the other's pocket, and of this manufactured a rude but serviceable bandage. Toward the conclusion of his attentions, the sufferer began to show signs of returning animation. 
He stirred restlessly, whimpered a little, and sighed, and Kirkwood, in consternation, got up. So, he commented ruefully, I guess I am an ass, all right, taking all that trouble for you, my friend. If I've got a grain of sense left, this is my cue to leave you alone in your glory. He was lingering only to restore to the boy's pockets such articles as he had removed in the search for matches. The matchbox, a few silver coins, a bulky sovereign purse, a handsome plain gold watch, and so forth. But ere he concluded, he was aware that the boy was conscious, that his eyes, open and blinking in the candlelight, were upon him. They were blue eyes, blue and shallow as a doll's, and edged with long, fine lashes. Intelligence of a certain degree was rapidly informing them. Kirkwood returned their questioning glance. Transfixed in indecision, his primal impulse to cut and run for it was gone. He had nothing to fear from this child who could not prevent his going whenever he chose to go. While, by remaining, he might perchance worm from him something about the girl. "'You're feeling better?' He was almost surprised to hear his own voice put the query. "'I... I think so. Ow! My head! I say, you chap, whoever you are, what happened? I want to get up,' the boy added peevishly. "'Help a fellow, can't you?' "'You've had a nasty fall.' Kirkwood observed evenly, passing an arm beneath the boy's shoulder and helping him to a sitting position. "'Do you remember?' The other snuffled childishly and scrubbed across the floor to rest his back against the wall. "'Why, I remember fallen, and then I woke up, and it was all dark, and my head aching fit to split. I presume I went to sleep again. I say, what are you doing here?' Instead of replying, Kirkwood lifted a warning finger. "'Hush,' he said tensely, alarmed by noises in the street. "'You don't suppose—' He had been conscious of a carriage rolling up from the corner, as well as that it had drawn up, presumably, before a nearby dwelling. Now the rattle of a key in the hall door was startlingly audible. Before he could move, the door itself opened with a slam. Kirkwood moved toward the stairhead and drew back with a cry of disgust. Too late, he told himself bitterly. His escape was cut off. He could run upstairs and hide, of course, but the boy would inform against him, and— He buttoned up his coat, settled his hat on his head, and moved near the candle, where it rested on the floor. One glimpse would suffice to show him the force of the intruders, and one move of his foot put out the light— then, perhaps, he might be able to rush them. Below, a brief pause had followed the noise of the door, as if those entering were standing, irresolute, undecided which way to turn, but abruptly enough the glimmer of candlelight must have been noticed. Kirkwood heard a hushed exclamation, a quick clatter of high heels on the parquetry, pattering feet on the stairs, all but drowned by swish and ripple of silken skirts, and a woman stood at the head of the flight. To the American, an apparition profoundly amazing as she paused, the light from the floor casting odd, theatric shadows beneath her eyes and over her brows, edging her eyes themselves with brilliant light beneath their dark lashes, showing her lips straight and drawn, and shimmering upon the spangles of an evening gown, visible beneath the dark cloak, which had fallen back from her white, beautiful shoulders. End of chapter 7 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 8 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 8 Madame L'Intrigant Mrs. Hallam, cried Kirkwood, beneath his breath. The woman ignored his existence. Moving swiftly forward, she dropped on both knees by the side of the boy and caught up one of his hands, clasping it passionately in her own. Fred! she cried a curious break in her tone. My little Freddy, 
Oh, what has happened, dearie? Oh, hello, mamma, grunted that young man, submitting listlessly to her caresses and betraying no overwhelming surprise at her appearance there. Indeed, he seemed more concerned as to what Kirkwood, an older man, would be thinking to see him so endeared and fondled than moved by any other emotion. Kirkwood could see his shamefaced sidelong glances, and despised him properly for them. But, without attending to his response, Mrs. Hallam rattled on in the uneven accents of excitement. "'I waited until I couldn't wait any longer, Freddy dear. I had to know. Had to come. Eccles came home about nine, and said that you had told him to wait outside, that someone had followed you in here, and that Bobby had told him to move on. I didn't know what—' "'What o'clock now?' her son interrupted. "'It's about three, I think. Have you hurt yourself, dear? Oh, why didn't you come home? You must have known I was dying of anxiety. Oh, I say, can't you see I'm hurt? Had a nasty fall, and must have been asleep ever since. My precious one, how? Can't say hardly. I say, don't paw a chap so, Mama. I brought Eccles along and told him to wait, because, well, because I didn't feel so much like shutting myself up in this beastly old tomb. So I left the door ajar and told him not to let anybody come in. Then I came upstairs. There must have been somebody already in the house. I know I thought there was. It made me feel creepy, rather. At any rate, I heard voices down below, and the door banged, and somebody began hammering like fun on the knocker. The boy paused, rolling an embarrassed eye up at the stranger. "'Yes, yes, dear,' Mrs. Hallam urged him on. "'Why, I—I I made up my mind to cut my stick, let whoever it was pass me on the stairs, you know. But he followed me and struck me, and then I jumped at him, and we both fell down the whole flight. And that's all. Besides, my head's aching like everything.' "'But this man—' Mrs. Hallam looked up at Kirkwood, who bowed silently, struggling to hide both his amusement and perplexity. More than ever— now the case presented a front inscrutable to his wits. Try as he might, he failed to fit an explanation to any incident in which he had figured, while this last development, that his antagonist of the dark stairway had been Mrs. Hallam's son, seemed the most astounding of all, baffling elucidation completely. He had abandoned all thought of flight and escape. It was too late. In the brisk idiom of his mother tongue, he was caught with the goods on. May as well face the music, he counseled himself, in resignation. From what he had seen and surmised of Mrs. Hallam, he shrewdly suspected that the tune would prove an exceedingly lively one. She seemed a woman of imagination, originality, and an able-bodied temper. You, Mr. Kirkwood! Again he bowed, grinning awry. She rose suddenly. You will be good enough to explain your presence here she informed him with dangerous serenity. "'To be frank with you, I advise that course, Mr. Kirkwood. Thanks awfully. I came here half an hour ago looking for a lost purse, full—well, not quite full—of sovereigns. It was my purse, by the way.' Suspicion glinted like foxfire in the cold green eyes beneath her puckered brows. "'I do not understand,' she said slowly and in level tones. "'I didn't expect you to,' returned Kirkwood. "'No more do I. "'But, anyway, it must be clear to you "'that I've done my best for this gentleman here.' "'He paused with an interrogative lift of his eyebrows. "'This gentleman is my son, Frederick Hallam. "'But you will explain... "'Pardon me, Mrs. Hallam. "'I shall explain nothing at present. "'Permit me to point out that your position here, like mine, "'is, to say the least, anomalous. The random stroke told, as he could tell by the instant contraction of her eyes of a cat, it would be best to defer explanations till a more convenient time, don't you think? Then, if you like, we can chant confidences in an antiphonal chorus. Just now, your, uh, son is not enjoying himself, apparently, and the attention of the police had best not be called to this house too often in one night." His levity seemed to displease and perturb the woman. 
She turned from him with an impatient movement of her shoulders. "'Freddy, dear, do you feel able to walk?' "'Er, uh, oh, I dare say. I don't know. Wonder would your friend, er, uh, Mr. Kirkwood, lend me an arm?' "'Charmed,' Kirkwood declared suavely. "'If you'll take the candle, Mrs. Hallam." He helped the boy to his feet, and, while the latter hung upon him and complained querulously, stood waiting for the woman to lead the way with the light, something which, however, she seemed in no haste to do. The pause at length puzzled Kirkwood, and he turned to find Mrs. Hallam holding her candlestick and regarding him steadily, with much the same expression of furtive mistrust as that with which she had favored him on her own door-stoop. "'One moment,' she interposed in confusion. "'I won't keep you waiting.' And, passing with an averted face, ran quickly upstairs to the second floor, taking the light with her. Its glow faded from the walls above, and Kirkwood surmised that she had entered the front bedchamber. For some moments he could hear her moving about. Once something scraped and bumped on the floor, as if a heavy bit of furniture had been moved. Again there was a resounding thud that defied speculation, and this was presently followed by a dull clang of metal. His fugitive speculations afforded him little enlightenment, and, meantime, young Hallam, leaning partly against the wall and quite heavily on Kirkwood's arm, filled his ears with puerile oaths and lamentations, so that, but for the excuse of his really severe shaking up, Kirkwood had been strongly tempted to take the youngster by the shoulders and kick him heartily, for the health of his soul. But, eventually, it was not really long, there came the quick rush of Mrs. Hallam's feet along the upper hall, and the woman reappeared, one hand holding her skirts clear of her pretty feet as she descended in a rush that caused the candle's flame to flicker perilously. Halfway down, Mr. Kirkwood! she called tempestuously. "'Didn't you find it?' he countered blandly. She stopped jerkily at the bottom, and after a moment of confusion, "'Find what, sir?' she asked. "'What you sought, Mrs. Hallam.' Smiling, he bore unflinching the prolonged inspection of her eyes, at once somber with doubt of him and flashing with indignation because of his impudence. "'You knew I wouldn't find it then, didn't you?' I may have suspected you wouldn't. Now he was sure that she had been searching for the Gladstone bag. That evidently was the bone of contention. Calendar had sent his daughter for it, Mrs. Hallam her son. Dorothy had been successful. But, on the other hand, Calendar and Mrs. Hallam were unquestionably allies. Why, then, where is it, Mr. Kirkwood? Madam, have you the right to know? Through another lengthening pause, while they faced each other, he marked again the curious contraction of her under lip. "'I have the right,' she declared steadily. "'Where is it?' "'How can I be sure?' "'Then you don't know.' "'Indeed,' he interrupted. "'I would be glad to feel that I ought to tell you what I know.' "'What you know?' The exclamation, low-spoken, more an echo of her thoughts than intended for Kirkwood, was accompanied by a little shake of the woman's head, mute evidence to the fact that she was bewildered by his finesse. And this delighted the young man beyond measure, making him feel himself master of a difficult situation. Mysteries had been woven before his eyes so persistently of late that it was a real pleasure to be able to do a little mystifying on his own account. By adopting this reticent and non-committal attitude, he was forcing the hand of a woman old enough to be his mother, and most evidently a past mistress in the art of misleading, all of which seemed very fascinating to the amateur in adventure. The woman would have led again, but young Hallam cut in, none too courteously. "'I say, Mama, it's no good standing here, palaverin' like a lot of flats.' Besides, I'm awfully knocked up. Let's go home and have it out there. Instantly his mother softened. My poor boy, of course we'll go. Without further demur, she swept past and down the stairway before them. Slowly, for their progress was of necessity slow, and the light most needed. 
Once they were in the main hall, however, she extinguished the candle, placed it on a side table, and passed out through the door. It had been left open as before, and Kirkwood was not at all surprised to see a man waiting on the threshold. The versatile Eccles, if he erred not. He had little chance to identify him, as it happened, for at a word from Mrs. Hallam the man bowed and, following her across the sidewalk, opened the door of a four-wheeler which, with lamps alight and livery driver on the box, had been waiting at the carriage block. As they passed out, Kirkwood shut the door, and at the same moment the little party was brought up standing by a gruff and authoritative summons. "'Just a minute, please. You there!' "'Aha!' said Kirkwood to himself. "'I thought so.' And he halted, in unfeigned respect for the burly and impressive figure, garbed in blue and brass, helmeted and truncheoned, bull's eye shining on breast like the law's unblinking and sleepless eye, barring the way to the carriage. Mrs. Hallam showed less deference for the obstructionist. The assumed hauteur and impatience of her pose was artfully reflected in her voice as she rounded upon the bobby, with an indignant demand. "'What is the meaning of this, officer?' "'Precisely what I wants to know, ma'am,' returned the man, unyielding beneath his respectful attitude. "'I'm obliged to ask you to tell me what you were doing in that house. And what's the matter with this ear gentleman?' he added, with a dubious stare at young Hallam's bandaged head and rumpled clothing. "'Perhaps you don't understand,' admitted Mrs. Hallam sweetly. "'Of course, I see. It's perfectly natural. The house has been shut up for some time, and—' "'Thank you, ma'am. That's just it. There was something wrong going on early in the evening, and I was told to keep an eye on the premises. It's duty, ma'am. I've got my report to make.' The house, said Mrs. Hallam, with the long-suffering patience of one elucidating a perfectly plain proposition to a being of a lower order of intelligence, is the property of my son, Arthur Frederick Burgoyne Hallam of Cornwall. This is, beg pardon, ma'am, but I was told Colonel George Burgoyne of Cornwall. Colonel Burgoyne died some time ago. My son is his heir. This is my son. He came to the house this evening to get some property he desired, and, it seems, tripped on the stairs and fell unconscious. I became worried about him, and drove over, accompanied by my friend, Mr. Kirkwood. The policeman looked his troubled state of mind, and wagged a doubtful head over the case. There was his duty, and there was, opposed to it, the fact that all three were garbed in the livery of the well-to-do. At length, turning to the driver, he demanded, received, and noted in his memorandum book the license number of the equipage. "'It's a very unusual case, ma'am,' he apologized. "'I hopes you won't hold it against me. I'm only trying to do my duty.' "'And safeguard our property. You are perfectly justified, officer.' "'Thank you, ma'am. And would you mind giving me your cards, please, all of you?' "'Certainly not.' Without hesitation, the woman took a little handbag from the seat of the carriage and produced a card. Her son likewise found his case and handed the officer an oblong slip. "'I've no cards with me,' the American told the policeman. "'My name, however, is Philip Kirkwood, and I'm staying at the Pless.' "'Very good, sir. Thank you.' The man penciled the information in his little book. "'Thank you, ma'am, and Mr. Hallam, sir.' "'Sorry to have detained you. Good morning.' Kirkwood helped young Hallam into the carriage, gave Mrs. Hallam his hand, and followed her. The man Eccles shut the door, mounting the box beside the driver. Immediately they were in motion. The American got a final glimpse of the bobby, standing in front of number 9, Frognall Street, and watching them with an air of profound uncertainty. He had Kirkwood's sympathy therein, but he had little time to feel with him, for Mrs. Hallam turned upon him very suddenly. "'Mr. Kirkwood, will you be good enough to tell me who and what you are?' The young man smiled his homely, candid smile. "'I'll be only too glad, Mrs. Hallam, when I feel sure you'll do as much for yourself.' She gave him no answer. It was as if she were choosing words. Kirkwood braced himself to meet the storm, but none ensued. 
there was rather a lull, which strung itself out indefinitely, to the monotonous music of hooves and rubber tires. Young Hallam was resting his empty blond head against the cushions, and had closed his eyes. He seemed to doze, but, as the carriage rolled past the frequent street lights, Kirkwood could see that the eyes of Mrs. Hallam were steadily directed to his face. His outward composure was tempered by some amusement, by more admiration. The woman's eyes were very handsome, even when hardest and most cold. It was not easy to conceive of her as being the mother of a son so immaturely mature. Why, she must have been at least thirty-eight or nine. One wondered. She did not look it. The carriage stopped before a house with lighted windows. Eccles jumped down from the box and scurried to open the front door. The radiance of a hall lamp was streaming out into the misty night when he returned to release his employers. They were returned to Craven Street. One more lap around the track, mused Kirkwood. Wonder will the next take me back to Bermondsey Old Stairs. At Mrs. Hallam's direction, Eccles ushered him into the smoking room on the ground floor in the rear of the dwelling, there to wait until she helped her son upstairs and to bed. He sighed with pleasure at first glimpse of its luxurious but informal comforts, and threw himself carelessly into a heavily padded lounging chair. Dropping one knee over the other, and lighting the last of his expensive cigars with a sensation of undiluted gratitude, as one coming to rest in the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Over his shoulder a home-like illumination was cast by an electric reading lamp shaded with red silk. At his feet brass fire-dogs winked sleepily in the fluttering blaze of a well-tended stove. The walls were hung with deep red, the doors and divans upholstered in the same restful shade. In one corner an old clock ticked soberly. The atmosphere would have proved a potent invitation to reverie, if not to sleep. He was very sleepy, but for the confusion in the house. In its chambers, through the walls, on the stairs, there were hurryings and scurryings of feet and skirts, confused with murmuring voices. Presently, in an adjoining room, Philip Kirkwood heard a maidservant wrestling hopefully with that most exasperating of modern time-saving devices, the telephone, as countenanced by our English cousins. Her patience and determination won his approval, but availed nothing for her purpose. In the outcome, the telephone triumphed, and the maid gave up the unequal contest. Later, a butler entered the room, a short and sturdy fellow, extremely ill at ease. Drawing a small tabouret to the side of Kirkwood's chair, he placed thereon a tray, deferentially imparting the information that Mrs. Allam had thought how as Mr. Kirkwood might care for a bit of supper. "'Please thank Mrs. Allam for me,' Kirkwood's gratified eyes ranged the laden tray. There were sandwiches, biscuit, cheese, and a pot of black coffee with sugar and cream. It was very kindly thought of, he added. Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. The man turned to go, shuffling soundlessly. Kirkwood was suddenly impressed with his evasiveness. Ever since he had entered the room, his countenance had seemed turned from the guest. Eccles, he called sharply, at a venture. The butler halted, thunderstruck. "'Yes, sir?' "'Turn around, Eccles. I want to look at you.' Eccles faced him unwillingly, with a stolid front but shifty eyes. Kirkwood glanced him up and down, grinning. "'Thank you, Eccles. I'll remember you now. You'll remember me, too, won't you? You're a bad actor, aren't you, Eccles?' "'Yes, sir. Thank you, sir,' mumbled the man unhappily and took instant advantage of the implied permission to go. Intensely diverted by the recollection of Eccles' abortive attempt to stop him at the door of number nine, and wondering, now that he came to think of it, why, precisely, young Hallam had deemed it necessary to travel with a bodyguard and adopt such furtive methods to enter as well as to obtain what was asserted to be his own property, Kirkwood turned active attention to the lunch. Thoughtfully, he poured himself a cup of coffee, swallowing it hot and black as it came from the silver pot, then munched the sandwiches. It was kindly thought of, 
this early morning repast. Mrs. Hallam seemed more and more a remarkable woman with each phase of her character that she chose to disclose. At odds with him, she yet took time to think of his creature needs. What could be her motive? Not in feeding him, but in involving her name and fortune in an affair so strangely flavored. This opened up a desert waste of barren speculation. What's anybody's motive who figures in this thundering dime novel? demanded the American, almost contemptuously, and, for the hundredth time, gave it up. The day should declare it. If so hap he lived in to see that day, a distant one, he made no doubt. The only clear fact in his befogged and bemused mentality was that he was at once broke, and in this business up to his ears. Well, he'd see it through. He'd nothing better to do. And there was the girl. Dorothy, whose eyes and lips he had but to close his own eyes to see again, as vividly as though she stood before him. Dorothy, whose unspoiled sweetness stood out in vivid relief against this moil and toil of conspiracy. Like a star of evening, shining clear in a stormy sky. Poetic simile. I'm going fast, conceded Kirkwood, but he did not smile. It was becoming quite too serious a matter for laughter. For her sake, he was in the game for keeps, especially in view of the fact that everything, his own heart's inclination included, seemed to conspire to keep him in it. Of course, he hoped for nothing in return. A pauper, who turns squire of dames with matrimonial intent, is open to the designation penniless adventurer. No, whatever service he might be to the girl would be ample recompense to him for his labors and afterwards he'd go his way in peace. She'd soon forget him, if she hadn't already. Women, he propounded gravely, are queer. There's no telling anything about them. One of the most unreadable specimens of the sex on which he pronounced this highly original dictum entered the room just then, and he found himself at once out of his chair and his dream bowing. Mrs. Hallam. The woman nodded and smiled graciously. Eccles has attended to your needs, I hope. Please don't stop smoking. She sank into an armchair on the other side of the hearth, and, probably by accident, out of the radius of illumination from the lamp, sitting sidewise, one knee above the other, her white arms immaculate against the somber background of shadowed crimson. She was very handsome indeed, just then, though a keener light might have proved less flattering. Now, Mr. Kirkwood, she opened briskly, with a second intimate and friendly nod, and paused, her pose receptive. Kirkwood sat down again, smiling good-natured appreciation of her unprejudiced attitude. Your son, Mrs. Hallam. Oh, Freddy's doing well enough. Freddy, she explained, has a delicate constitution and has seen little of the world. Such melodrama as tonight's is apt to shock him severely. We must make allowances, Mr. Kirkwood. Kirkwood grinned again, a trace unsympathetically. He was unable to simulate any enthusiasm on the subject of poor Freddy, whom he had sized up with passable acumen as a spoiled and coddled child, completely under the thumb of an extremely clever mother. Yes, he responded vaguely. He'll be quite fit after a night's sleep, I dare say. The woman was watching him keenly, beneath her lowered lashes. I think, she said deliberately, that it is time we came to an understanding. Kirkwood agreed. Yes, affably. I propose being perfectly straightforward. To begin with, I don't place you, Mr. Kirkwood. You are an unknown quantity, a new factor. Won't you please tell me what you are, and are you a friend of Mr. Calendar's? I think I may lay claim to that honor, though, to Kirkwood's way of seeing things, some little frankness on his own part would be essential if they were to get on. I hardly know him, Mrs. Hallam. I had the pleasure of meeting him only this afternoon. She knitted her brows over this statement. That, I assure you, is the truth, he laughed. But... I really don't understand. Nor I, Mrs. Hallam. Calendar aside, I am Philip Kirkwood, American, 
resident abroad for some years, a native of San Francisco, of a certain age, unmarried, by profession a poor painter. And, beyond that, I presume I must tell you, though, I confess I'm in doubt, he hesitated, weighing candor in the balance with discretion. But who are you for? Are you in George Callender's pay? Heaven forfend, piously. My sole interest at the present moment is to unravel a most entrancing mystery. Entitled Dorothy Callender. Of course. You've known her long? Eight hours, I believe, he admitted gravely. Less than that, in fact. Miss Callender's interests will not suffer through anything you may tell me. Whether they will or no, I see I must swing a looser tongue, or you'll be showing me the door. The woman shook her head, amused. Not until, she told him significantly. Very well, then. And he launched into an abridged narrative of the night's events, as he understood them, touching lightly on his own circumstances, the real poverty which had brought him back to Craven Street by way of Frognall. And there you have it all, Mrs. Hallam. She sat in silent musing. Now and again he caught the glint of her eyes, and knew that he was being appraised with such trained acumen as only long knowledge of men can give to women. He wondered if he were found wanting. Her dark head bended, elbow on knee, chin resting lightly in the cradle of her slender, parted fingers, the woman thought profoundly her reverie ending with a brief, curt laugh, musical and mirthless as the sound of breaking glass. "'It is so like Calendar, she exclaimed, "'so like him that one sees how foolish it was to trust, "'no, not to trust, but to believe "'that he could even be thrown off the scent, "'once he got nose to ground. "'So, if we suffer, my son and I, "'I shall have only myself to thank.' Kirkwood waited in patient attention till she chose to continue. When she did, "'Now, for my side of the case,' cried Mrs. Hallam, and rising, began to pace the room, her slender and rounded figure swaying gracefully, the while she talked. "'George Calendar is a scoundrel,' she said, "'a swindler, gambler, what I believe you Americans call a confidence man. He is also my late husband's first cousin.' some years since he found it convenient to leave england likewise his wife and daughter mrs calendar a countrywoman of yours by the by died shortly afterwards dorothy by the merest accident obtained a situation as private secretary in the household of the late colonel burgoyne of the cliffs cordwall you follow me yes perfectly Colonel Burgoyne died, leaving his estates to my son some time ago. Shortly afterwards, Dorothy Calendar disappeared. We know now that her father took her away, but then the disappearance seemed inexplicable, especially since with her vanished a great deal of valuable information. She alone knew of the location of certain of the old colonel's personal effects. He was an eccentric. One of his peculiarities involved the secreting of valuables in odd places. He had no faith in banks. Among these valuables were the Burgoyne family jewels. Quite a treasure, believe me, Mr. Kirkwood. We found no note of them among the colonel's papers, and without Dorothy were powerless to pursue a search for them. We advertised and employed detectives, with no result. It seems that father and daughter were at Monte Carlo at the time. "'Beautifully circumstantial, my dear lady,' commented Kirkwood, to his inner consciousness. Outwardly, he maintained consistently a pose of impassive gullibility. "'This afternoon, for the first time, we received news of the Calendars. Calendar himself called upon me to beg a loan. I explained our difficulty, and he promised that Dorothy should send us the information by the morning's post. When I insisted, he agreed to bring it himself, after dinner— this evening. I make it quite clear? She interrupted, a little anxious. Quite clear, I assure you, he assented encouragingly. Strangely enough, he had not been gone ten minutes when my son came in from a conference with our solicitors, informing me that at last a memorandum had turned up, indicating that the heirlooms would be found in a safe secreted behind a dresser in Colonel Burgoyne's bedroom. 
at number nine frognall street yes i proposed going there at once but it was late and we were dining at the pless with an acquaintance a mr mulready whom i now recall as a former intimate of george calendar to our surprise we saw calendar and his daughter at a table not far from ours Mr. Mulready betrayed some agitation at the sight of Calendar, and told me that Scotland Yard had a man out with a warrant for Calendar's arrest, on old charges. For old sake's sake, Mr. Mulready begged me to give Calendar a word of warning. I did so, foolishly, it seems. Calendar was, at that moment, planning to rob us, Mulready aiding and abetting him. The woman paused before Kirkwood, looking down upon him. "'And so,' she concluded, "'we have been tricked and swindled. "'I can scarcely believe it of Dorothy Calendar. "'I, for one, don't believe it,' Kirkwood spoke quietly, rising. "'Whatever the culpability of Calendar and Mulready, "'Dorothy was only their hoodwinked tool. "'But, Mr. Kirkwood, she must have known the jewels were not hers. "'Yes,' he assented passively, but wholly unconvinced. "'And what?' she demanded, with a gesture of exasperation. "'What would you advise?' "'Scotland Yard,' he told her bluntly. "'But it's a family secret. It must not appear in the papers. Don't you understand? George Callender is my husband's cousin.' "'I can think of nothing else, unless you pursue them in person.' "'But whither?' "'That remains to be discovered. I can tell you nothing more than I have.' May I thank you for your hospitality? Express my regrets that I should unwittingly have been made the agent of this disaster, and wish you good night, or rather, good morning, Mrs. Hallam. For a moment she held him under a calculating glance, which he withstood with graceless fortitude. Then, realizing that he was determined not by any means to be won to her cause, she gave him her hand with a commonplace wish that he might find his affairs in better order than seemed probable, and rang for Eccles. The butler showed him out. He took away with him two strong impressions, the one visual of a strikingly handsome woman in a wonderful gown, standing under the red glow of a reading lamp in an attitude of intense mental concentration, her expression plainly indicative of a train of thought not guiltless of vindictiveness. The other, more mental but as real, he presently voiced to the huge bronze lions brooding over desolate Trafalgar Square. Well, appreciated Mr. Kirkwood with gusto, she's got Ananias and Sapphira talked to a standstill all right. He ruminated over this for a moment. Calendar can lie some, too, but hardly with her picturesque touch. Uncommon ingenious, I call it. All the same, there were only about a dozen bits of tiling that didn't fit into her mosaic a little bit. I think they're all tarred with the same stick, all but the girl. And there's something afoot a long sight more devilish and crafty than that shilling shocker of madam's. Dorothy calendar has got about as much active part in it as I have. I'm only from California, but they've got to show me, before I'll believe a word against her. Those infernal scoundrels. "'Somebody's got to be on the girl's side, and I seem to have drawn the lucky straw. "'Good heavens! Is it possible for a grown man to fall heels overhead in love in two short hours? "'I don't believe it. It's just interest. Nothing more. "'And I'll have to have a change of clothes before I can do anything further.' "'He bowed gratefully to the lions.' in view of their tolerant interest in his soliloquy, and set off very suddenly round the square and up St. Martin's Lane, striking across town as directly as might be for St. Pancras Station. It would undoubtedly be a long walk, but cabs were prohibited by his straitened means, and the buses were all abed and wouldn't be astir for hours. He strode along rapidly, finding his way more through intuition than by observation or familiarity with London's geography. Indeed, was scarce aware of his surroundings, for his brain was big with fine imagery, wrapped in a glowing dream of knight-errantry and chivalric deeds. Thus it is ever and always with those who, in the purity of young hearts, rush in where angels fear to tread. 
If these, Kirkwood and his ilk, be fools, thank God for them, for with such foolishness is life savored and made sweet and sound. To Kirkwood, the warp of the world and the woof of it was romance, and it wrapped him round a magic mantle to set him apart from all things mean and sordid and render him impregnable and invisible to the haunting shade of care which by the same token presently lost track of him entirely and wandered off to find and bedevil some other poor devil and kirkwood his eyes like his spirit elevated saw that the clouds of night were breaking the skies clearing that the east pulsed ever more strongly with a dim golden promise of the day to come and this he chose to take for an omen prematurely it may be end of chapter eight Recording by William Tomko Chapter 9 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 9 Again Below Bridge and Beyond Kirkwood wasted little time, who had not much to waste, were he to do that upon whose doing he had set his heart. It hurt him sore to have to lose the invaluable moments demanded by certain imperative arrangements, but his haste was such that all was consummated within an hour. Within the period of a single hour, then, he had ransomed his luggage at St. Pancras, caused it to be loaded upon a four-wheeler, and transferred to a neighboring hotel of evil flavor but moderate tariff, where he engaged a room for a week, ordered an immediate breakfast, and retired with his belongings to his room. He had shaved and changed his clothes, selecting a serviceable suit of heavy tweeds, stout shoes, a fore-and-aft cap, and a negligee shirt of a deep shade calculated at least to seem clean for a long time. Finally, he had devoured his bacon and eggs, gulped down his coffee, and burned his mouth, and, armed with a stout stick, set off hot-foot in the still dim glimmering of early day. By this time his cash capital had dwindled to the sum of two pounds, ten shillings, eight pence, and would have been much less had he paid for his lodging in advance. But he considered his trunk's ample security for the bill, and dared not wait the hour when shopkeepers begin to take down shutters and it becomes possible to realize upon one's jewelry. Besides which, he had never before seen called upon to consider the advisability of raising money by pledging personal property and was in considerable doubt as to the right course of procedure in such an emergency at king's cross station on the underground an acute disappointment awaited him there likewise he learned something about london a sympathetic bobby informed him that no trains would be running until after five thirty and that furthermore no buses would begin to ply until half after seven it's tramp it or cab it then mused the young man mournfully, his longing gaze seeking a nearby cab rank, just then occupied by a solitary hansom, driver somnolent on the box. Officer, he again addressed the policeman, mindful of the English axiom, when in doubt ask a bobby, Officer, when's high tide this morning? The bobby produced a well-worn pocket almanac, moistened a massive thumb, and rippled the pages. London Bridge, I tied twenty minutes after six, sir, he announced with a glow of satisfaction, wholly pardonable in one who combines the functions of preambulating almanac, guidebook, encyclopedia, and conserver of the peace. Kirkwood said something beneath his breath, a word in itself a comfortable mouthful and wholesome and emphatic. He glanced again at the cab and groaned, Oh, Lord, I just dasn't with which, thanking the Bureau of Information, he set off at a quick step down Gray's Inn Road. The day had closed down in brilliance upon the city, and the voice of the milkman was to be heard in the land, when he trudged, still briskly if a trifle wearily, into Holborn, 
and held on eastward across the viaduct and down Newgate Street, the while addling his weary wits with heart-sickening computations of minutes, all going hopelessly to prove that he would be late, far too late even presupposing the unlikely. The unlikely be it known was that the Alethea would not attempt to sail before the turn of the tide. For this was his mission, to find the Alethea before she sailed. Incredible as it may appear, at five o'clock, or maybe earlier, on the morning of the 22nd of April, 1906 A.D., Philip Kirkwood, normally a commonplace but likable young American, in full possession of his senses, might have been seen, and by some was seen, plodding manfully through Cheapside, London, England, engaged upon a quest as mad, forlorn, and gallant as any whose chronicle ever inspired the pen of a Mallory or a Foissard. In brief, he proposed to lend his arm and courage to be the shield and buckler of one who might or might not be a damsel in distress, according as to whether Mrs. Hallam had spoken soothly of Dorothy Calendar, or Kirkwood's own admirable faith in the girl were justified of itself. Proceeding upon the working hypothesis that Mrs. Hallam was a polished liar in most respects, but had told the truth, so far as concerned her statement to the effect that the Gladstone bag contained valuable real property, whose ownership remained a moot question, though Kirkwood was definitely committed to the belief that it was none of Mrs. Hallam's or her son's, he reasoned that the two adventurers, with Dorothy and their booty, would attempt to leave London by a water route, in the ship Alethea, whose name had fallen from their lips at Bermondsey Old Stairs. Kirkwood's initial task, then, would be to find the needle in the haystack. The metaphor is poor, more properly, to sort out from the hundreds of vessels, of all descriptions, at anchor in midstream, moored to the wharves of longshore warehouses, or in the gigantic docks that lined the Thames, that one called Alethea, of which he was so deeply mired in ignorance that he could not say whether she were tramp steamer, coastwise passenger boat, one of the liners that ply between Tilbury and all the world, channel ferry boat, private yacht, steam or sail, schooner, foremaster, square rigger, bark, or brigantine. A task to stagger the optimism of any but one equipped with the sublime impudence of youth. Even Kirkwood was disturbed by some little awe when he contemplated the vast proportions of his undertaking. Nonetheless doggedly, he plugged ahead, and tried to keep his mind from vain surmises as to what would be his portion when eventually he should find himself a passenger, uninvited and unwelcome, upon the Alethea. London had turned over once or twice, and was pulling the bedclothes over its head and grumbling about getting up, but the city was still sound asleep when at length he paused for a minute's rest in front of the mansion house and realized with a pang of despair that he was completely tuckered out. There was a dull, vague throbbing in his head. Weights pressed upon his eyeballs until they ached. His mouth was hot and tasted of yesterday's tobacco. His feet were numb and heavy. His joints were stiff. He yawned frequently. With a sigh, he surrendered to the flesh's frailty. An early cabby, cruising up from Cannon Street Station on the off chance of finding someone astir in the city, aside from the doves and sparrows, suffered the surprise of his life when Kirkwood hailed him. His face was blank with amazement when he reined in, and his eyes bulged when the prospective fare, on impulse, explained his urgent needs. Happily, he turned out a fair representative of his class, an intelligent and unfuddled cabby. "'Jump in, sir!' he told Kirkwood cheerfully, as soon as he had assimilated the latter's demands. I knows precisely what your wants. Leave it all to me. The admonition was all but superfluous. Kirkwood was unable, for the time being, to do aught else than resign his fate into another's guidance. Once in the cab, he slipped insensibly into a nap, and slept soundly on, as reckless of the cab's swift pace and continuous jouncing as of the sunlight glaring full in his tired young face. 
He may have slept twenty minutes. He awoke faint with drowsiness, tingling from head to toe from fatigue, and in distress of a queer calm in the pit of his stomach, to find the hansom at rest and the driver on the step, shaking his fare with kindly determination. "'Oh, all right!' he assented surlily, and by sheer force of will made himself climb out to the sidewalk, where, having rubbed his eyes, stretched enormously and yawned discourteously in the face of the east end, he was once more himself and a hundred times refreshed into the bargain. Contentedly he counted three shillings into the cabby's palm, the fare named being one and six. The shilling over and above the tips for finding me the waterman and boat, he stipulated. Right o oh, you'll mind the orse a minute, sir? Kirkwood nodded. The man touched his hat and disappeared inexplicably. Kirkwood, needlessly attaching himself to the reins near the animal's head, pried his sense of observation open, and became alive to the fact that he stood in a quarter of London as strange to him as had been Bermondsey Wall. To this day he cannot put a name to it. He surmises that it was Wapping. Ramshackle tenements with sharp gable roofs lined either side of the way. Frowsy women draped themselves over the window sills. Pallid and wasted parodies on childhood contested the middle of the street with great slow drays drawn by enormous horses. On the sidewalks twin streams of masculine humanity flowed without rest, both bound in the same direction, dock laborers going to their day's work. Men of every nationality known to the world, he thought, passed him in his short five minutes' wait by the horse's head. Britons, brown East Indians, blacks from Jamaica, swart Italians, Polacks, Russian Jews, wire-drawn Yankees, Spaniards, Portuguese, Greeks, even a Nubian or two, uniform in those things only, that their backs were bent with toil, bowed beyond mending and their faces stamped with the blurred type-stamp of the dumb laboring brute. A strangely hideous procession, they shambled on, for the most part silent, all uncouth and unreal in the clear morning glow. The outlander was sensible of some relief when his cabby popped hurriedly out of the entrance to a tenement, a dull-visaged, broad-shouldered waterman ambling more slowly after. "'Nevy of mine, sir!' announced the cabby, and a fust right waterman. Knows the river like a book, he do. The nephew touched his forelock sheepishly. Thank you, said Kirkwood, and turning to the man, your boat? he asked with the brevity of weariness. This why, sir? At his guide's heels, Kirkwood threaded the crowd, and, entering the tenement, stumbled through a gloomy and unsavory passage to come out at last upon a scanty, unrailed veranda overlooking the river. Ten feet below, perhaps, foul waters purred and eddied round the piles supporting the rear of the building. On one hand, a ladder-like flight of rickety steps descended to a floating stage to which a heavy rowboat lay moored. In the latter, a second waterman was seated, bailing out bilge with a rusty can. "'Here we are, sir,' said the cabman's nephew, pausing at the head of the steps. "'Now, where's it to be?' The American explained tersely that he had a message to deliver a friend, who had shipped aboard a vessel known as the Alethea, scheduled to sail at flood tide, further than which deponent averred naught. The waterman scratched his head. A hard job, sir, not knowing what kind of a boat she are, mikes it arder. He waited hopefully. Ten shillings, volunteered Kirkwood promptly. Ten shillings if you get me aboard her before she weighs anchor. Fifteen if I keep you out more than an hour. And still you put me aboard. After that, we'll make other terms. The man promptly turned his back to hail his mate. Arf a quid, Bob, if we puts this gent aboard a wessel name a uh, Alateer, afore she styles at turn a tide. In the boat, the man with the bailing can turned up an impassive countenance. Coom down, he clenched the bargain, and set about shipping the sweeps. Kirkwood crept down the shaky ladder, and deposited himself in the stern of the boat. The younger boatman settled himself on the midship thwart. Ready? Ready, assented old Bob from the bows. He cast off the painter, placed one sweep against the edge of the stage, and with a vigorous thrust pushed off, then took his seat. 
bows swinging downstream, the boat shot out from the shore. "'How's the tide?' demanded Kirkwood, his impatience growing. "'On the turn, sir,' he was told. For a long moment broadside to the current, the boat responded to the sturdy pulling of the port sweeps. Another moment, and it was in full swing, the watermen bending lustily to their task. Under their unceasing urge, the broad-beamed, heavy craft, aided by the ebbing tide, surged more and more rapidly through the water. The banks, grim and unsightly with their towering, impassive warehouses, broken by toppling wooden tenements, slipped swiftly upstream. Ship after ship was passed, sailing vessels in the majority, swinging sluggishly at anchor, drifting slowly with the river, or made fast to the good stages of the shore and in keen anxiety, lest he should overlook the right one, Kirkwood searched their bows and sterns for names, which in more than one case proved hardly legible. The Alethea was not of their number. In the course of some ten minutes, the watermen drove the boat sharply inshore, bringing her up alongside another floating stage, in the shadow of another tenement both so like those from which they had embarked, that Kirkwood would have been unable to distinguish one from another. In the bows, old Bob lifted up a stentorian voice, summoning one William. Recognizing that there was some design in this, the passenger subdued his disapproval of the delay and sat quiet. In answer to the third ear-racking hail, a man, clothed simply in dirty shirt and disreputable trousers, showed himself in the doorway above, rubbing the sleep out of a red, bloated countenance with a mighty and grimy fist. Hello. He said surlily, "What's the row?" "Ooh!" interrogated old Bob, holding the boat steady by grasping the stage. "Was the party what engaged your last night, Bill?" "Party name o' uh, Alethea," growled the drowsy one. "Why?" "Party ears looking for him. Where'll I find this Alethea?" "Best look sharp, or you won't find him," retorted the one above. He was at anchor off Bow Creek last night. Kirkwood's heart leaped in hope. What sort of a vessel was she? he asked, half rising in his eagerness. Brigantine, sir. Thank you, replied Kirkwood explosively, resuming his seat with uncalculated haste, as old Bob, deaf to the amenities of social intercourse in an emergency involving as much as ten Bob, shoved off again. And again the boat was flying down in midstream the leaden waters, shot with gold of the morning sun, parting sullenly beneath its bows. The air was still, heavy and tepid. The least exertion brought out beaded moisture on face and hands. In the east hung a turgid sky, dull with haze, through which the mounting sun swam like a plaque of brass. Overhead it was clear and cloudless, but besmirched as if the polished mirror of the heavens had been fouled by the breath of departing night. On the right ahead, Greenwich Naval College loomed up, the great grey stone buildings beyond the embankment impressively dominating the scene, in happy relief against the wearisome monotony of the river banks, it came abreast and ebbed into the backwards of the scene. The watermen, straining at the sweeps, the boat sped into Black Wall Reach, Bugsby Marshes, a splash of lurid green to port, dreary Cubit Town, and the West India docks to starboard. Here the river ran thick with shipping. "'Are we near?' Kirkwood would know, and by way of reply had a grunt of the younger waterman. "'Again, will we make it?' he asked. The identical grunt answered him. He was free to interpret it as he would. Young William, as old Bob named him, had no breath for idle words. Kirkwood subsided, controlling his impatience to the best of his ability. The men, he told himself again and again, were earning their pay, whether or not they gained the goal of his desire. Their labors were titanic. On their temples and foreheads the knotted veins stood out like discolored whipcord. Their faces were the shade of raw beef, steaming with sweat. Their eyes protruded with the strain that set their jaws like vices. Their chests heaved and shrank like bellows. Their backs curved straightened and bent again in rhythmic unison as tiring to the eye as the swinging of a pendulum hugging the marshy shore they rounded the black wall point 
Young William looked to Kirkwood, caught his eye, and nodded. Here? Kirkwood rose, balancing himself against the leap and sway of the boat. Somewheres, long, oh, he ear. From right to left, his eager glance swept the river's widening reach. Vessels were there in abundance. Odd, unwieldy, blunt bowed craft with huge, rakish, tawny sails. Long strings of flat barges, pyramidal mounds of coal on each, lashed to another and convoyed by panting tugs. Steam cargo boats, battered, worn, rusted sore through their age-old paint. A steel leviathan of the deep seas, half cargo, half passenger boat, warping reluctantly into the mouth of the Victoria Dock tidal basin. But no brigantine, no sailing vessel of any type. The young man's lips checked a cry that was half a sob of bitter disappointment. He had entered into the spirit of the chase heart and soul with an enthusiasm that was strange to him. When he came to look back upon the time, and to fail, even though failure had been discounted a hundredfold since the inception of his mad adventure, seemed hard, very hard. He sat down suddenly. "'She's gone,' he cried in a hollow gasp. The boatmen eased upon their oars, and old Bob stood up in the bows, scanning the riverscape with keen eyes shielded by a level palm. Young William drooped forward suddenly, head upon knees, and breathed convulsively. The boat drifted listlessly with the current. Old Bob panted. "'Don't see nothing, or air,' he resumed his seat. "'There's no hope, I suppose?' The elder waterman shook his head. "'Cart sigh. Might be round next bend. Might be passin' poor feet. Point is, me and young William ere can't do no more. And we as, we be wore out.' "'Yes,' Kirkwood assented, disconsolate. "'You've certainly earned your pay.' Then hope revived. He was very young in heart, you know. "'Can't you suggest something? I've got to catch that ship.' Old Bob wagged his head in slow negation. Young William lifted his. "'There's a railway runs by Woolrich,' he ventured. "'You might tyke trying and go to Sheerness, sir. You'd be positive a passenger if she didn't sile afore I died. Hire a boat at Sheerness and put out and look for her.' "'How far's Woolwich?' Kirkwood demanded instantly. "'Mile,' said the elder man. Tyke your for five bob extry. Done. Young William dashed the sweat from his eyes, wiped his palms on his hips, and fitted the sweeps again to the wooden tholes. Old Bob was as ready. With an inarticulate cry, they gave way. End of chapter 9 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 10 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 10 Desperate Measures. Old Bob seemed something inclined toward optimism, when the boat lay alongside a landing stage at Woolwich, and Kirkwood had clambered ashore. "'Here old me be Mike at, the waterman told him, with a weather-wise survey of the skies. "'Winds freshen from the easterns, and that'll old her back a bit, sir.' "'Arsk the why to the dockyard station,' young William volunteered. "'Tis the shortest walk, sir. I hopes you catches her.' Thank ye, sir. He caught dexterously the sovereign which Kirkwood, in ungrudging liberality, spared them of his store of two. The American nodded acknowledgments and adieu, with a faded smile deprecating his chances of winning the race, sorely handicapped as he was. He was very, very tired, and in his heart suspected that he would fail. But, if he did, he would at least be able to comfort himself that it was not for lack of trying. He set his teeth on that covenant, 
in grim determination. Either there was a strain of the bulldog latent in the Kirkwood breed, or else his infatuation gripped him more strongly than he guessed. Yet he suspected something of its power. He knew that this was altogether an insane proceeding, and that the lure that led him on was Dorothy Calendar. A strange dull light glowed in his weary eyes on the thought of her. He'd go through fire and water in her service. She was costing him dear, perhaps was to cost him dearer still, and perhaps there'd be for his guerdon no more than a thank you, Mr. Kirkwood, at the end of the passage. But that would be no less than his deserts. He was not to forget that he was interfering unwarrantably. The girl was in her father's hands, surely safe enough there, to the casual mind. If her partnership in her parents' fortunes were distasteful, she endured it passively, without complaint. He decided that it was his duty to remind himself, from time to time, that his main interest must be in the game itself, in the solution of the riddle. Whatever should befall, he must look for no reward for his gratuitous and self-appointed part. Indeed, he was all but successful in persuading himself that it was the fascination of adventure alone that drew him on. Whatever the lure, it was inexorable, instead of doing as a sensible person would have done, returning to London for a long rest in his hotel room, ere striving to retrieve his shattered fortunes, Philip Kirkwood turned up the village street, intent only to find the railway station and catch the first available train for Sheerness, where that an early one or a late. A hap-chance native, whom he presently encountered, furnished minute directions for reaching the dockyard station of the Southeastern and Chatham Railway, adding comfortable information to the effect that the next eastbound train would pass through in ten minutes. If Kirkwood would mend his pace, he could make it easily, with time to spare. Kirkwood mended his pace accordingly but, contrary to the prediction, had no time to spare at all. Even as he stormed the ticket grating, the train was thundering in at the platform. Therefore, a nervous ticket agent passed him out a first-class ticket instead of the third class he had asked for, and there was no time wherein to have the mistake rectified. Kirkwood planked down the fare, swore, and sprinted for the carriages. The first compartment, whose door he jerked violently open, proved to be occupied, and was, moreover, not a smoking car. He received a fleeting impression of a woman's startled eyes, staring into his own through a thin mesh of veiling, fell off the running board, slammed the door, and hurled himself towards the next compartment. Here, happier fortunes attended upon his desire. The box-like section was untenanted, and a notice blown upon the window glass announced that it was second-class smoking. Kirkwood promptly tumbled in, and when he turned to shut the door, the coaches were moving. A pipe helped him to bear up while the train was making its two other stops in the borough of Woolwich, a circumstance so maddening to a man in a hurry that it set Kirkwood's teeth on edge with sheer impatience, and made him long fervently for the land of his birth, where they do things differently where the board of directors of a railway company doesn't erect three substantial passenger depots in the course of a mile and a half of overgrown village. It consoled him little that none disputed with him his lonely possession of the compartment, that he had caught the sheerness train, or that he was really losing no time. A sense of deep dejection had settled down upon his consciousness, with a realization of how completely a fool's errand was this of his he felt foredoomed to failure he was never to see dorothy calendar again and his brain seemed numb with disappointment rattling and swaying the train left the town behind presently he put aside his pipe and stared blankly out at a reeling landscape the pleasant homely smiling countryside of kent a deeper melancholy tinted his mind dorothy calendar was forever lost to him the trucks drummed it out persistently, he thought vindictively. Lost, lost, forever lost. And he had made, was then making, a damned fool of himself. The trucks had no need to din that into his thick skull by their ceaseless iteration. He knew it, would not deny it. And it was all his own fault. He'd had his chance. Calendar had offered him it. 
if only he had closed with the fat adventurer. Before his eyes, field and coppice, hedge and homestead, stream and flowing highway, all blurred and ran streakily into one another, like a highly impressionistic watercolor. He could make neither head nor tail of the flying views, and so far as coherent thought was concerned, he could not put two ideas together. Without understanding distinctly, he presently did a more wise and wholesome thing, which was to topple limply over on the cushions and fall fast asleep. After a long time, he seemed to realize rather hazily that the carriage door had been opened to admit somebody. Its smart closing bang shocked him awake. He sat up, blinking in confusion, hardly conscious of more, to begin with, than that the train had paused and was again in full flight. Then, his senses clearing, he became aware that his solitary companion, just entered, was a woman. She was seated over across from him, her back to the engine, in an attitude which somehow suggested a highly nonchalant frame of mind. She laughed, and immediately her speaking voice was high and sweet in his hearing. "'Really, you know, Mr. Kirkwood, I simply couldn't contain my impatience another instant.' Kirkwood gasped and tried to recollect his wits. "'Beg pardon? I've been asleep,' he said stupidly. "'Yes. I'm sorry to have disturbed you, but, you know, you must make allowances for a woman's nerves.' Beneath his breath the bewildered man said, "'The deuce!' and above it, in a stupefied tone, "'Mrs. Hallam!' She nodded in a not unfriendly fashion, smiling brightly. "'Myself, Mr. Kirkwood!' Really, our predestined paths are badly tangled just now, aren't they? Were you surprised to find me in here with you? Come now, confess, you were. He remarked the smooth, girlish freshness of her cheeks, the sense and humor of her mouth, the veiled gleam of excitement in her eyes of the changing sea, and saw, as well, that she was dressed for traveling, sensibly, but with an air, and had brought a small handbag with her. "'Surprised and delighted,' he replied, recovering with mendacity, so intentional and obvious, that the woman laughed aloud. "'I knew you'd be. You see, I had the carriage ahead, the one you didn't take. I was so disappointed when you flung up to the door and away again. You didn't see me hanging half out the window to watch where you went, did you?' that's how i discovered that your discourtesy was unintentional that you hadn't recognized me by the fact that you took this compartment right behind my own she paused invitingly but kirkwood grown wary contented himself with picking up his pipe and carefully knocking out the dottle on the window ledge i was glad to see you she affirmed but only partly because you were you mr kirkwood the other and major part was because sight of you confirmed my own secret intuition. You see, I'm quite old enough and wise enough to question even my own intuitions. A woman wise enough for that is an adult prodigy, he ventured cautiously. It's experience and age. I insist upon the age. I, the mother of a grown-up boy. So I deliberately ran after you, changing when we stopped at Newington. You might have escaped me if I had waited until we got to Queensborough. Again she paused in open expectancy. Kirkwood, perplexed, put the pipe in his pocket and assumed a factitious look of resignation, regarding her askance with that whimsical twist of his eyebrows. For you are going to Queensborough, aren't you, Mr. Kirkwood? Queensborough? he echoed blankly, and in fact he was at a loss to follow her drift. "'No, Mrs. Hallam, I'm not bound there.' Her surprise was apparent. She made no effort to conceal it. "'But,' she faltered, "'if not there—' "'Give you my word, Mrs. Hallam, I have no intention whatever of going to Queensborough,' Kirkwood protested. "'I don't understand.' The nervous drumming of a patent leather-covered toe, visible beneath the hem of her dress, alone betrayed a rising tide of impatience.' then my intuition was at fault. In this instance, if it was at all concerned with my insignificant affairs, yes, most decidedly at fault. She shook her head, regarding him with grave suspicion. 
I hardly know whether to believe you. I think... Kirkwood's countenance displayed an added shade of red. After a moment, I mean no discourtesy, he began stiffly, but... But you don't care a farthing whether I believe you or not. He caught her laughing eye and smiled, the flush subsiding. Very well, then. Now, let us see. Where are you bound? Kirkwood looked out of the window. I'm convinced it's a rendezvous. Kirkwood smiled patiently at the landscape. Is Dorothy Calendar so very, very beautiful, Mr. Kirkwood? With a trace of malice. Ostentatiously, Kirkwood read the southeastern and Chatham's framed card of warning posted just above Mrs. Hallam's head to all such incurable lunatics as are possessed of a desire to travel on the running boards of railway carriages. "'You are going to meet her, aren't you?' He gracefully concealed a yawn. The woman's plan of attack took another form. "'Last night, when you told me your story, I believed you.' He devoted himself to suppressing the temptingly obvious retort, and succeeded, but, though he left it unspoken, the humor of it twitched the corners of his mouth, and Mrs. Hellam was observant, so that her next attempt to draw him out was edged with temper. "'I believe you an American, but a gentleman. It appears that, if you ever were the latter, you've fallen so low that you willingly cast your lot with thieves.' Having exhausted his repertoire of rudenesses, Kirkwood took to twiddling his thumbs. "'I want to ask you if you think it fair to me or my son to leave us in ignorance of the place where you are to meet the thieves who stole our—my son's—jewels.' "'Mrs. Hallam,' he said soberly, "'if I was going to meet Mr. Callender or Mr. Mulready, I have no assurance of that fact.' There was only the briefest of pauses, during which she analyzed this. Then, quickly, "'But you hope to?' she snapped. He felt that the only adequate retort to this would be a shrug of his shoulders, doubted his ability to carry one off, and again took refuge in silence. The woman abandoned a second plan of siege, with a readiness that did credit to her knowledge of mankind. She thought out the next very carefully— before opening with a masked battery. "'Mr. Kirkwood, can't we be friends, this aside?' "'Nothing could please me more, Mrs. Hallam.' "'I'm sorry if I've annoyed you, and I, too, have been rude. Last night, when you cut away so suddenly, you prevented my making you a proposal, a sort of business proposition.' "'Yes?' "'To come over to our side.' "'I thought so.' That was why I went. Yes, I understand. But this morning, when you've had time to think it over... I have no choice in the matter, Mrs. Hallam. The green eyes darkened ominously. You mean I am to understand, then, that you're against us, that you prefer to side with swindlers and scoundrels, all because of a... She discovered him eyeing her with a smile of such inscrutable and sardonic intelligence that the words died on her lips, and she crimsoned treasonably to herself, for he saw it, and the belief he had conceived while attending to her tissue of fabrication earlier that morning was strengthened to the point of conviction that, if anything had been stolen by anybody, Mrs. Hallam and her son owned it as little as Calendar. As for the woman... She felt she had steadily lost, rather than gained, ground, and the flash of anger that had colored her cheeks lit twin beacons in her eyes, which she resolutely fought down until they faded to mere gleams of resentment and determination. But she forgot to control her lips, and they are the truest indices to a woman's character and temperament and Kirkwood did not overlook the circumstance that their specious sweetness had vanished leaving them straight, set, and hard, quite the reverse of attractive. So, she said slowly, after a silent time, you are not for Queensborough. The corollary of that admission, Mr. Kirkwood, is that you are for sheerness. I believe, he replied wearily, that there are no other stations on this line after Newington. It follows, then, that, that I follow and in answer to his perturbed glance she added oh 
I'll grant that intuition is sometimes a poor guide, but if you meet George Callender, so shall I. Nothing can prevent that. You can't hinder me. Considerably amused, he chuckled. Let us talk of other things, Mrs. Hallam, he suggested pleasantly. How is your son? At this juncture, the brakes began to shriek and grind upon the wheels. The train slowed. It stopped, and the voice of a guard could be heard admonishing passengers for Queensborough Pier to alight and take the branch line. In the noise, the woman's response was drowned, and Kirkwood was hardly enough concerned for poor Freddy to repeat his question. When, after a little, the train pulled out of the junction, neither found reason to resume the conversation. During the brief balance of the journey, Mrs. Hallam presumably had food for thought. She frowned, pursed her lips, and, with one daintily gloved forefinger, followed a seam of her tailored skirt, while Kirkwood sat watching and wondering how to rid himself of her, if she proved really as troublesome as she threatened to be. Also, he wondered continually what it was all about. Why did Mrs. Hallam suspect him of designing to meet Callender at Queensborough? Had she any tangible ground for believing that Callender could be found in Queensboro? Presumably she had, since she was avowedly in pursuit of that gentleman, and Kirkwood, inferred, had booked for Queensboro. Was he, then, running away from Callender and his daughter, to chase a will-o'-the-wisp of his credulous fancy, off Sheerness Shore? Disturbing reflection. He scowled over it then considered the other side of the face, presuming Mrs. Hallam to have had reasonably dependable assurance that Calendar would stop in Queensboro, would she so readily have abandoned her design to catch him there, on the mere supposition that Kirkwood might be looking for him in sheerness. That did not seem likely to one who esteemed Mrs. Hallam's acumen as highly as Kirkwood did. He brightened up, forgot that his was a fool's errand, and began again to project strategic plans into a problematic future. A sudden jolt interrupted this pastime, and the warning screech of the brakes informed that he had no time to scheme, but had best continue on the plan of action that had brought him thus far. That is, trust to his star and accept what should befall without repining. He rose, opened the door, and holding it so, turned. I regret, Mrs. Hallam, he announced, smiling his crooked smile, that a pressing engagement is about to prohibit my squiring you through the ticket gates. You understand, I'm sure. His irrepressible humor provided infectious, and Mrs. Hallam's spirit ran as high as his own. She was smiling cheerfully when she, too, rose. I also am in some haste, she averred demurely, gathering up her handbag and umbrella. A raised platform shot in beside the carriage, and the speed was so sensibly moderated that the train seemed to be creeping rather than running. Kirkwood flung the door wide open and lowered himself to the running board. The end of the track was in sight, and a man who has been trained to board San Francisco cable cars fears to alight from no moving vehicle. He swung off, got his balance, and ran swiftly down the platform. A cry from a bystander caused him to glance over his shoulder. Mrs. Hallam was then in the act of alighting. As he looked, the flurry of skirts subsided, and she fell into stride, pursuing. Sleepy Sheerness must have been scandalized that day, and its gossips have acquired ground for many an uncharitable surmise. Kirkwood, however, was so fortunate as to gain the wicket before the employee there awoke to the situation. Otherwise, such is the temper of British petty officialdom, he might have detained the fugitive. As it was, Kirkwood surrendered his ticket and ran out into the street, with his luck still a dominant factor in the race. For, looking back, he saw that Mrs. Hallam had been held up at the gate, another victim of British red tape. Her ticket read for Queensborough. She was attempting to alight one station farther down the line, and while undoubtedly she was anxious to pay the excess fare, heaven alone knew when she would succeed in allaying the suspicions and resentment of the ticket-taker. "'That's good for ten minutes start,' Kirkwood crowed, and it never occurred to me. Before the station he found two hacks in waiting, 
with little to choose between them, neither was of a type that did not seem to advertise its pre-Victorian fashioning, and to neither was harnessed an animal that deserved anything but the epithet of screw. Kirkwood took the nearest for no other reason than because it was the nearest, and all but startled the driver off his box by offering double fare for a brisk pace and a simple service at the end of the ride. Succinctly he set forth his wants, jumped into the antiquated four-wheeler, and threw himself down upon musty, dusty cushions to hug himself over the joke and bless whatever English board of railway, directors it was, that first ordained that tickets should be taken up at the end instead of the outset of a journey. It was promptly made manifest that he had further cause for gratulation. The cabby, recovering from his amazement, was plying an indefatigable whip, and thereby eliciting a degree of speed from his superannuated nag. That his fare had by no means hoped for, much less anticipated. The cab rocked and racketed through Sheerness's streets at a pace which is believed to be unprecedented and unrivaled. Its passenger, dashed from side to side, had all he could do to keep from battering the vehicle to pieces with his head, while it was entirely out of the question to attempt to determine whether or not he was being pursued, he enjoyed it all hugely. In a period of time surprisingly short, he saw, from fleeting glimpses of the scenery, to be obtained through the reeling windows that they were threading the outskirts of the town. Synchronously, whether by design or through actual inability to maintain it, the speed was moderated and in the course of a few more minutes the cab stopped definitely. Kirkwood clambered painfully out, shook himself together and the bruises out of his bones, and looked fearfully back. Aside from a slowly settling cloud of dust, the road ran clear as far as he could see, to the point, in fact, where the town closed in about it. He had won, at all events in so much as to win meant eluding the persevering Mrs. Hallam, but to what end? Abstractedly, he tendered his lonely sovereign to the driver, and, without even looking at it, crammed the heavy weight of change into his pocket, an oversight which not only won him the awestruck admiration of the cabby, but entailed consequences, it may be, he little apprehended. It was with an absent-minded nod that he acquiesced in the man's announcement that he might arrange about the boat for him. Accordingly, the cabby disappeared, and Kirkwood continued to stare about him, eagerly, hopefully. He stood on the brink of the Thames estuary, there a possible five miles from shore to shore. From his feet, almost a broad shingle beach sloped gently to the water. On one hand, a dilapidated picket fence enclosed the dooryard of a fisherman's cottage, or better, hovel if it need be accurately described, at the door of which the cabby was knocking. The morning was now well advanced. The sun rode high, a sphere of tarnished flame in a void of silver gray, its thin cold radiance striking pallid sparks from the leaping crests of wind-whipped waves. In the east a wall of vapor, dull and lusterless, had taken body since the dawn, masking the skies and shutting down upon the sea like some vast curtain and out of the heart of this a bitter and vicious wind played like a sword. To the north, shoe-beriness loomed vaguely, like a low-drifted bank of cloud. Off to the right, the Nor lightship danced, a tiny fleck of warm crimson in a wilderness of slaty blue waters, plumed with a myriad of vanishing whitecaps. Up the shelving shore, small, puny wavelets dashed in impotent fury, and the shingle sang unceasingly its dreary, syncopated monotone. High and dry, a few dinghy boats lay canted wearily upon their broad, swelling sides. A couple of dories, apparently in daily use, a small sloop yacht, dismantled and plainly beyond repair, and an oyster smack also out of commission. About them, the beach was strewn with a litter of miscellany. Nets, oars, cork buoys, bits of wreckage and driftwood, a few fish too long forgotten, and, one assumed, responsible in part for the foreign wealth of the atmosphere. Some little distance offshore, a fishing boat, cat-rigged and not more than twenty feet overall, swung bobbing at her mooring. 
keen nose searching into the wind, at sight of which Kirkwood gave thanks, for his adventitious guide had served him well, if that boat were to be hired by any manner of persuasion. But it was to the farther reaches of the estuary that he gave more prolonged and most anxious heed, scanning narrowly what shipping was there to be seen. Far beyond the lightship, a liner was riding the waves with serene contempt, making for the river's mouth and Tilbury dock. Nearer in, a cargo boat was standing out upon the long trail, the white of riven waters showing clearly against her unclean freeboard. Out to east, a little covey of fishing smacks, red sails well reefed, were scudding before the wind like strange affrighted waterfowl, and bearing down past a heavy laden river barge. The latter, with tarpaulin battened snugly down over the cockpit, and the seas dashing over her washboard until she seemed under water half the time, was forging stodgily Londonwards, her bargee at the tiller smoking a placid pipe. But a single sailing vessel of any notable tonnage was in sight, and when he saw her, Kirkwood's heart became buoyant with hope, and he began to tremble with nervous eagerness, for he believed her to be the Alethea. There's no mistaking a ship's brigantine rigged for any other style of craft that sails the seas. From her position, when first he saw her, Kirkwood could have fancied she was tacking out of the mouth of the Medway, but he judged that, leaving the Thames's mouth, she had tacked to starboard until well nigh within hail of sheerness. Now, having presumably gone about, she was standing out toward the Nore, boring doggedly into the wind. He would have given a deal for glasses wherewith to read the name upon her bows, but was sensible of no hampering doubts, nor, had he harbored any, would they have deterred him. He had set his heart upon the winning of his venture, had come too far, risked far too much, to suffer anything now to stay his hand and stand between him and Dorothy Callender. Whatever the further risks and hazards, though he should take his life in his hands to win to her side, he would struggle on. He wrecked nothing of personal danger. A less selfish passion ran molten in his veins, moving him to madness. Fascinated, he fixed his gaze upon the reeling brigantine, and for a pace it was as if by longing he had projected his spirit to her slanting deck, and were there pleading his case with the mistress of his heart. Voices approaching brought him back to shore. He turned, resuming his mask of sanity, the better to confer with the owner of the cottage and boats, a heavy, keen-eyed fellow, ungracious and truculent of habit, and chary of his words, as he promptly demonstrated. "'I'll hire your boat,' Kirkwood told him, to put me aboard that brigantine off to leeward. We ought to start at once. The fisherman shifted his quid of tobacco from cheek to cheek, grunted inarticulately, and swung deliberately on his heel, displaying a bull neck above a pair of heavy shoulders. Dirty weather, he croaked, facing back from his survey of the eastern skies, before the American found out whether or not he should resent his insolence. How much? Kirkwood demanded curtly, annoyed. The man hesitated, scowling blackly at the heeling vessel, momentarily increasing her distance from shore. Then, with a crafty smile, two pounds, he declared. The American nodded. Very well, he agreed simply. Get out your boat. The fisherman turned away to shamble noisily over the shingle, huge booted heels crunching toward one of the dories. To this he set his shoulder, shoving it steadily down the beach until only the stern was dry. Kirkwood looked back, for the last time, up the road to Sheerness. Nothing moved upon it. He was rid of Mrs. Hallam, if face to face with the sterner problem. He had a few pence over ten shillings in his pocket, and had promised to pay the man four times as much. He would have agreed to ten times the sum demanded, for the boat he must and would have, but he had neglected to conclude his bargain, to come to an understanding as to the method of payment, and he felt more than a little dubious as to the reception the fisherman would give his proposition, sound as he, Kirkwood, knew it to be. In the background the cabby loitered, gnawed by insatiable curiosity. The fisherman turned, calling over his shoulder, 
If ye'd catch yon vessel, come. With one final twinge of doubt, the task of placating this surly dog was anything but inviting. The American strode to the boat and climbed in, taking the stern seat. The fisherman shoved off, wading out thigh-deep in the spiteful waves, then threw himself in over the gunwales and shipped the oars. Bows swinging offshore, rocking and dancing, the dory began to forge slowly toward the anchored boat. In their faces the wind beat gustily, and small, slapping waves, breaking against the sides, showered them with fine spray. In time, the dory lay alongside the cat-boat, the fisherman with a gnarled hand, grasping the latter's gunwale to hold the two together. With some difficulty, Kirkwood transhipped himself, landing a sprawl in the cockpit, amid a tangle of cordage slippery with scales. The skipper followed, with clumsy expertness, bringing the dory's painter with him and hitching it to a ring-bolt abaft the rudder head. Then, pausing an instant to stare into the east with somber eyes, he shipped the tiller and bent to the halyard. As the sail rattled up, flapping wildly, Kirkwood marked with relief, for it meant so much time saved that it was already close-reefed. But, when at least the boom was thrashing overhead, and the halyards had been made fast to their cleats, the fisherman again stood erect, peering distrustfully at the distant wall of clouds. Then, in two breaths, "'Can't do it,' he decided, "'not at the price.' "'Why?' Kirkwood stared despairingly after the brigantine that was already drawn far ahead. "'Danger!' growled the fellow. "'Wind!' At a loss completely, Kirkwood found no words. He dropped his head, considering. "'Not at the price,' the sullen voice iterated, and he looked up to find the cunning gaze upon him. "'How much, then?' Five pound I'll have, no less, for risking my life this day. Impossible! I haven't got it. In silence, the man unshipped the tiller and moved toward the cleats. Hold on a minute. Kirkwood unbuttoned his coat and, freeing the chain from his waistcoat buttonholes, removed his watch. As well abandon them altogether, he had designed to leave them as security for the two pounds, and had delayed stating the terms only for fear lest they be refused. Now, too late as ever, he recognized his error. But surely, he thought, it should be apparent, even to that low intelligence, that the timepiece alone was worth more than the boat itself. "'Will you take these?' he offered. "'Take and keep them. Only set me aboard that ship.' Deliberately, the fisherman weighed the watch and chain in his broad, hard palm, eyes narrowing to mere slits in his bronzed mask. "'How much?' he asked slowly. Eighty pounds, together. The chain alone cost me twenty. The shifty, covetous eyes ranged from the treasure in his hand to the threatening east. A puff of wind caught the sail and set the boom athwartships like a mighty flail. Both men ducked instinctively to escape a braining. "'How do I know?' objected the skipper. "'I'm telling you. If you've got eyes, you can see,' retorted Kirkwood savagely. Seeing that he had erred in telling the truth, the amount he had named was too great to be grasped at once by this crude, cupidous brain. "'How do I know?' the man repeated. Nevertheless, he dropped watch and chain into his pocket. Then, with a meaning grimace, extended again his horny, greedy palm. What? Hand over the two pound, and we'll go. I'll see you damned first. A flush of rage blinded the young man. The knowledge that the Alethea was minute by minute slipping beyond his reach seemed to madden him. White-lipped and ominously quiet, he rose from his seat on the combing as, without answer, the fisherman, crawling out on the overhand, began to haul in the dory. "'Ashore ye go,' he pronounced his ultimatum, motioning Kirkwood to enter the boat. The American turned, looking for the Alethea, or for the vessel that he believed bore that name. She was nearing the lightship when he found her, and as he looked a squall blurred the air between them, blotting the brigantine out with a smudge of rain. The effect was as if she had vanished, as if she were forever snatched from his grasp, and with Dorothy aboard her, heaven alone knew in what need of him. 
Mute and blind with despair and wrath, he turned upon the man and caught him by the collar, forcing him out over the lip of the overhang. They were unevenly matched. Kirkwood far the slighter, but strength came to him in the crisis, physical strength and address such as he had not dreamed was at his command. And the surprise of his onslaught proved an ally of unguessed potency. Before he himself knew it, he was standing on the overhang and had shifted his hold to seize the fellow about the waist. Then, lifting him clear of the deck and aided by a lurch of the cat boat, he cast him bodily into the dory. The man, falling, struck his head against one of the thwarts, a glancing blow that stunned him temporarily. Kirkwood himself dropped as if shot, a trailing reef point slapping his cheek until it stung as the boom thrashed overhead. It was as close a call as he had known. The knowledge sickened him a little. Without rising, he worked the painter loose and cast the dory adrift, then crawled back into the cockpit. No pang of compassion disturbed him as he abandoned the fisherman to the mercy of the sea. Though the fellow lay still, uncouthly distorted, in the bottom of the dory, he was in no danger. The wind and waves together would carry the boat ashore. For that matter, the man was even then recovering, struggling to sit up. Crouching to avoid the boom, Kirkwood went forward to the bows, and, grasping the mooring cable, drew it in, slipping back into the cockpit to get a stronger purchase with his feet. It was a struggle. The boat pulled sluggishly against the wind, the cable inching in jealously. And behind him he could hear a voice bellowing inarticulate menaces and knew that in another moment the fisherman would be at his oars. Frantically he tugged and tore at the slimy rope, hauling with a will and a prayer. It gave more readily, towards the end, but he seemed to have fought with it for ages when at last the anchor tripped and he got it in. Immediately he leaped back to the stern, fitted in the tiller, and, seizing the main sheet, drew the boom in till the wind should catch in the canvas. In the dory, the skipper, bending at his oars, was not two yards astern. He was hard aboard when, the sail filling with a bang, Kirkwood pulled the tiller up, and the catboat slid away, a dozen feet separating them in a breath. A yell of rage boomed down the wind, but he paid no heed, careless alike of the dangers he had passed and those that yawned before him. He trimmed the sheet and stood away on the port tack, leading directly for the Nor Lightship. End of chapter 10. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter 11 of the Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 11. Off the Nore. Kirkwood's anger cooled apace. At worst, it had been a flare of passion, incandescent. It was seldom more. His brain clearing, the temperature of his judgment quickly regained its mean, and he saw his chances without distortion, weighed them without exaggeration. Leaning against the combing, feet braced upon the slippery and treacherous deck, he clung to tiller and mainsheet and peered ahead with anxious eyes, a pucker of daring graven deep between his brows. A mile to westward, three or more ahead, he could see the brigantine standing close in under the Essex shore. At times she was invisible. Again he could catch merely the glint of her canvas, white against the dark loom of the littoral, toned by a mist of flying spindrift. He strained his eyes, watching for the chance which would take place in the rake of her masts and sails, when she should come about. For the longer that maneuver was deferred, the better was his chance of attaining his object. It was a forlorn hope. But in time, the brigantine, to escape Maplin Sands, would be forced to tack and stand out past the lightship, the wind off her port bows. Then their courses would intersect. 
it remained to be demonstrated whether the cat-boat was speedy enough to arrive at the point of contact in advance of or simultaneously with the larger vessel every minute that the putative alethea put off coming about brought the cat-boat nearer that goal but kirkwood could do no more than hope and try to trust in the fisherman's implied admission that it could be done it was all in the boat and the way she handled he watched her anxiously quick to approve her merits as she displayed them he had sailed small craft before frail centerboard cat boats handy and swift built to serve in summer winds and protected waters never such as one as this yet he liked her deep bosomed she was with no centerboard dependent on her draught and heavy keel to hold her on the wind stanch and seaworthy sheathed with stout plank and ribbed with seasoned timber designed to keep afloat in the wickedest weather brewed by the foul-tempered german ocean with all her lines were fine and clean for all her beam she was calculated to nose narrowly into the wind and make a pretty pace as well a good boat he had the grace to give the credit to his luck her disposition was more fully disclosed as they drew away from the beach. In shore, with shoaling water, the waves had been choppy and spiteful, but lacking force of weight. Farther out, as the bottom fell away, the rollers became more uniform and powerful. Heavy sweeping seas met the catboat. From their hollows, looming mountainous to the man in the tiny cockpit, who was nevertheless aware that to a steamer they would be negligible. His boat breasted them gallantly, toiling sturdily up the steep acclivities, poising breathlessly on foam-crested summits for dizzy instants, then plunging headlong down the deep green swales, and left a boiling wake behind her, urging her onward, hugging the wind in her wisp of blood-red sail, and boring into it, pulling at the tiller with the metal of a racehorse slugging at the bit. Offshore, too, the wind stormed with added strength, or possibly had freshened. For minutes on end, the leeward gunwales would run green, and now and again the screaming, pelting squalls that scoured the estuary would heel her over until the water cascaded in over the lee combing, and the rudder, lifted clear, would hang idle until, smitten by some racing billow, the tiller would be all but torn from Kirkwood's hands. Again and again this happened, and those were times of trembling. But always the cat-boat righted, shaking the clinging waters from her and swinging her stem into the wind again, and there would follow an abbreviated breathing spell during which Kirkwood was at liberty to dash the salt spray from his eyes and search the wind-harried waste for the brigantine. Sometimes he found her, sometimes not. Long after he had expected her to, she went about, and they began to close in upon each other. He could see that even with shortened canvas she was staggering drunkenly under the fierce impacts of the wind. For himself it was nip and tuck, now, and no man in his normal sense would have risked a sixpence on the boat's chance to live until she crossed the brigandine's bows. Time out of reckoning, he was forced to kneel in the swimming cockpit steering with one hand, using the bailing dish with the other, and keeping his eyes religiously turned to the bellying patch of sail. It was heartbreaking toil. He began reluctantly to concede that it could not last much longer. And if he missed the brigantine, he would be lost. Mortal strength was not enough to stand the unending strain upon every bone, muscle, and sinew required to keep the boat upon her course, though for a time it might cope with and solve the problems presented by each new malignant billow and each furious howling squall the end inevitably must be failure to struggle on would be but to postpone the certain end save and accept the possibility of his gaining the brigantine within the period of time strictly and briefly limited by his powers of endurance Long since he had become numb with cold from incessant drenchings of icy spray that piled in over the windward counter, keeping the bottom ankle deep regardless of his laborious but intermittent efforts with the bailing dish, and the two, brigantine and cockle-shell, were drawing together with appalling deliberation. 
A dozen times he was on the point of surrender, as often plucked up hope, as the minutes wore on and he kept above water, he began to believe that if he could stick it out, his judgment and seamanship would be justified, though human ingenuity backed by generosity could by no means contrive adequate excuse for his foolhardiness. But that was aside, something irreparable, wan and grim, he fought it out. But that his voice stuck in his parched throat, he could have shouted in his elation, when, eventually, he gained the point of intersection an eighth of a mile ahead of the brigantine, and got sight of her windward freeboard, as, most slowly, the catboat forged across her course. For all that, the moment of his actual triumph was not yet. He had still to carry off successfully a scheme that, for sheer audacity of conception and contempt for danger, transcended all that had gone before. Holding the catboat on for a time, he brought her about handsomely a little way beyond the brigantine's course, and hung in the eye of the wind, the leech flapping and tightening with reports like rifle shots, and the water sloshing about his calves, bailing dish now altogether out of mind, while he watched the oncoming vessel, his eyes glistening with anticipation. She was footing it smartly, the brigantine, lying down to it and snoring into the wind. Beneath her stem waves broke in snow-white showers, whiter than the canvas of her bulging jib, broke, and, gnashing their teeth in impotent fury, swirled and eddied down her sleek, dark flanks. Bobbing, curtsying, she plunged onward, shortening the interval with mighty, leaping bounds. On her bows, with each instant, the golden letters of her name grew larger and more legible, until Alethea! He could read it plain beyond dispute. Joy welled in his heart. He forgot all that he had undergone in the prospect of what he proposed still to do in the name of the only woman the world held for him. Unquestioning, he had come thus far in her service. Unquestioning, by her side, he was prepared to go still farther, though all humanity should single her out with accusing fingers. They were watching him aboard the brigantine. He could see a line of heads above her windward rail. Perhaps she was of their number. He waved an audacious hand. Someone replied, a great shout shattering itself unintelligibly against the gale. He neither understood nor attempted to reply. His every faculty was concentrated on the supreme moment now at hand. Calculating the instant to a nicety, he paid off the sheet and pulled up the tiller. The catboat pivoted on her heel. With a crack, her sail flapped full and rigid. Then, with the untempered might of the wind behind her, she shot like an arrow under the brigantine's bows so close that the bowsprit of the ladder first threatened to impale the sail, next the bows plunging, crashing down a bare two feet behind the catboat's stern. Working in a frenzy of haste, Kirkwood jammed the tiller hard a lee, bringing the cat about, and, trimming the main sheet as best he might, found himself racing under the brigantine's leeward quarter, water pouring in generously over the cats. Luffing, he edged nearer, handling his craft as though intending to ram the larger vessel, foot by foot shortening the little interval. When it was four feet, he would risk the jump. He crawled out on the overhang, crouching on his toes, one hand light upon the tiller, the other touching the deck. Ready, ready! Abruptly, the Alethea shut off the wind, and sail flattened and the cat dropped back. In a second, the distance had doubled. In anguish, Kirkwood uttered an exceeding bitter cry. Already he was falling far off her counter. A shout reached him. He was dimly conscious of a dark object hurtling through the air. Into the cockpit, splashing, something dropped. A coil of rope. He fell forward upon it, into water eighteen inches deep, and for the first time he realized that, but for that line, he had gone to his drowning in another minute. The cat was sinking. As he scrambled to his feet, clutching the lifeline, a heavy wave washed over the waterlogged craft and left it all but submerged, and a smart tug on the rope added point to the advice which, reaching his ears in a bellow like a bull's, penetrated the panic of his wits. Jump! Jump, you fool! In an instant of coherence, he saw that the brigantine was luffing. 
nonetheless much of the line had already been paid out and there was no reckoning when the end would be reached without time to make it fast he hitched it twice round his waist and chest once round an arm and grasping it above his head to ease its constriction when the tug should come leaping on the combing and overboard a green roaring avalanche swept down upon him and the luckless catboat overwhelming both simultaneously the agony that was his during the next few minutes can by no means be exaggerated with such crises the human mind is not fitted adequately to cope it retains no record of the supreme moment beyond a vague and incoherent impression of poignant soul-racking suffering kirkwood underwent a prolonged interval of semi-sentience his mind dominated and oppressed by a deathly fear of drowning and a deadening sense of suffocation with attendant tortures as of being broken on the wheel limb rending from limb of compression of his ribs that threatened momentarily to crush in his chest of a world a welter with dim swirling green half-lights alternating with flashes of blinding white of thunderings in his ears like salvos from a thousand cannon and his senses were blotted out in blackness then he was breathing once more the keen clean air stabbing his lungs the while he swam unsupported in an ethereal void of brilliance his mouth was full of something that burned a liquid hot acrid and stinging he gulped swallowed slobbered choked coughed attempted to sit up was aware that he was the focal point of a ring of glaring burning eyes like eyes of ravening beasts and fainted his next conscious impression was of standing up supported by friendly arms on either side while somebody was asking him if he could walk a step or two he lifted his head and let it fall in token of assent mumbling a yes and looked round him with eyes wherein the light of intelligence burned more clear with every second by degrees he catalogued and comprehended his weirdly altered circumstances and surroundings he was partly seated partly held up on the edge of the cabin skylight an object of interest to some half dozen men seafaring fellows all by their habit clustered round between him and the windward rail of their number one stood directly before him dwarfing his companions as much by his air of command as by his uncommon height tall thin-faced and sallow with hollow weather-worn cheeks a mouth like a crooked gash from ear to ear and eyes like dying coals with which he looked the rescued up and down in one grim semi-humorous semi-speculative glance in hands both huge and red he fondled tenderly a squat brandy flask whose contents had apparently been employed as a first aid to the drowning as kirkwood's gaze encountered his the man smiled sourly jerking his head to one side with a singularly derisive air hi matey he bustered how goes it now feel it appier eh some thank you more like a drowned rat Kirkwood eyed him sheepishly. "'I suppose you're the man who threw me that line? I'll have to wait till my head clears up before I can thank you properly.' "'Don't mention it!' He of the lantern jaws stowed the bottle away with jealous care in one of his immense coat pockets, and seized Kirkwood's hand in a grasp that made the young man wince. "'You're safe enough now. My name's Stryker, Captain William Stryker. "'What's the row?' "'Looking for a friend?' he demanded suddenly, as Kirkwood's attention wandered. For the memory of the errand that had brought him into the hands of Captain William Stryker had come to the young man very suddenly, and his eager eyes were swiftly roving not along the decks but the wide world besides, for sight or sign of his heart's desire. After luffing to pick him up, the brigantine had been again pulled off on the port tack. The fury of the gale seemed rather to have waxed than waned, and the Alethea was bending low under the relentless fury of its blasts, driving hard, with leeward channels awash. Under her port counter, a mile away, the crimson lightship wallowed in a riot of breaking combers. Sheerness lay abeam, five miles or more. Ahead, the northeast headland of the Isle of Chapri was bulking large and near. The catboat had vanished. 
More important still, no one aboard the brigantine resembled in the remotest degree either of the calendars, father or daughter, or even Mulready, the black avised. I sigh. Are you looking for someone you know? Yes, your passengers. I presume they're below? Passengers? A hush fell upon the group, during which Kirkwood sought Stryker's eye in pitiful pleading, and Stryker looked round him blankly. "'Where's Miss Calendar? the young man demanded sharply. "'I must see her at once.' The keen and deep-set eyes of the skipper clouded as they returned to Kirkwood's perturbed countenance. "'What are you talking about?' he demanded brusquely. "'I must see Miss Calendar, or Calendar himself, or Mulready.' Kirkwood paused, and, getting no reply, grew restive under Stryker's inscrutable regard. "'That's why I came aboard,' he amended, blind to the absurdity of the statement, "'to see, uh, Calendar. "'Well, I'm damned.' Stryker managed to infuse into his tone a deal of suspicious contempt. "'Why?' insisted Kirkwood, nettled but still uncomprehending. Do you mean to tell me you came off from wherever in L you did come from, intended to board this vessel and find a party named Calendar? Certainly I did. Why? Well, cried Mr. Stryker, rubbing his hands together with an air oppressively obsequious, I'm sorry to hinform you you've come to the wrong shop, sir. We don't stock no Calendars. We're in the hardware line, we are. You might try next door, or, I dis say, you'll find what you want at the stationer's, round the corner. A giggle from his audience stimulated him. If, he continued acidly, I'd a guessed you was such a damn fool, blimey, if I would have let you drowned. Staggered, Kirkwood bore his sarcastic truculence without resentment. Calendar, he stammered, trying to explain, Calendar said— I can't help what Calendar said. Maybe he did make an engagement with you, and you've gone and went a forgot the diet. Maybe it's last year's Calendar you're thinking of. You, Johnny, to a lout of a boy in the group of seamen, you run and fetch this gentleman Whitaker's for nineteen six. Look sharp now. But, with an effort, Kirkwood mustered up a show of dignity. Am I to understand— he said as calmly as he could, that you deny knowing George B. Calendar and his daughter Dorothy, and I don't have to. Listen to me, young man. For the time, the fellow discarded his clumsy facetiousness. I'm William Stryker, Captain Stryker, master and arf owner of this wessel, and what I says here is law. We don't carry no passengers. Do you understand me? Aggressively. There ain't no pusson named Colindar aboard the Alethea, and never was, and never will be. What name did you say? Kirkwood inquired. The ship? The Alethea, registered from Liverpool, bound from London to Hantwerp in cargo. Anything else? Kirkwood shook his head, turning to scan the seascape with a gloomy gaze. As he did so, and remarked how close upon the Sheppey headland the brigantine had drawn, the order was given to go about. For the moment he was left alone, wretchedly wet, shivering, wan, and shrunken visibly, with the knowledge that he had dared greatly for nothing. But for the necessity of keeping up before Stryker and his crew, the young man felt that he could gladly have broken down and wept for sheer vexation and disappointment. Smartly, the brigantine luffed and wore about, heeling deep as she spun away on the starboard tack. Kirkwood staggered round the skylight to the windward rail. From this position, looking forward, he could see that they were heading for the open sea. Foulness low over the port quarter, not before him, but a brawling waste of leaden green and dirty white. Far out, one of the side-wheel boats of the Queensborough antwerp line was heading directly into the wind and making heavy weather of it. Some little a while later, Stryker again approached him, perhaps swayed by an unaccustomed impulse of compassion, which, however, he artfully concealed. 
blandly ironic, returning to his impersonation of the shopkeeper. "'Nothing else we can show you, sir?' he inquired. "'I presume you couldn't put me ashore,' Kirkwood replied ingenuously. In supreme disgust, the captain showed him his back. "'Ere, you!' he called to one of the crew. "'Tyke this, oh ye. Tyke him below and put him to bed. Give him a drink and dry his clothes. Maybe he'll be better when he wikes up. He don't talk sense now, that's sure. If you ask me, I sigh he's balmy and no ope for him. End of chapter 11 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 12 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 12 Picaresque Passages Contradictory to the hopeful prognosis of Captain Stryker, his unaccredited passenger was not better when, after a period of oblivious rest indefinite in duration, he awoke. His subsequent assumption of listless resignation, of pacific acquiescence in the dictates of his destiny, was purely deceptive. Thin ice of despair over profound depths of exasperated rebellion. Blank darkness enveloped him, when first he opened eyes to wonder. Then, gradually, as he stared, piecing together unassorted memories and striving to quicken drowsy wits, he became aware of a glimmer that waxed and waned, a bar of pale bluish light striking across the gloom above his couch, and, by dint of puzzling, divined that this had access by a port. Turning his head upon a stiff and unyielding pillow, he could discern a streak of saffron light lining the sill of a doorway near by his side. The one phenomenon taken with the other confirmed a theretofore somewhat hazy impression that his dreams were dignified by a foundation of fact, that, in brief, he was occupying a cabin bunk aboard the good ship Alethea. Overhead, on the deck, a heavy thumping of hurrying feet awoke him to keener perceptiveness, Judging from the incessant rolling and pitching of the brigantine, the crashing thunder of seas upon her sides, the eldritch shrieking of the gale, as well as from the chorused groans and plaints of each individual bolt and timber in the frail fabric that housed his fortunes, the wind had strengthened materially during the hours of forgetfulness, however many the latter might have been. He believed, however, that he had slept long, deeply, and exhaustively. He felt now a little emaciated mentally, and somewhat absent-bodied. So he put it to himself. A numb languor, not unpleasant, held him passively supine, the while he gave himself over to speculative thought. A wild night, certainly, probably. By that time, the little vessel was in the middle of the North Sea, bound for Antwerp. "'Oh!' said Kirkwood vindictively. "'Hell!' So he was bound for Antwerp. The first color of resentment ebbing from his thoughts left him rather interested than excited by the prospect. He found that he was neither pleased nor displeased. He presumed that it would be no more difficult to raise money on personal belongings in Antwerp than anywhere else. It has been observed that the first flower of civilization is the rum blossom. The next the conventionalized fleur-de-lis of the money-lender. There would be pawn-shops, then, in Antwerp, and Kirkwood was confident that the sale or pledge of his signet ring, scarf-pin, match-box, and cigar-case would provide him with money enough for a return to London, by third class at the worst. There, well, all events were on the knees of the gods. He'd squirm out of his troubles somehow. As for the other matter, the calendar affair, he presumed he was well rid of it, with a sigh of regret. It had been a most enticing mystery, you know, and the woman in the case was extraordinary, to say the least. The memory of Dorothy Calendar made him sigh again, this time more violently, 
a sigh that was own brother to, or at any rate descended in a direct line from, the furnace sigh of the lover described by the melancholy Jacques. And he sat up, bumped his head, groped round until his hand fell upon a doorknob, opened the door, and looked out into the blousy emptiness of the ship's cabin proper, whose gloomy confines were made visible only by the rays of a dingy and smoky lamp swinging violently in gimbals from a deck-beam. Kirkwood's clothing, now rough-dried and warped wretchedly out of shape, had been thrown carelessly on a transom near the door. He got up, collected them, and, returning to his berth, dressed at leisure, thinking heavily, disgruntled, in a humor as evil as the aftertaste of a bad brandy in his mouth. When dressed, he went out into the cabin, closing the door upon his berth, and, for lack of anything better to do, seated himself on the thwartship's transom, against the forward bulkhead, behind the table. Above his head, a chronometer ticked steadily and loudly, and, being consulted, told him that the time of day was twenty minutes to four, which meant that he had slept away some eighteen or twenty hours. That was a solid spell of a rest, when he came to think of it, even allowing that he had been unusually and pardonably fatigued when conducted to his berth. He felt stronger now, and bright enough, and enormously hungry into the bargain. Abstractedly, heedless of the fact that his tobacco would be water-soaked and ruined, he fumbled in his pockets for pipe and pouch, thinking to soothe the pangs of hunger against breakfast time, which was probably two hours and a quarter ahead. But his pockets were empty, every one of them. He assimilated this discovery in patience, and cast an eye about the room to locate, if possible, the missing property. But naught of his was visible so he rose and began a more painstaking search. The cabin was at once tiny, low-sealed, and depressingly gloomy. Its furniture consisted entirely in a chair or two, supplementing the transoms and lockers as resting places, and a center table covered with a cloth of turkey red, whose original aggressiveness had been darkly moderated by libations of liquids, principally black coffee, and burnt offerings of grease and tobacco ash. Aside from the companionway to the deck, four doors opened into the room, two probably giving upon the captain's and the mate's quarters, the others on pseudo-staterooms, one of which he had just vacated, closets large enough to contain a small bunk and naught beside. The bulkheads and partitions were badly broken out with a rash of pictures from illustrated papers, mostly offensive. Kirkwood was interested to read a half-column clipping from a New York yellow journal descriptive of the antics of a drunken British sailor who had somehow found his way to the barroom of the Fifth Avenue Hotel, the paragraph exploiting the fact that it had required four policemen, in addition to the corps of porters to subdue him, was strongly underscored in red ink and the news story wound up with the information that in police court the man had given his name as William Stranger, and cheerfully had paid a fine of ten dollars, alleging his entertainment to have been cheap at the price. While Kirkwood was employed in perusing the illuminating anecdote, eight bells sounded, and from the commotion overhead the watch changed. A little later the companionway door slammed open and shut, and Captain Stryker, or stranger, whichever you please, fell down rather than descended the steps. Without attention to the American, he rolled into the mate's room and roused that personage. Kirkwood heard that the name of the second-in-command was Obbs, as well as that he occupied the starboard stateroom aft. After a brief exchange of comment and instruction, Mr. Obbs appeared in the shape of a walking pillar of oilskins, capped by a sou'wester, and went on deck. Stryker followed him out of the stateroom, shed his own oilers in a clammy heap upon the floor, opened a locker from which he brought forth a bottle and a dirty glass, and, turning toward the table, for the first time became sensible of Kirkwood's presence. "'Oh, there you are, eh? Little bright eyes!' he exclaimed with surprised animation. "'Good morning, Captain Stryker,' said Kirkwood, rising. "'I want to tell you—' But Stryker waved one great red paw impatiently. 
with the effect of sweeping aside and casting into the discard Kirkwood's intended speech of thanks, nor would he hear him further. "'Did you have a nice little nap?' he interrupted. "'Come up bright and smiling, eh? Now I guess.' The emphasis made it clear that the captain believed himself to be employing an Americanism, and so successful was he in his own esteem that he could not resist the temptation to improve upon the imitation. "'Now, I guess you're about right ready, bain't ye, to have a drink, sonny?' "'No, thank you,' said Kirkwood, smiling tolerantly. "'I've got any amount of appetite.' "'Have you now?' Stryker dropped his mimicry and glanced at the clock. Breakfast, he announced, will be served in the mine dining saloon at 8 a.m. Passengers is requested not to be light at table. Depositing the bottle on the said table, the captain searched until he found another glass for Kirkwood and sat down. Do you good, he insinuated, pushing the bottle gently over. No, thank you, reiterated Kirkwood shortly, a little annoyed. Stryker seized his own glass, poured out a strong man's dose of the fiery concoction, gulped it down, and sighed. Then, with a glance at the American's woe-begone countenance, Kirkwood was contemplating a four-hour wait for breakfast, and, consequently, looking as if he had lost his last friend, the captain bent over, placing both hands palm down before him, and whacking his head earnestly. "'Please!' he implored. Please don't let me interrupt, and filled his pipe, pretending a pensive detachment from his company. The fumes of burning shag sharpened the tooth of desire. Kirkwood stood it as long as he could, then surrendered with an, If you've got any more of that tobacco, Captain, I'd be glad of a pipe. An intensely contemplative expression crept into the Captain's small blue eyes. "'I only got one other piper of this ere backy,' he announced at length. "'And I can't get no more till I get some ome. "'I simply couldn't part with it hunder arf a quid.' Kirkwood settled back with a hopeless lift of his shoulders. Abstractedly, Stryker puffed the smoke his way until he could endure the deprivation no longer. "'I had about ten shillings in my pocket when I came aboard, Captain, and—' a few other articles. Oh, yes, so you add, now you mention it. Stryker rose, ambled into his room, and returned with Kirkwood's possessions and a fresh paper of shag. While the young man was tastily filling, lighting, and inhaling the first strangling but delectable whiff, the captain solemnly counted into his own palm all the loose change except three large pennies. The latter he shoved over to Kirkwood, in company with a miscellaneous assortment of articles, which the American picked up, piece by piece, and began to bestow upon his clothing. When through, he sat back, troubled and disgusted. Stryker met his regard blandly. "'Anything I can do?' he inquired, in suave concern. "'Why, there was a black pearl scarf-pin.' "'Why don't you remember? You gave that to me.' count of me avin saved your life twas me throwed you that line you know oh commented kirkwood briefly the pin had been among the most valuable and cherished of his belongings yes nodded the captain in reminiscence you don't remember likely twas the brandy singin in your ed you pushes it into my ands almost weepin you was and says says you stryker you says tyke this in triflin' token of my gratitude. i wouldn't insult you you says by offerin you money but this i can insist on your acceptin and no refusal says you oh repeated kirkwood if i for an instant thought you wasn't sober when you done it but no you're a gent if there ever was one and i'm not the man to offend you Oh, indeed. The captain let the implication pass, perhaps on the consideration that he could afford to ignore it, and said no more. The pause held for several minutes, Kirkwood having fallen into a mood of grave distraction. Finally, Captain Stryker thoughtfully measured out a second drink, limited only by the capacity of the tumbler, engulfed it noisily, and got up. 
"'Guess I'll be turnin' in,' he volunteered affably, yawning and stretching. "'I was about to ask you to do me a service,' began Kirkwood. "'Yes?' with a rising inflection of mockery. Kirkwood quietly produced his cigar case, a gold matchbox, gold card case, and slipped a signet ring from his finger. "'Will you buy these?' he asked. "'Or will you lend me five pounds and hold them as security?' Stryker examined the collection with exaggerated interest, strongly tinctured with mistrust. "'I'll buy em, he offered eventually, looking up. "'That's kind of you. Ow, oh, they ain't much use to me, but Bill Stryker's allus willin' to accommodate a friend. Four quid, you said? Five. They ain't worth over four to me. "'Very well, make it four, Kirkwood assented contemptuously. The captain swept the articles into one capacious fist, pivoted on one heel at the peril of his neck, and lumbered unsteadily off to his room. Pausing at the door, he turned back in inquiry. "'I say, how did you come to get the impression there was a party named Almanac aboard this vessel?' "'Calendar. Have it your own why,' Stryker conceded gracefully. "'There isn't, is there? You heard me.' Then, said Kirkwood sweetly, I'm sure you wouldn't be interested. The captain pondered this at leisure. You seemed pretty keen about seeing him, he remarked conclusively. I was. Seems to me I did ear the name somewheres afore. The captain appeared to wrestle with an obdurate memory. Oh, he triumphed, I know. He was a chap up Manchester, why? Keeper in a lunatic asylum, he was. "'That your party?' "'No,' said Kirkwood, wearily. "'I didn't know, but maybe twas. "'Scuse me. "'Thought as how maybe you'd escaped from his tender care, "'but finding the world cold, changed your mind and wanted to go back.' "'Without waiting for a reply, he lurched into his room and banged the door, too.' Kirkwood, divided between amusement and irritation, heard him stumbling about for some time, and then a hush fell, grateful enough while it lasted, which was not long. For no sooner did the captain sleep than a penetrating snore added itself into the cacophony of waves and wind and tortured ship. Kirkwood, comforted at first by the blessed tobacco, lapsed insensibly into dreary meditations. Coming after the swift movement and sustained excitement of the eighteen hours preceding his long sleep, the monotony of shipboard confinement seemed irksome to a maddening degree. There was absolutely nothing he could discover to occupy his mind. If there were books aboard, none was in evidence. Beyond the report of Mr. Stranger's Manhattan Nights Entertainment, the walls were devoid of reading matter and a round of the picture gallery proved a diversion weariful enough when not purely revolting wherefore mr kirkwood stretched himself out on the transom and smoked and reviewed his adventures in detail and seriatim and was by turns indignant sore anxious on his own account as well as on dorothy's and out of all patience with himself mystified he remained throughout and the edge of his curiosity held as keen as ever you may believe. Consistently, the affair presented itself to his fancy in the guise of a puzzle picture, which, though you study it ever so diligently, remains incomprehensible until by chance you view it from an unexpected angle when it reveals itself intelligibly. It had not yet been his good fortune to see it from the right viewpoint. To hold the metaphor, he walked endless circles round it, patiently seeking, but never failing to find the proper perspective. Each incident, however insignificant, in connection with it, he handled over and over, examining its every facet, bright or dull, as an expert might inspect a clever imitation of a diamond. And, like a perfect imitation, it defied analysis. Of one or two things he was convinced. For one, that Stryker was a liar worthy of classification with Calendar and Mrs. Hallam. Kirkwood had not only the testimony of his sense to assure him that the ship's name, Alethea, not a common one, by the by, had been mentioned by both Calendar and Mulready during their altercation on Bermondsey Old Stairs, but he had the confirmatory 
testimony of the sleepy waterman, William, who had directed old Bob and young William to the anchorage off Bow Creek. That there should have been two vessels of the same unusual name at one and the same time in the port of London was a coincidence too preposterous altogether to find place in his calculations. His second impregnable conclusion was that those whom he sought hard boarded the Althea, but had left her before she tripped her anchor. That they were not stowed away aboard her seemed unquestionable. The brigantine was hardly large enough for the presence of three persons aboard her to be long kept a secret from an inquisitive fourth, unless, indeed, they lay in hiding in the hold, for which, once the ship got under way, there could be scant excuse. And Kirkwood did not believe himself a person of sufficient importance in Calendar's eyes to make that worthy endure the discomforts of a tween deck's imprisonment throughout the voyage, even to escape recognition. With every second, then, he was traveling farther from her to whose aid he had rushed, impelled by motives so hot-headed, so innately chivalric, so unthinkingly gallant, so exceptionally idiotic. Idiot! Kirkwood groaned with despair of his inability to fathom the abyss of his self-contempt. There seemed to be positively no excuse for him. Stryker had befriended him indeed, had he permitted him to drown yet he had acted for the best as he saw it the fault lay in himself an admirable fault that of harboring and nurturing generous and compassionate instincts but of course kirkwood couldn't see it that way what else could i do he defended himself against the indictment of common sense i couldn't leave her to the mercies of that set of rogues and heaven knows i was given every reason to believe she would be aboard this ship why, she herself told me that she was sailing. Heaven knew, too, that this folly of his had cost him a pretty penny, first and last. His watch was gone beyond recovery, his homeward passage forfeited. He no longer harbored illusions as to the steamship company presenting him with another berth in lieu of that called for by that water-soaked slip of paper then in his pocket, courtesy of Stryker. He had sold for a pittance, a tithe of its value, his personal jewelry, and had spent every penny he could call his own. With the money Stryker was to give him, he would be able to get back to London and his third-rate hostelry, but not without enough over to pay that one week's room rent, or— Oh, the devil! he groaned, head in hands. The future loomed wrapped in unspeakable darkness, lightened by no least ray of hope, it had been bad enough to lose a comfortable living through a gigantic convulsion of nature but to think that he had lost all else through his own egregious folly to find himself reduced to the kennels so care found him again in those weary hours came and sat by his side slipping a grisly hand in his and tightening its grip until he could have cried out with the torment of it the while whispering insidiously subtle evil things in his ear and he had not even hoped to comfort him. At any previous stage he had been able to distill a sort of bitter-sweet satisfaction from the thought that he was suffering for the love of his life. But now, now Dorothy was lost, gone like the glamour of romance in the searching light of day. Stryker, emerging from his room for breakfast, found the passenger with a hostile look in his eye and a jaw set in ugly fashion. His eyes, too, were the abiding place of smoldering devils, and the captain, recognizing them, considerately forbore to stir them up with any untimely pleasantries. To be sure, he was autocrat in his own ship, and Kirkwood's standing aboard was nil. But then there was just enough yellow in the complexion of Stryker's soul to incline him to sidestep trouble whenever feasible. And, besides, he entertained dark suspicions of his guest suspicions he scarce dared voice even to his inmost heart the morning meal therefore passed off in constrained silence the captain ate voraciously and vociferously pushing back his chair and went on deck to relieve the mate the latter a stunted little cockney with a wizened countenance and a mind as foul as his tongue got small change of his attempts to engage the passenger in conversation on topics that he considered fit for discussion after the sixth or eighth snubbing, he rose in dudgeon, 
discharged a poisonous bit of insolence, and retired to his berth, leaving Kirkwood to finish his breakfast in peace, which the latter did literally, to the last visible scrap of food and the ultimate drop of coffee, poor as both were in quality. To the tune of a moderating wind, the morning wearied away. Kirkwood went on deck once, for distraction from the intolerable monotony of it all, got a sound drenching of spray, with a glimpse of a dark line on the eastern horizon, which he understood to be the low littoral of Holland, and was glad to dodge below once more and dry himself. He had the pleasure of the mate's company at dinner, the captain remaining on deck until Hobbs had finished and gone up to relieve him, and by that time Kirkwood likewise was through. Stryker blew down with a blustery show of cheer. "'Well, well, my little man!' It happened that he topped Kirkwood's stature by at least five inches. Enjoyin' your sea trip? About as much as you'd expect, snapped Kirkwood. Ow! The captain began to shovel food into his face. The author regrets he has at his command no more delicate expression that is literal and illustrative. Kirkwood watched him, fascinated with suspense. It seemed impossible that the man could continue so to employ his knife without cutting his throat from the inside. But years of such manipulation had made him expert, and his guest, keenly disappointed, at length ceased to hope. Between gobbles, Stryker eyed him furtively. "'Treat you all right?' he demanded abruptly. Kirkwood started out of a brown study. "'What? Who? Why, I suppose I ought to be... Indeed, I am grateful, he asserted. Certainly, you saved my life, and— Ow! I don't mean that! Stryker gathered the imputation into his paw and flung it disdainfully to the four winds of heaven. Bless your art! You're welcome. I wouldn't let no dorg drowned, if I could help it. No, he declared, nor a lunatic neither. He thrust his plate away and shifted sidewise in his chair. I was just wonderin', he pursued, picking his teeth meditatively with a penknife, how they feed you in them asylums. I've never been inside one myself. It's only natural I'd be curious. There was one of them institutions near where I was borned. Birmingham, that is. I used to see the loonies playin' in the grounds. I remember just as well. One of em and me struck up quite an acquaintance. Naturally, he'd take to you on sight. Ow! Strange how we it it off, eh? You make me think of him. Young chap, he was. The livin' spittin' image of you. It don't matter, does it? You're the same man? Oh, go to the devil. Naughty, said the captain serenely, wagging a reproving forefinger. Bad, naughty word. You'll be sorry when you find out what it means. Only he was always planning to run away, and drowned hisself. He wore the joke threadbare, even to his own taste, and in the end got heavily to his feet, starting for the companionway. "'Land you this afternoon,' he remarked casually. "'Come three o'clock or thereabouts. Perhaps later. I don't know, though, as I ought to let you loose.' Kirkwood made no answer. Chuckling, Stryker went on deck. In the course of an hour, the American followed him. Wind and sea alike had gone down wonderfully since daybreak, a circumstance undoubtedly in great part due to the fact that they had won in under the lee of the mainland and were traversing shallower waters. On either hand, like mist upon the horizon, lay a streak of gray, a shade darker than the gray of the waters. The Alethea was within the wide jaws of the western scheldt. As for the wind, it had shifted several points to the northwards. The brigantine had it abeam, and was lying down to it, and racing to port with slanting deck and singing cordage. Kirkwood approached the captain, who, acting as his own pilot, was standing by the wheel and barking sharp orders to the helmsman. "'Have you a Bradshaw on board?' asked the young man. "'Steady!' this to the man at the wheel. Then to Kirkwood— "'What's that, me lad? Kirkwood repeated his question. Stryker eyed him suspiciously for a thought. "'What do you want it for?' "'I want to see when I can get a boat back to England.' "'Hm. 
Yes, you'll find a Bradshaw in the port locker, near the foreign bulkhead. Run along now and ply. And mind, you don't go tearin' out the pages to Mike Piper Boatses to go sailin' in. Kirkwood went below. Like its adjacent rooms, the cabin was untenanted. The watch was the mate's, and Stryker a martinet. Kirkwood found the designated locker, and, opening it, saw first to his hand the familiar bulky red volume with its red garter. Taking it out, he carried it to a chair near the companionway for a better reading light, the skylight being still battened down. The strap removed, the book opened easily, as if by force of habit, at the precise table he had wished to consult. Some previous client had left a marker between the pages, and not an ordinary bookmark by any manner of means. Kirkwood gave utterance to a little gasp of amazement, and instinctively glanced up at the companionway to see if he were observed. He was not, but for safety's sake he moved farther back into the cabin and out of the range of vision of anyone on deck, a precaution which was almost immediately justified by the clumping of heavy feet upon the steps as Stryker descended in pursuit of the ever-essential drink. "'Find it?' he demanded, staring blindly, his eyes not yet focused to the change from light to gloom, at the young man, who was sitting with the guide open on his knees, a tightly clenched fist resting on the transom at either side of him. In reply, he received a monosyllabic affirmative. Kirkwood did not look up. "'You must be a howl,' commented the captain, making for the seductive locker. "'A uh, what? A howl, reading that fine print there in the dark.' "'Why don't you go over to the light? "'I'll have to have them shutters taken off the winders.' "'This was Stryker's amiable figure of speech, "'frequently employed to indicate the coverings of the skylight. "'I'm all right,' Kirkwood went on studying the book. "'Stryker swigged off his rum "'and wiped his lips with the back of a red paw, "'hesitating a moment to watch his guest. "'Mike's it seem more home like for you, I expect,' he observed. "'What do you mean?' Why, Bradshaw's first cousin to a halmanac, ain't he? Can get one, take the other. Next best thing. Sorry I didn't think of it sooner. Like my passengers to feel comfy. Now, don't you go traipsing off to gay Paris and squanderin' what money you got left. You ear? By the way, Captain, Kirkwood looked up at this, but Stryker was already halfway up the companion. Cautiously, the American opened his right fist and held to the light that which had been concealed, close wadded in his grasp. A square of sheer linen edged with lace, crumpled but spotless, and diffusing in the unwholesome den a faint intangible fragrance, the veriest wraith of that elusive perfume which he would never again inhale without instantly recalling that night ride through London in the intimacy of a cab. He closed his eyes, and saw her again, as clearly as though she stood before him, hair of gold massed above the forehead of snow, curling in adorable tendrils at the nape of her neck, lips like scarlet splashed upon the immaculate whiteness of her skin, head poised audaciously in its spirited, youthful allure, dark eyes smiling the last trace sadly beneath the level brows. Unquestionably, the handkerchief was hers. If proof other than the assurance of his heart were requisite, he had it in the initial delicately embroidered in one corner a D for Dorothy. He looked again to make sure, then hastily folded up the treasure trove and slipped it into a breast pocket of his coat. No, I am not sure that it was not the left-hand pocket. Quivering with excitement, he bent again over the book and studied it intently. After all, he had not been wrong. He could assert now, without fear of refutation, that Stryker had lied. Someone had wielded an industrious pencil on the page. It was, taken as a whole, fruitful of clues. Its very heading was illuminating. London to Vlissingen, Flushing, and Breda, which happened to be the quickest and most direct route between London and Antwerp. Beneath it, in the second column from the right, the pencil had put a check mark against Queensborough, DEP 11A10. And now he saw it clearly, dolt that he had been not to have divined it ere this. 
the Alethea had run into Queensboro, landing her passengers there, that they might make connection with the 1110 morning boat for flushing. The very side-wheel steamer, doubtless, which he had noticed beating out in the teeth of the gale just after the brigantine had picked him up. Had he not received the passing impression that the Alethea, when first he caught sight of her, might have been coming out of the Medway, on whose eastern shore is situate Queensborough Pier? Had not Miss Hallam, going upon he knew not what information or belief, been bound for Queensboro, with design there to intercept the fugitives? Kirkwood chuckled to recall how, all unwittingly, he had been the means of diverting from her chosen course that acute and resourceful lady, then again turned his attention to the tables. A third check had been placed against the train for Amsterdam, scheduled to leave Antwerp at 6.32 p.m. Momentarily his heart misgave him. When he saw this, in fear lest Calendar and Dorothy should have gone on from Antwerp the previous evening. But then he rallied, discovering that the boat train from Flushing did not arrive at Antwerp till after ten at night, and there was no later train thence for Amsterdam. Were the latter truly their proposed destination, they would have stayed overnight and be leaving that very evening on the 6.32. On the other hand, why should they wait for the latest train? rather than proceed by the first available in the morning. Why but because Calendar and Mulready were to wait for Stryker to join them on the Alethea? Very well, then. If the wind held, and Stryker knew his business, there would be another passenger on that train, in addition to the Calendar party. Making mental note of the fact that the boat train for Flushing and London was scheduled to leave Antwerp daily at 8.21 p.m., Kirkwood rustled the leaves to find out whether or not other tours had been planned, found evidences of none, and carefully restored the guide to the locker, lest inadvertently the captain should pick it up and see what Kirkwood had seen. An hour later he went on deck. The skies had blown clear, and the brigantine was well in land-bound waters and still footing a rattling pace. The river banks had narrowed until, beyond the dikes to right and left, the countryside stretched wide and flat, a plain of living green embroidered with winding roads and quaint old-world hamlets whose red roofs shone like dull fire between the dark green foliage of dwarfed firs. Down with the Scheldt's gray shimmering flood were drifting little companies of barges, sturdy and snug both fore and aft, tough tanned sails burning in the afternoon sunlight a long string of canal boats, potted plants flowering saucily in their neatly curtained windows, proprietors expansively smoking on deck in the bosoms of their very large families, was being mothered upstream by two funny clucking tugs. Behind the brigantine, a travel-worn Atlantic liner was scolding itself hoarse about the right-of-way. Outward bound, empty cattle boats, rough and rusty, were swaggering down to the sea, with the careless, independent, thumbs-in-armholes air of so many navies off the job. And then, lifting suddenly above the level far-off skyline, there appeared a very miracle of beauty, the delicate tracery of the great cathedral spire of frozen lace, glowing like a thing of spun gold, set against the sapphire velvet of the horizon. Antwerp was in sight. A troublesome care stirring in his mind, Kirkwood looked round the deck, but Stryker was very busy, entirely too preoccupied with the handling of his ship to be interrupted with impunity. Besides, there was plenty of time. More slowly now, the wind falling, the brigantine crept up the river, her crew alert with sheets and halyards, as the devious windings of the stream rendered it necessary to trim the canvas at varying angles to catch the wind. Slowly, too, in the shadow of that Mechlin spire, the horizon grew rough and elevated, taking shape in the serrated profile of a thousand gables and a hundred towers and cross-crowned steeples. Once or twice, more and more annoyed as the time of their association seemed to grow more brief, Kirkwood approached the captain, but Stryker continued to be exhaustively absorbed in the performance of his duties up past the dockyards, where spidery masts stood in dense groves about painted funnels, and men swarmed over huge wharves like ants over a crust of bread, up and round the final great sweeping bend of the river, the Alethea made her sober way, 
ever with greater slowness, until at length, in the rose glow of a flawless evening, her windlass began to clank like a mad thing, and her anchor bit the riverbed, near the left bank, between old forts Isabel and Tete de Flandre, frowned upon from the right by the grim pile of the age-old Steen Castle. And again Kirkwood sought Stryker, his carking query ready on his lips, but the captain impatiently waved him aside. "'Don't you bother me now, me lud juke. Wait until I gets done with the custom officer. Kirkwood acceded perforce, and bided his time with what tolerance he could muster. A pluttering customs launch bustled up to the Alethea side, discharged a fussy inspector on the brigantine's deck, and panted impatiently until he, the examination concluded without delay, was again aboard. Stryker, smirking benignly and massaging his lips with the back of his hand, followed the official on deck, nodded to Kirkwood an intimation that he was prepared to accord him an audience, and strolled forward to the waist. The American, mastering his resentment, meekly followed. One cannot well afford to be haughty when one is asking favors. Advancing to the rail, the captain whistled in one of the river boats. Then, while the waterman waited, faced his passenger. "'Now, your royal highness, what can I do for you afore you goes ashore?' "'I think you must have forgotten,' said Kirkwood quietly. "'I hate to trouble you, but there's that matter of four pounds.' Stryker's face was expressive only of mystified vacuity. Four quid? I don't know as I know just what you means. You agree to advance me four pounds on those things of mine. Oh! Illumination overspread the hollow jowled countenance. Stryker smiled cheerfully. Garn with you, he chuckled. You will have your little jokes, won't you now? I declare I never see a loony with such affectionate, pliful wise. Kirkwood's eyes narrowed. Stryker, he said steadily, give me the four pounds and let's have no more nonsense, or else hand over my things at once. Daffy, Stryker told vacancy, with conviction. Lor love me if I sees how he ever had sense enough to escape. Why, your majesty, and he bowed ironic. I have given you your quid. Just about as much as I gave you that pro pin, retorted Kirkwood hotly. What the devil do you mean? Why, your ludship, four pounds just pies your passage. I thought you understood. My passage? But I can come across by steamer for thirty shillings, first class. Ah, but them steamers, tricky they is, and unsafe. No, your grice, the W. Stryker Packet Line Limited, London to Antwerp, charges four pounds per passage and no reduction for return fare. Stunned by his effrontery, Kirkwood stared in silence. Any compliance, continued the captain, looking over Kirkwood's head, must be lied afore the board of directors in writing not more than thirty days after. You damn scoundrel, interpolated Kirkwood thoughtfully. Stryker's mouth closed with a snap. His features froze in a cast of wrath. Cold rage glinted in his small blue eyes. Why, he bellowed, you bloomin' lunatic, do you think you can say that to Bill Stryker on his own wessel? He hesitated a moment, then launched a heavy fist at Kirkwood's face. Unsurprised, the young man sidestepped, caught the hard, bony wrist as the captain lurched by, following his wasted blow, and with a dexterous twist laid him flat on his back with a sounding thump upon the deck. And as the infuriated scamp rose, which he did with a bound that placed him on his feet and in defensive posture, as though the deck had been a springboard, Kirkwood leaped back, seized a capstan bar, and faced him with a challenge. "'Stand clear, striker,' he warned the man tensely himself livid with rage. If you move a step closer, I swear I'll knock the head off your shoulders. Not another inch, you contemptible whelp, or I'll brain you. That's better. He continued as the captain, caving, dropped his fists and moved uneasily back. Now, give that boatman money for taking me ashore. Yes, I'm going, and if we ever meet again, take the other side of the way, striker. 
Without response, a grim smile wreathed his thin, hard lips. Stryker thrust one hand into his pocket, and, withdrawing a coin, tossed it to the waiting waterman, whereupon Kirkwood backed warily to the rail, abandoned the captain's bar, and dropped over the side. Nodding to the boatman, the steen landing quickly, he said in French. Stryker, recovering, advanced to the rail, and waved him a derisive bon voyage. "'Bye, bye, your Excellency. I hopes it may soon be my pleasure to meet you again. You've been a real privilege to know. I've enjoyed your company, something immense. Don't know as I ever met such a rippin'. I, number one, all round, entertain an ass afore. He stumbled nervously about his clothing, brought to light a rag of cotton, much the worse for service, and ostentatiously wiped from the corner of each eye tears of grief at parting. Then, as the boat swung toward the farther shore, Kirkwood's back was to the brigantine, and he was little tempted to turn and invite fresh shafts of ridicule. Rapidly, as he was ferried across the busy scheldt, the white blaze of his passion cooled, by the biting irony of his estate ate, corrosive into his soul. Hollow-eyed, he glared vacantly into space, pale lips unmoving, his features wasted with despair. They came to the landing stage and swung broadside on. Mechanically, the American got up and disembarked. As heedless of time and place, he moved up the quay to the gangway, and so gained the esplanade, where, pausing, he thrust a trembling hand into his trouser pocket. The hand reappeared, displaying in its outspread palm three big, round, brown British pennies. Staring down at them, Kirkwood's lips moved. Bedrock, he whispered huskily. End of chapter 12. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter 13 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Crow Girl. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 13. A Primer of Progressive Crime. Without warning or presage, the still evening air was smitten and made softly musical by the pealing of a distant chime, calling vespers to its brothers in Antwerp's hundred belfries, and one by one, far and near, the responses broke out, until it seemed as if the world must be vibrant with silver and brazen melody, until at last the great bells in the cathedral spire stirred and grumbled drowsily, then woke to such ringing resonance as dwarfed all the rest, and made it seem as nothing. Like the beating of a mighty heart heard through the rushing clamor of the pulses, a single deep-throated bell boomed solemnly six heavy, rumbling strokes. Six o'clock! Kirkwood roused out of his dour brooding. The Amsterdam Express would leave at 6.32, and he knew not from what station. Striding swiftly across the promenade, he entered a small tobacco shop, and made inquiry of the proprietress. His command of French was tolerable, he experienced no difficulty in comprehending the good woman's instructions. Trains for Amsterdam, she said, left from the Gare Centrale, a mile or so across the city. Monsieur had plenty of time and to spare. There was the tram line if Monsieur did not care to take a fiacre. If he would go by way of the Vieux Bus, he would discover the tram cars of the Rue Kipdorp. Monsieur was most welcome. Monsieur departed with the more haste, since he was unable to repay this courtesy with the most trifling purchase. Such slight matters annoyed Kirkwood intensely. Perhaps it was well for him that he had the long walk to help him work off the fit of nervous exasperation into which he was plunged every time his thoughts harked back to that jovial blackguard striker. He was quite calm when, after a brisk walk of some fifteen minutes, he reached the station. A public clock reassured him with the information that he had the quarter of an hour's leeway. It was only seventeen minutes past eighteen o'clock. Belgian railway time, always confusing. Inquiring his way to the Amsterdam train, which was already waiting at the platform, he paced its length, 
peering brazenly in at the coach windows, now warm with hope, now shivering with disappointment, realizing as he could not but realize that, all else aside, his only chance of rehabilitation lay in meeting Calendar. But in none of the coaches or carriages did he discover anyone even remotely resembling the fat adventurer, his daughter, or Mulready. Satisfied that they had not yet boarded the train, he stood aside, tortured with forebodings, while anxiously scrutinizing each individual of the throng of intending travellers. Perhaps they had been delayed, by the Alethea's lateness in making port, very likely. Perhaps they purposed taking not this, but a later train. Perhaps they had already left the city by an earlier, or had returned to England. On time the bell clanged its warning, the guards bawled theirs, doors were hastily opened and slammed, the trucks began to groan, couplings jolting as the engine chafed in constraint. The train and Kirkwood moved simultaneously out of opposite ends of the station, the one to rattle and hammer round the eastern boundaries of the city, and straighten out at top speed on the northern route for the Belgian line, the other to stroll moodily away, idle hands in empty pockets, bound aimlessly anywhere. It didn't matter. Nothing whatever mattered in the smallest degree, ere now the outlook had been dark, but this he felt to be the absolute nadir of his misfortunes. Presently, after a while, as soon as he could bring himself to it, he would ask the way and go to the American consulate. But just now, low as the tide of chance had ebbed, leaving him stranded on the flats of vagabondage, low as showed the measure of his self-esteem, he could not tolerate the prospect of begging for assistance help which would in all likelihood be refused, since his story was quite too preposterous to gain credence in official ears that daily are filled with the lamentations of those whose motives do not bear investigation. And if he chose to eliminate the strange chain of events which had landed him in Antwerp, to base his plea solely on the fact that he was a victim of the San Francisco disaster, he himself was able to smile, if sourly, anticipating the incredulous consular smile with which he would be shown the door. No, that he would reserve as a last resort. True, he had already come to the jumping-off place. To the court of the last resort alone could he now appeal, but not yet. After a while he could make his petition, after he had made a familiar of the thought that he must armour himself with callous indifference to rebuff, to say naught of the waves of burning shame that would overwhelm him when he came to the point of asking charity. He found himself, neither knowing nor caring how he had won thither, in the Place Verte, the vast venerable pile of the cathedral rising on his right, hotels and quaint old-world dwellings with peaked roofs and gables and dormer windows enclosing the other sides of the square. The chimes, he could hear none but those of the cathedral, were heralding the hour of seven. Listless and preoccupied in contemplation of his wretched case, he wandered purposelessly half round the square, then dropped into a bench on its outskirts. It was some time later that he noticed, with a casual and different eye, a porter running out of the Hôtel de Flandre, directly opposite, and calling a fiacre into the carriage block. As languidly he watched a woman, very becomingly dressed, follow the porter down to the curb. The fiacre swung in, and the woman dismissed the porter before entering the vehicle, a proceeding so unusual that it fixed the onlooker's interest. He sat rigid with attention. The woman seemed to be giving explicit and lengthy directions to the driver, who nodded and gesticulated his comprehension. The woman was Mrs. Hallam. The first blush of recognition passed, leaving Kirkwood without any amazement. It was an easy matter to account for her being where she was. Thrown off the scent by Kirkwood at Sheerness the previous morning, she had missed the day-boat, the same which had ferried over those whom she pursued. Returning from Sheerness to Queensborough, however, she had taken the night boat for Flushing and Antwerp, and not without her plan, who was not a woman to waste her strength aimlessly. Kirkwood believed that she had had from the first a very definite campaign in view. In that campaign, Queensborough Pier had been the first strategic move, the journey to Antwerp apparently the second, and the American was impressed that he was witnessing the inception of the third decided step. The conclusion of this process of reasoning was inevitable. Madame would bear watching. Thus was a magical transformation brought about. Instantaneously, lassitude and vain repinings were replaced by hopefulness and energy. In a twinkling the young man was on his feet, every nerve a thrill with excitement. 
Mrs. Hallam, blissfully ignorant of this surveillance over her movements, took her place in the fiacre. The driver clucked to his horse, cracked his whip, and started off at a slow trot, a pace which Kirkwood imitated, keeping himself at a discreet distance to the rear of the cab, but prepared to break into a run whenever it should prove necessary. Such exertion, however, was not required of him. Evidently Mrs. Hallam was in no great haste to reach her destination. The speed of the fiacre remained extremely moderate. Kirkwood found a long, brisk stride fast enough to keep it well in sight. Round the green square, under the beautiful walls of Notre-Dame d'Anvers, through Grande Place and past the Hôtel de Ville, the cab proceeded, dogged by what might plausibly be asserted the most persistent and infatuated soul that ever crossed the water, and so on into the Quai Van Dyke, turning to the left at the old steam dungeon and slowing to a walk, moving soberly up the drive. Beyond the lip of the embankment the Scheldt flowed, its broad shining surface oily, smooth and dark, a mirror for the incandescent glory of the skies. Over on the western bank old Tête de Flandre lifted up its grim curtains and bastions, sable against the crimson, rampart and parapet edged with fire. Busy little side-wheeled ferry steamers spanked the waters noisily and smudged the sunset with dark, drifting trails of smoke, and ever and anon a rowboat would slip out of the shadow to glide languidly with the current. Otherwise the life of the river was gone, and at their moorings the ships swung in great quietness, riding lights glimmering like low, wan stars. In the company of the latter the young man marked down the Alethea, a sight which made him unconsciously clench both fists and teeth, reminding him of that rare wag, Stryker. To his way of thinking, the behavior of the fiacre was quite unaccountable. Hardly had the horse paced off the length of two blocks on the quay ere it was guided to the edge of the promenade and brought to a stop, and the driver twisted the reins round his whip, thrust the ladder in its socket, turned sideways on the box, and began to smoke and swing his heels. Surveying the panorama of river and sunset with complacency, a cabby, one would venture, without a care in the world, and serene in the assurance of a generous pourboire when he lost his fare. But as for the latter, she made no move. The door of the cab remained closed, like its occupant's mind, a mystery to the watcher. Twilight shadows lengthened, darkling over the land. Street lights flashed up in long, radiant ranks. Across the promenade, hotels and shops were lighted up. People began to gather round the tables beneath the awnings of an open-air café. In the distance, somewhere, a band swung into the dreamy rhythm of a haunting waltz. Scattered couples moved slowly, arm in arm, along the riverside walk, drinking in the fragrance of the night. Overhead, stars popped out in brilliance and dropped their reflections to swim lazily on spellbound waters. And still the fiacre lingered in inaction. Still the driver lorded it aloft in carefree abandon. In the course of time, this inertia, where he had looked for action, this dull suspense, when he had forecast interesting developments, wore upon the watcher's nerves, and made him at once impatient and suspicious. Now that he had begun to doubt, he conceived it as quite possible that Mrs. Hallam, who was capable of anything, should have stolen out of the cab by the other, and to him, invisible door. To resolve the matter, finally, he took advantage of the darkness, turned up his coat-collar, hunched up his shoulders, hid his hands in pockets, pulled the visor of his cap well forward over his eyes, and slouched past the fiacre. Mrs. Hallam sat within. He could see her profile clearly silhouetted against the light. She was bending forward and staring fixedly out of the window across the driveway. Mentally, he calculated the direction of her gaze, then moved away and followed it with his own eyes, and found himself staring at the façade of a third-rate hotel. Above its roof the gilded letters of a sign, catching the illumination from below, spelled out the title of Hôtel du Commerce. Mrs. Hallam was interested in the Hôtel du Commerce. Thoughtfully, Kirkwood fell back to his former point of observation, now richer by another object of suspicion, the hostelry. Mrs. Hallam was waiting and watching for someone to enter or to leave that establishment. It seemed a reasonable inference to draw. Well, then, so was Kirkwood, no less than the lady. He deemed it quite conceivable that their objects were identical. He started to beguile the time by wondering what she would do if— 
Of a sudden he abandoned this line of speculation, and, catching his breath, held it, almost afraid to credit the truth that for once his anticipations were being realized under his very eyes. Against the lighted doorway of the Hôtel de Commerce the figures of two men were momentarily sketched as they came hurriedly forth, and of the two one was short and stout, and even at a distance seemed to bear himself with an accent of assertiveness, while the other was tall and heavy of shoulder. Side by side they marched in step across the embankment to the head of the quay gangway, descending without pause to the landing stage. Kirkwood, hanging breathlessly over the guard-rail, could hear their footfalls ringing in hollow rhythm on the planks of the inclined way, could even discern Callender's unlovely profile in dim relief beneath one of the waterside lights, and he recognized unmistakably Mulready's deep voice, grumbling inarticulately. At the outset he had set after them, with intent to accost Callender, but their pace had been swift and his irresolute. He hung fire on the issue, dreading to reveal himself, unable to decide which were the better course, to pursue the men or to wait and discover what Mrs. Hallam was about. In the end he waited, and had his disappointment for recompense. For Mrs. Hallam did nothing intelligible. Had she driven over to the hotel, hard upon the departure of the men, he would have believed that she was seeking Dorothy, and would, furthermore, have elected to crowd their interview if she succeeded in obtaining one with the girl. But she did nothing of the sort. For a time the fiacre remained as it had been ever since stopping. Then, evidently admonished by his fare, the driver straightened up, knocked out his pipe, disentangled reins and whip, and wheeled the equipage back on the way it had come, disappearing in a dark side street leading eastward from the embankment. Kirkwood was then to believe that Mrs. Hallam, having taken all that trouble and having waited for the two adventurers to appear, had been content with sight of them. He could hardly believe that of the woman. It wasn't like her. He started across the driveway after the fiacre, but it was lost in a tangle of side streets before he could make up his mind whether it was worth while chasing or not, and pondering the woman's singular action, he retraced his steps to the promenade rail. Presently he told himself he understood. Dorothy was no longer of her father's party. He had a suspicion that Mulready's attitude had made it seem advisable to Callender either to leave the girl behind in England, or to segregate her from his associates in Antwerp. If not lodged in another quarter of the city, or left behind, she was probably travelling on ahead, to a destination which he could by no means guess. And Mrs. Hallam was looking for the girl. If there were really jewels in that Gladstone bag, Callender would naturally have had no hesitation about entrusting them to his daughter's care, and Mrs. Hallam avowedly sought nothing else. How the woman had found out that such was the case, Kirkwood did not stop to reckon, unless he explained it on the proposition that she was a person of remarkable address. It made no matter, one way or the other, he had lost Mrs. Hallam, but Callender and Mulready he could put his finger on. They had undoubtedly gone off to the Alethea to confer again with Stryker. That was, unless they proposed sailing on the brigantine, possibly at turn of tide that night." Panic gripped his soul and shook it, as a terrier shakes a rat, when he conceived this frightful proposition. In his confusion of mind he evolved spontaneously an entirely new hypothesis. Dorothy had already been spirited aboard the vessel. Callender and his confederate, delaying to join her from enigmatic motives, were now aboard, and presently the word would be up anchor and away. Were they again to elude him? Not, he swore, if he had to swim for it, and he had no wish to swim. The clothes he stood in, with what was left of his self-respect, were all that he could call his own on that side of the North Sea. Not a boatman on the Scheldt would so much as consider accepting three English pennies in exchange for boat hire. In brief, it began to look as if he were either to swim or to steal a boat. Upon such slender threads of circumstance depends our boasted moral health. In one fleeting minute Kirkwood's conception of the law of meum et tuum, its foundations already insidiously undermined by a series of cumulative misfortunes, toppled crashing to its fall, and was not. He was wholly unconscious of the change. Beneath him, in a space between the quays bridged by the gangway, a number of rowboats, a putative score, lay moored for the night, and gently rubbing against each other with the soundless lift and fall of the river. For all that Kirkwood could determine to the contrary, the lot lay at the mercy of the public. Nowhere about was he able to discern a figure in anything resembling a watchman. 
Without a quiver of hesitation, moments were invaluable if what he feared were true, he strode to the gangway, stepped down, and with absolute nonchalance dropped into the nearest boat, stepping from one to another until he had gained the outermost. To his joy he found a pair of oars stowed beneath the thwarts. If he had paused to moralize, which he didn't, upon the discovery, he would have laid it all at the door of his lucky star, and would have been wrong. We, who have never stooped to petty larceny, know that the oars had been placed there at the direction of his evil genius, bent upon facilitating his descent into the awareness of crime. Let us, then, pity the poor young man, without condoning his offence. Unhitching the painter, he set one oar against the gunwale of the next boat, and with a powerful thrust sent his own, let us so call it for convenience, stern first out upon the river, then sat him composedly down, fitted the oars to their locks, and began to pull straight across stream, trusting to the current to carry him down to the Alethea. He had already marked down that vessel's riding light, and that not without a glow of gratitude to see it still aloft and in proper juxtaposition to the river bank, proof that it had not moved. He pulled a good oar, reckoned his distance prettily, and shipping the blades at just the right moment, brought the little boat in under the brigantine's counter with scarce a jar. An element of surprise he held essential to the success of his plan, whatever that might turn out to be. Standing up, he caught the brigantine's after-rail with both hands, one of which held the painter of the purloined boat, and lifted his head above the deck-line. A short survey of the deserted after-deck gave him further assurance— the anchor watch was not in sight. He may have been keeping well forward by Stryker's instructions, or he may have crept off for forty winks. Whatever the reason for his absence from the post of duty, Kirkwood was relieved not to have him to deal with, and drawing himself gently in over the rail, made the painter fast, and stepped noiselessly over toward the lighted oblong of the companionway. A murmur of voices from below comforted him with the knowledge that he had not miscalculated, this time— at last he stood within striking distance of his quarry, the syllables of his surname ringing clearly in his ears and followed by Stryker's fleeting laugh brought him to a pause. He flushed hotly in the darkness. The captain was retailing with relish some of his most successful witticisms at Kirkwood's expense. "'You ought to have seen the way he looked at me,' concluded the raconteur in a gale of mirth. Mulready laughed with him, if a little in certainty. Callender's chuckle was not audible, but he broke the pause that followed. "'I don't know,' he said with doubting emphasis. "'You say you landed him without a penny in his pocket. "'I don't call that a good plan at all. "'Of course, he ain't a factor, but... "'Well, it might have been as well to give him his fair home. "'He might make trouble for us somehow. "'I don't mind telling you, Captain, that you're an ass.' "'The tensity of certain situations numbs the sensibilities.' Kirkwood had never in his weirdest dreams thought of himself as an eavesdropper. He did not think of himself as such in the present instance. He merely listened, edging nearer the skylight, of which the wings were slightly raised, and keeping as far as possible in shadow. "'Oh, I say,' the captain was remonstrating, aggrieved. "'How was I to know he didn't have it in for you? First off, when he comes on board, I'll say this for him, he's as plucky as they make him. I thought he was from the yard.' Then, when I see what a bally innocent he was, I makes up in mind he's just someone you've been playing in one of your little games, and who was looking to square his account, so it did him proper. Evidently, assented Callender dryly, you're a bit of a heavy-handed brute striker. Personally, I'm kind of sorry for the boy. He wasn't a bad sort, as his kind runs, and he was no fool from what little I saw of him. I wonder what he wanted. Possibly, Mulready chimed in suavely, you can explain what you wanted of him in the first place. How did you come to drag him into this business? Oh, that, Callender laughed shortly. That was partly accident, partly inspiration. I happened to see his name on the Pless Register. He'd put himself as down from Frisco. I figured it out that he would be next door to broke and getting desperate, ready to do anything to get home, and thought we might utilize him, to smuggle some of the stuff into the States. Once before, if you'll remember— no, that was before we got together, Mulready. I picked up a fellow countryman on the Strand. He was down and out, jumped at the job, and we made a neat little wad on it. The more fool you to take outsiders into your confidence, grumbled Mulready. Ow, oh, interrogated Callender, mimicking Stryker's accent inimitably. Well, you've got a heap to learn about this game, Mull. About the first thing is that you must trust old man know-it-all, which is me. 
I've run more diamonds into the States in one way or another in my time than you ever pinched out of the shirt front of a toff on the Empire Prom before they made the graft too hot for you and you came to take lessons from me in the gentle art of living easy. Oh, cut that, can't you? Delighted, dear boy. One of the first principles next to profiting by the admirable example I set you is to make the fellows in your own line trust you. Now, if this boy had taken on with me, I could have got a bunch of the sparklers on my mere say-so from old Morgenthau up on Finsbury Pavement. He does a steady business hoodwinking the customs for the benefit of his American clients, and himself. And I'd have made a neat little profit besides, something to fall back on if this fell through. I don't mind having two strings to my bow. Yes, argued Mulready, but suppose this Kirkwood had taken on with you and then peached. That's another secret. You've got to know your man, be able to size him up. I called on this chap for that very purpose, but I saw at a glance he wasn't our man. He smelt a nigger in the woodpile and most politely told me to go to the devil. But if he had come in, he'd have died before he squealed. I know the breed. There's honor among gentlemen that knocks the honor of thieves higher in a kite, the old saw to the contrary. Nothing doing. You understand me, I'm sure, Mulready, he concluded with envenomed sweetness. I don't see yet how Kirkwood got anything to do with Dorothy. Miss Callender to you, Mr. Mulready, snapped Callender. There, there, now, don't get excited. It was when the Hallam passed me word that a man from the yard was waiting on the altar steps for me that Kirkwood came in. He was dining close by. I went over and worked on his feelings until he agreed to take Dorothy off my hands. If I had attempted to leave the place with her, they'd have spotted me for sure. My compliments to you, Dick Mulready. There came the noise of chair legs scraped harshly on the cabin deck. Apparently Mulready had leaped to his feet in a rage. I've told you, he began in a voice thick with passion. Oh, sit down, Callender cut in contemptuously. Sit down, do you hear? That's all over and done with. We understand each other now, and you won't try any more monkey shines. It's a square deal and a square divide, so far as I'm concerned. If we stick together, there'll be profit enough for all concerned. Sit down, Mull, and have another slug of the captain's bum rum. Although Mulready consented to be pacified, Kirkwood got the impression that the man was far gone in drink. A moment later he heard him growl, chin-chin, antiphonal to the captain's cheero. Now then, Callender proposed, Mr. Kirkwood aside, peace be with him, let's get down to cases. What's the row? asked the captain. The row, Cap'n, is a Hallam female who has unexpectedly shown up in Antwerp. We have reason to believe with malicious intent and a private detective to add to the gaiety of nations. What's the odds? She can't hurt us without lying up trouble for herself. Damn little consolation to us when we're working it out in Dartmoor. Speak for yourself, grunted Mulready surlily. I do, returned Callender easily. We're both in the shadow of Dartmoor, Mull, my boy, since you choose to take the reference as personal. Sing Sing, however, yawns for me alone. It's going to keep on yawning, too, unless I miss my guess. I love my native land most to death, but— Oh, blow that, interrupted the captain irritably. Let's hear about the alum. What are you afraid of? Afraid she'll set up a yell when she finds out we're planting the loot, Cap'n. She's just that vindictive. You'd think she'd be satisfied with her end of the stick, but you don't know the hallam. That milk-and-water offspring of hers is the apple of her eye, and Freddy's going to call her the whole shooting match, or Madam will kick over the traces. Well? Well, she's queered us here. We can't do anything if my lady is going to camp on our trail and tell everybody we're shady customers, can we? The question now before the board is, where now, and how? Amsterdam, Mulready chimed in. I told you that in the beginning. But how, argued Callender, the Lord knows I'm willing, but we can't go by rail, thanks to the Hallam. We've got to lose her first of all. But what I'm asking is, what's the matter with the Alethea, Captain? Nothing, so far as Dick and I are concerned. But my dutiful daughter is prejudiced. She's been so long without proper paternal discipline, Callender laughed, that she's rather high-spirited. Of course, I might overcome her objections, but the girl's no fool, and every ounce of pressure I bring to bear just now only helps make her more restless and suspicious. You leave her to me, Mulready interposed with a brutal laugh. I'll guarantee to get her aboard, or drop it, Dick, Callender advised quietly, and go a bit easy with that bottle for five minutes, can't you? Well, then, Stryker resumed, apparently concurring in Callender's attitude, 
Why well, don't one of you take the stuff, go off quiet, and dispose of it to a proper fence, and come back to divide? I don't see why that— Naturally you wouldn't, chuckled Callender. Few people besides the two of us understand the depth of affection existing between Dick here and me. We just can't bear to get out of sight of each other. We're sure inseparable since night before last. Odd, isn't it? "'You drop it!' snarled Mulready, in accents so ugly that the listener was startled. "'Enough's enough! And there, there, Dick! All right, I'll behave!' Callender soothed him. "'We'll forget and say no more about it.' "'Well, see you don't!' "'But has either of you a plan?' persisted Stryker. "'I have,' replied Mulready, "'and it's the simplest and best if you could only make this long-lost parent here see it. "'What is it?' Mulready seemed to ignore Callender and address himself to the captain. He articulated with some difficulty, slurring his words to the point of indistinctness at times. "'Simple enough,' he propounded solemnly. "'We've got the Gladstone bag here. Miss Dolly's at the hotel. That's her papa's bright notion. He thinks she's to be trusted. Now then, what's the matter with weighing anchor and slipping quietly out to sea?' "'Leaving the dutiful daughter?' "'Certainly. It's only a drag anyway. Better off without her. "'Then we can wait our time and get highest market prices. "'You forget, Dick,' Callender put it, "'that there's a thousand in it for each of us "'if she's kept out of England for six weeks. "'A thousand's five thousand in the land I hail from. "'I can use five thousand in my business.' "'Why can't you be content with what you've got?' "'demanded Mulready wrathfully. "'Because I'm a seventh son of a seventh son, I can see an inch or two beyond my nose. "'If Dorothy ever finds her way back to England, she'll spoil one of the finest fields of legitimate graft I ever licked my lips to look at. "'The trouble with you, Mull, is you're too high-toned. You want to play the swell mobs man from post to finish. "'A quick touch and a clean getaway for yours. Now that's all right. That has its good points. "'But you don't want to underestimate the advantages of a good blackmailing connection. "'If I can keep Dorothy quiet long enough, I look to the Hallam and precious Freddy "'to be a great comfort to me in my old age.' "'Then for God's sake,' cried Mulready, "'go to the hotel, get your brat by the scruff of her pretty neck, and drag her aboard. "'Let's get out of this.' "'I won't.' returned Callender inflexibly. The dispute continued, but the listener had heard enough. He had to get away and think, could no longer listen. Indeed, the voices of the three blackguards below came but indistinctly to his ears as from a distance. He was sick at heart and ablaze with indignation by turns. Unconsciously he was trembling violently in every limb, swept by alternate waves of heat and cold, feverish one minute, shivering the next all of which phenomena were due solely to the rage that welled inside his heart. Stealthily he crept away to the rail to stand grasping it and staring across the water with unseeing eyes at the gay old city twinkling back with her thousand eyes of light. The cool night breeze sweeping down unhindered over the level netherlands from the bleak north sea was comforting to his throbbing temples. By degrees his head cleared, his rioting pulses subsided, he could think, and he did. Over there, across the water, in the dingy and disreputable Hôtel du Commerce, Dorothy waited in her room, doubtless the prey of unnumbered nameless terrors, while aboard the brigantine her fate was being decided by a council of three unspeakable scoundrels, one of whom, professing himself her father, openly declared his intention of using her to further his selfish and criminal ends. His first and natural thought— to steal away to her and induce her to accompany him back to England, Kirkwood perforce discarded. He could have wept over the realization of his unqualified impotency. He had no money, not even cab fare from the hotel to the railway station. Something subtler, more crafty, had to be contrived to meet the emergency. And there was one way, one only, he could see none other— Temporarily he must make himself one of the company of her enemies, force himself upon them, ingratiate himself into their good graces, gain their confidence, then, when opportunity offered, betray them. And the power to make them tolerate him, if not receive him as a fellow, the knowledge of them and their plans that they had unwittingly given him, was his. And Dorothy was waiting. He swung round, and without attempting to muffle his footfalls, strode toward the companionway. He must pretend he had just come aboard. 
Subconsciously he had been aware, during his time of pondering, that the voices in the cabin had been steadily gaining in volume, rising louder and yet more loud, Mulready's ominous, drink-blurred accents dominating the others. There was a quarrel afoot. As soon as he gave it heed, Kirkwood understood that Mulready, in the madness of his inflamed brain, was forcing the issue, while Callender sought vainly to calm and soothe him. The American arrived at the head of the companionway at a critical juncture. As he moved to descend, some low, cool-toned retort of Callender's seemed to enrage his confederate beyond reason. He yelped aloud with wrath, sprang to his feet, knocking over a chair, and leaping back toward the foot of the steps, flashed an adroit hand behind him and found his revolver. "'I've stood enough from you!' he screamed, his voice oddly clear in that moment of insanity. "'You've played with me as long as you will, you hulking American hog! Now I'm going to show—' As he held his fire to permit his denunciation to bite home, Kirkwood, appalled to find himself standing on the threshold of a tragedy, gathered himself together and launched through the air, straight for the madman's shoulders. As they went down together, sprawling, Mulready's head struck against a transom, and the revolver fell from his limp fingers. End of chapter 13 Reading by Crowgirl, caracrow.blogspot.com